2 smartphone printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work 
closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. everyone how's it going all right welcome to build we're going to start officially in t minus six minutes but i just wanted to jump on the stage and just just look at all you guys out here all coming out so in support for b and h's 50th anniversary and birthday it's really crazy to imagine 50 years 1972 when it first opened up but i'm going to play a video that'll talk about that in a moment but real fast before we get going i want to do a trick that i usually do at depth of field or the optic presentations by the way i'm david Brommer from b h photo you may have heard of me um, <laughs> so real quick a, a show of hands who shoots with nikon cameras okay let's, let's make some noise nikon users who shoots with nikon cameras okay. who shoots with canon cameras who shoots with Olympus cameras? All right, right on for the Olympus guy, right on. Who shoots with Sony cameras? All right, I'm gonna, let's just start over. I wanna get this going one more time. Let's just hear the Nikon, but you guys need to do a loud Nikon to stay in. Nikon shooters. Mm, that's good, that's good. Canon shooters. Ooh, that's good. Sorry, Nikon. Sorry, Olympus. Sony shooters. Ah, oh, I don't know. I can't tell between Canon and so one more time. Canon shooters. Yeah! Sony shooters. Yeah! It's a tie. We all win. It's all good. Okay, let's. Uh, <laughs> we're having fun already, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, before we start, to let you guys know we've been working really hard on this this whole event. It has its tendrils have reached every section of B and H. Every employee was, was working on it in some capacity or is either here, we're here for you guys. If anyone needs any help, you can talk to any of us. We'll, we'll give you advice, we'll give you camera suggestions, we'll whisper technology to you. And uh, if you really just need a hug, we'll give you that too. We're all here for you guys. Uh, with that being said, let's roll the first video, the official video, the, uh, the intro so they know what's going on. He's been with B&H for 26 years. 
He's worked in many departments during his time with B&H, from sales to education. He's now working on large-scale events like the Build Expo, celebrating B&H's 50th anniversary. So yeah, you could say he knows B&H well. He even met his wife at counter number six in the superstore 24 years ago. David shoots fine art photography over a wide array of formats, or as he likes to say, from pixels to platinum. David loves to ride his Harley Sportster, almost as much as he loves his pet chihuahua, Eisenhower. There's just something about that dog. The thing that David loves most about working at B&H is bringing his knowledge to photography education and raising the bar in photography. Come and see him host a main stage at the Build Expo on September 6th and 7th at the Javits Center in New York City. B&H, your creative partner for 50 years. I uh, thank our video department for putting that together. That was done in, in a hot day in early July, and I love the editing on it. And I, I really, I watched the video like 400 times because I didn't look fat in the video. So I was like so happy with that. That was amazing. All right, let's get it going. So as we said earlier, welcome to Build. Let's get some noise in the room. <laughs> Woo! Wow. This is it, 50 years in the making. It's a birthday celebration. It's the return of a vital expo for imaging in New York City. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, we're back. And it's a giant thank you to our customers for sticking with this little camera shop that started way back in the early 1970s. Now, I'm gonna let Maria explain it better than ever I could because she's gonna bring a little bit of fashion into this. Take it away, Maria. Picture it, it's 1973 and Free Bird is a number one song, a gallon of gas is 40 cents, and the very first handheld cell phone was invented. At the same time, husband and wife, Leamy and Herman, opened a small store called B&H at 17 Warren Street. 1982, while the movie E.T. is being released and everybody's dancing to Thriller, we're moving out of Warren Street and onto 17th Street. 1997, the small store on 17th Street graduates to a superstore on 34th Street and we haven't moved since. Our store now has two full floors filled with gear, knowledge, and excitement. We've broadened our warehouse to over 600,000 square feet to meet your demands. We've accomplished a lot over the last 50 years and we couldn't have done it without our customers, vendors, viewers, and staff. Awesome, thanks Maria. She's gonna jump on the stage in a, in a couple of minutes. She's busy in the creative production stage, a new stage that we've, we've created. So I wanna talk about measuring time in cameras. So when you've been in the business for 50 years and you've been working at B&H for half of that time, but really in the, the business of selling cameras pretty much your whole lifetime. It's all about the cameras that are out and where you're selling them. So when I first hit the counters of B&H Photo, the top dog was the Nikon F5. So we sold large format. We sold, of course, Leica cameras, the Leica M6, and the Leica M6 had just introduced the TTL, which I kind of felt was a bit of heresy, putting TTL metering inside of a, a TTL flash metering inside of a Leica. Who uses flash with Leica? Uh, we did medium format, we did enlargers, uh, we did all that. And then in the late 90s, the digital bridge began to form. And now today we're in the age of the Nikon Z1, the Leica M11, the Sony A7s, the Canon R7s, and all the great sponsors you can see on the expo floor. So definitely we got a high pack schedule for you here on the stages, but make sure you get down to that expo floor, which will be opening up shortly. And then also I got one more camera, and who remembers this one? This was around back in the early days of when I came to B&H. Only from the minds of Minolta. Okay, quick trivia question. You won't win anything, but you'll get glory. What camera mount would the Minolta Maxim AF mount go on to be? What's that? A Sony A mount. Sony A mount, exactly. So it kind of lived on those cameras. Um, other little fun fact, I'm an improv. Uh, I sold an 8000i to Dave Abruzio, the drummer for Pearl Jam. Anyway. Okay, so uh, we've, got, uh, we've got opened up many stages. So I wanna talk about those stages and I would like to introduce you guys to your MCs. So right off the bat, let's start off with the amazing Maria Perez. And Maria is running the creative production stage. Maria. Hello. Wanna talk Can about your stage? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Great, hear relax. You, yeah. 
Hello, everybody. So right next door, we have the creative production stage. So for all those that are interested in video, iPhone for video. So even if you don't shoot video on your uh, professional cameras, even for your iPhone, there's some education. We have some amazing programming, some huge stars on the internet. So please come by, check me out. I'm going to be speaking at 1030 to give a little bit of education and about what I do. So come by. Awesome. Maria, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, everyone, Maria Perez. By the way, Maria, I, I really feel that you're, you're next generation b and I, I've been there when they opened the superstore. We moved from, from 17th to, to 34th Street and worked with a lot of people. You're amazing. You're next gen. Thank you so Just much. Just such a great creator. Amazing. Thank you. So go see her in her stage. We got two days worth of great stuff going on. So you want to check that out. There's a, this is tomorrow's schedule. Some really good stuff. When is, uh, no, not anymore. Jen is the one. Okay. That's all, all good, guys. Enjoy. Okay. So uh, this is a stage that's very dear to my heart. This is the optics stage. Michael Hollander, come on up. You may know Michael from across the country traveling for B&H. Hello, Hello everybody. Events, Welcome to Build. Raise your hand if you've been to Optic before. Our, uh, our good New York show, all the outdoor travel, wildlife, all those good things. We're keeping that alive on the Optic stage. We're going to be right next door. We start at 1030. I'm going to be starting kicking things off. I can't believe I'm the opening act. That's kind of unbelievable. But uh, Amy Vitali will be there a half hour after me, just at 11 o'clock. So take a look at your schedules. We're excited for all those things outdoors and travel and culture and everything that Optic has come to be. So we're excited. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Are you the other guy with the hat? Who's the other guy with the hat? There's, there's many hats. There's, a many, there's many hats at B&H Photo. That is a, that's the understatement of the day. Thank you so much, Michael. OK, so the other guy with the hat, Gabriel Biederman. You may know him from such amazing conferences like the NPAN conference, or you may have met him at WPPI, PPA, National, across the country, Mac Worlds, everything. Gabe, and also maybe in a stateroom of a ship on Lindblad Expeditions in the middle of the night? Perhaps. <laughs> Is it true that you are the shy halut of star trails? <laughs> a little doing reference for you. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you. It is so awesome to be here. Um, I've, been, I've been with B&H for 23 years, so I'm, I'm celebrating almost my half birthday, but I'm so proud to be here. I'll be, I'll be emceeing the depth of field stage. So who here has come to our depth of field conference in the past, right? Yeah. Come on, give it up, give it up, give it up. <laughs> we like that. So depth of field is all about people, right? So if you take pictures of people, which I think we all do, you know, then you want to come in and level up, you know, your learning and uh, so your skill set over in the depth of field. The focus is going to be obviously more on a little more on portrait and wedding photography, but we also have some amazing uh, journalists that are going to be speaking. We're kicking things off after I, I do a little thing at uh, 10:30 called The Human Element. Then right after that, we've got the eminable uh, Dan Winters, mm. uh, who is an amazing celebrity photographer. We also want a quick shout out. We have an amazing panel that is featuring, um, at, that's going to be at 3 o'clock today, uh, how to get your work seen, right? And we have, there's going to be editors from the New York Times, Washington Post, Nat Geo there that are gonna be doing a panel. Questions will be open to that. And then a lot of them, quick shout out, are going to be also in our portfolio review room as well. So if you brought portfolios, they'll be running those today from 11 to 4, I believe, today and tomorrow. So if you didn't, go home, get them ready, um, and get some eyes on it. But thank you all for being here. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Gabe. That's awesome. How many years have you been with B&H, Gabe? 23. 23 years. Pretty good. Pretty good. OK. All right. So. The Build main stage, that's where you are here. And really, the speakers at, at this event are just the most amazing speakers that you could find under one roof. And we're pretty impressed with it. Uh, and it really goes all disciplines. We've got video creators, filmmakers. We've got the director of Open Water, Chris Kentis, who I'm, I'm very happy to interview tomorrow. We have Casey Neistat uh, will be here tomorrow. Today, <laughs> yeah. Who yelled that at? Wow. This is going to be interesting tomorrow. You want to be here tomorrow. It's going to be definitely a trip tomorrow morning. Uh, but we're going to have Art Wolf is going to be stepping up soon. Uh, Art Wolf has been joined with, with Franz Lanting uh, for a, a segment that will be in the optic stage. 
Uh, they showed us pictures of them drinking from a, in a hotel room a couple of nights ago. It looked pretty fun. Uh, it's really a pretty amazing show, and we've also got a speaker that we highlighted at our Depth of Field uh, 2023, a couple of months back, Flo Nagala. Uh, Flo is an amazing fashion shooter. She'll be joining us as well. So really, all the disciplines have been covered. We're going to do underwater. I even roll a sub, I wore a Submariner for Brian Scarry today. Uh, it's really going to be pretty amazing. It's just, it, it's not going to stop for a solid two days. Okay, uh, so now we're going to take this moment to talk about some product announcements that have happened. So a couple of days ago, you guys were paying attention, all you yellers for the Sony A7CR, that really compact, small, amazing Sony camera, and they also released a new lens. Um, you Sony folks, can I hear a, a, a yell again? Because Sony just... <laughs> As, as soon as you clear your PayBoo card, Sony releases a new camera. So it's pretty, it's pretty good. But actually, we're, we're in a great renaissance now. We're seeing a lot of good releases that kind of got slowed down for a while. So that's coming out. Cook lenses for you videographers. We've got a prime series of Cook lenses. Now, I, I, really, I don't really shoot so much video, um, although I do have a viral video, 10 Hours Walking on YouTube. Check it out. 14 million views. Can't be wrong. Uh, but uh, this... Uh, but uh, Cook Prime lenses, uh, really for the for the filmmakers, it's amazing stuff. So, and check that out. Uh, also check this out for the on the other side of things. GoPro Hero 12 Black, the little guy. Uh, it just came out. You can get an additional fifty dollars off if you go to the B and H table and and get that. It's on specials. So you'll see that. And also Leica, I heard Leica had something amazing. It's a a short throw, really high end projector, and we wanted to bring it in here, uh, but it's uh, it's made for like small rooms, this is a big room, you want big projectors here. Uh, but you want to check that out, Leica Elmer at Glass, and uh, you know, Leica quality is amazing. And then uh, Nanook, uh, we rely on Nanook cases in the marketing department, give them a big shout out, they got some new uh, products that are out, you want to go down the expo, check them out. And then there's some amazing, uh, we have, if you walk through the expo today, and you were to go into a hot tub time machine and go into the expo that used to be here at the Javits, let's say, 10 years ago, it's a whole new landscape of equipment and what's going out there. There's a lot of new companies, newer. You'll see the classics that are there, but you'll see so many new ones. When the, the sponsors were signing up, I was getting these emails. I had to go on the B&H site to see what a couple of them sold. They're so new. So check that out. DZO Film, their Tango series, uh, amazing Cine lenses as well. Uh, Tilta uh, does some uh, wireless lens controlling, so if you want to focus your equipment, get your cameras to work when you're not right next to them, that's it. I know that sports shooters do that pretty much. And then back to Cine, uh, Angino is a French brand of amazing high-end optics, and they have a, a 68 to 250 lens and a 45 to 165. They just released. You can go downstairs and check that out. Pretty cool. Let's hear it for the sponsors, all of them. Um, Let's really hear it for the sponsors, because Build is brought to you free, because B&H believes education should be free. But believe it or not, the Javits wasn't free. It's the sponsors who really make it happen. So once again, the sponsors, tell them you appreciate it. It's back. We're, we're back in business. Our world has is, our world is, is changed so much in time. And I just want to tell you what it means to be part of the B&H family. Now, I'm not supposed to talk about it but I, I do like to, to rebel, and my, my boss is probably shaking his head right now. Uh, but we had last night a huge employee 50th anniversary, employee appreciation, birthday party event here up on the fifth floor, and uh, it was really touching. It was, it was quite amazing. The stories were, uh, were great. Uh, we had our salespeople, some of the all-stars of B&H. We had our CEO speak. Uh, the, the president of the company got a standing ovation, uh, which was, was pretty amazing. Uh, he's a Sam Goldstein is an incredible businessman and inspiration to everybody. I've ever seen such an organic uh, stand up as that was. Uh, but I'd like to share a deeply personal story with you guys. I'm going to take it down a notch because we've got a little bit of time. You guys want to hear a personal story about B&H? Yeah. OK. All right, so uh, I got the job in 1997. And uh, I've always worked behind camera counters throughout my life and uh, worked for some great camera companies. But and B&H was like a beacon, and I was really happy to come to B&H. So back in the day, and this is some inside stories, there was a guy named Mr. Mizells, and he was the accountant for B&H. He did payroll. And on payday, which I think in those days it was a Thursday, he would come around, and he would have our paychecks with pay stubs totally on the level. But for some odd reason, we got paid in cash with the pay stubs in there. And there was always a message on the pay stub whether holidays were coming up or something inspirational or something. But 
That was the way it was. And this guy, uh, Mr. Meisels, I'm going to introduce another long-term person in a couple of days, but he knew everybody's name. He knew their employee number. But I think there was only around 375 of us. So yes, B&H would grow into direct deposit, but in that time, we got that pay stub. It's 1999, and so I get some unfortunate news. My mom got diagnosed with cancer, as well as a B&H employee named David Lamb. They both get hit on the same day, the big diagnosis, the big C. And I, I just want to throw out here, I'm going to be a little unkosher. Uh, fuck cancer, but cancer shows up, and my mother gets it, and David Lamb gets it. So things are looking pretty dire. And, uh, I'm, I'm working along, payday comes, open up the pay stub, and the special message is that there's two employees, a mother of one employee and another employee who are uh, David Brommer and David Lamb, who are, are uh, sick and could use some prayers. So I, I'm looking at this pay stub, you know, and, you know, of course the pay was nice, but there was the pay stub, and I, I went to the hospital that night, and I'm like, Mom, you got this. Check this out. This is, I work for B&H Photo now, and, and you know, all, these, all these Hasids have been asked to pray for your well-being. This is going to be like, you, you got this covered. You got this no problem. There's going to be prayers. It's going to be all good. Uh, in any case, um, as I said, cancer does suck. And uh, David and my mom did pass away. But watching that personal touch, asking everyone to pray for my mother, and I'd only been there about a year and a half, two years, it was really touching. And it was at that moment that I was like, B&H is my home. B&H is my family. And I've watched countless stories throughout the years how B&H has stepped up. And that's why people stay so long. So that's my, that's my story. Um, with that staying long, leading into uh, a long time, I want to introduce a very special, oh, wait a minute, hold on a second. He, he must be out in Colorado, up on the Continental Divide. I want to introduce Steve Schwartz. Steve is a B&H longtime employee. He's my mentor, and he's a mentor to so many others at B&H. And I'm also proud to say that Steve Schwartz is a friend as well. Steve, welcome up. How's it going? I give you. Welcome, everyone. Put my reading glasses on. Dave, Dave approached me late last week about talking today. So 41 years at B&H. You saw that video, 1982. That's when I started. So I've done many jobs over the years. I'd like to give personal stories as well. I'm not advanced technology, technologically as, as these guys. I used to be a sports photographer, but I gave that up many years ago just to concentrate on my career at B&H. 1982, I had graduated high school in 77. I got a job in another photo store, worked there for four or five years. I don't know if you guys remember, and women remember, Back in the day, there were many photo magazines, uh, photo magazines, 30 different companies advertising in the back of the magazines, but only two or three were legitimate. Everybody else would play games, bait and switch, all kinds of games. The store I was working at, I won't mention names, they were also playing games. I saw the writing on the wall, I figured it was time to leave. We were a small company, and B&H was very small at the time. We used to trade merchandise. I knew Sam Goldstein. He would go around, before he was president of B&H, he would go around for B&H to other dealers and pick up merchandise for orders we took one day so we can ship them out the next day. And he, he basically recruited me. I was, I was going to leave the, where I was working. I went to another store, and I spoke to them, and I said, you know what, I'm going to come to you. I told that to Sam, because I was going back and forth between these two stores, and Sam said, don't go there, because you'll be working for the brother of where I was working. It was his brother, another store that had many, many complaints from the Better Business Bureau. They'd been around for 30 years. Finally, Better Business closed them down. But Sam said, why don't you come to me? If you don't like it, you can go to them. So I went back to them after telling them I would go there, and they said, go, go, go work for the Hasidic guys. You'll last two weeks. Well, right now, 41 years later, still at B&H and B&H's private label group, Gratis Group. So that's my story there with B&H. But I want to give you a little history also of B&H. So 1982, Warren Street, a little store on, on downtown Manhattan. I worked there for six months before we moved to 17th Street. We moved to 17th Street. We were three phone salespeople. We get on the floor. I'm looking around. It's a giant floor. What, what do we need such a big space for three people? And from that day in 1982 to today, 2023, B&H is still growing by leaps and bounds all the time. And why? The secret to our success. 
There is no secret. Treat customers the way you want to be treated. I've had many, I've worn many hats at B&H over the years. I've done trade shows, seminars, workshops, Rocky Mountain School of Photography, main media workshops, Scott Kelby seminars, everything. And oh, social, social media, I started the social media department. This old guy got out, gave it over. <laughs> they do a great job now, phenomenal. EDU Advantage, David Brahma's baby, a program for students and educators. We, I work there. I did uh, web content, and now with, again, gratis B&H's private label brands. But getting back to, um, to the secret to our success, Treat customers the way you want to be treated. Very simple. So all those events I went to, I would give out the B&H flyers. People remember those B&H catalogs? Everybody have those catalogs? We came out monthly, giant catalogs. Never once coming back from those shows did Sam Goldstein say, how many sales did you write? Never. It's all about how many people did you talk to? Who'd you help? Did you answer questions? And that's how we grew from year to year to year. And we continue doing that. If you want to work in the photo industry, if you want to work somewhere with your passion, you go to B&H. Jewelry, you go to Tiffany's. So that, that's basically our secret. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm getting the ax already. I can see David getting, no, see the getting next, nervous. I want to see what the next slide is. <laughs> it's all good. No, but, but um, another thing was, you know, the B&H has grown over the years. I tell people the greatest day in B&H history was when inventory went online. Can you imagine taking orders for... 100,000 items manually, writing down the orders. My pinky is worn out from the orders I took over the years. But inventory went online. We didn't have to use phones. We didn't have to use intercoms. We didn't have to use walkie-talkies. We didn't have to use runners. Computers. Who remembers the internet? Before the internet. Any old people here like me? Before the internet? So the internet, and I'll close with this. My claim to fame that I joke around when I train new hirees for B&H, I say, you know, I said to the, I said to, to B and H and people, why would anybody order online when they can call and talk to me? Little did I know, little did I know, 40 years later or 30 years later, we'd grow to the behemoth that we are. But it's a great company. It's given me a great life, and I have no complaints. And I welcome you all to the Build Expo. That tons of people have worked on this show to make it a success. I hope you all have a great time. And last, follow your passion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. Steve, it's been an honor and a pleasure over the years. I can't say, boy, we've, we, we've seen, you've taken me to places. We've seen it. We've done it. Thank you so much. Once again, Steve Schwartz, guys. He, he's really such a mentor to so many, and, and everything you said is exactly true. OK, so let's get a little pumped. Just to get one going on. I'm going to tell you a quick little tale about Julio's wife and the Canon EOS 1 uh, kit, which I, I sold years ago. But before I do that, I would ask if Art Wolf is here. I got a lot of lights in me. I can't see it. Art, if you can go to the back table and get your microphone on, that would be awesome. Also, if you're standing up in the back and you're here for Art Wolf, grab a seat. It's going to be an amazing long presentation. But uh, it's a quick B&H story. Uh, it's the year 2000, and I get a phone call in the order department, and it's Julio Iglesias' wife. And she says, do you know who Julio Iglesias is? And I said, yes. I really didn't know any of the music, but I knew that Julio Iglesias was huge. And even his son became huge. So she said, Julio wants some camera equipment. What's the best equipment you got? What, and I said, well, what do you want to do with it? She said, well, he wants to shoot golf. He wants to shoot birds in the backyard. He wants a, an action camera. I said, I got the camera for you. It, one of the best cameras right now is the Canon EOS 1. So I proceeded to sell her an EOS 1, the matching flash, the 3028, the 4028, the 500 F4, the uh, 70 to 200 2.8, the 28 to 728, because the 24 to 728 wasn't out yet, uh, and then the, the, six, the 20 to 35, because the 
16 to 35 wasn't out yet. But sold them all that amazing equipment, mailed it all off, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Julio Iglesias is going to be using that, that equipment that I sold him. Get a phone call about two days later. It's Mrs. Iglesias. She says, David, thank you. We've got a big problem with the equipment. You sent the wrong lenses. I said, what do you mean we sent the wrong lenses? I sent you the best lenses that really money could buy. She goes, yeah, but they're white. <laughs> Julio only dresses in black. He wants black lenses. <laughs> so for those of you that are laughing and got the joke, Canon L lenses are always historically white, while like Nikon lenses were black. So uh, no problem, B&H photo, I'm sure you've all been there. Sometimes things get mispurchased. They returned it all, and we sold them a Nikon F5 with all the requisite ED expensive glass that was in black. I couldn't argue with her. I'm a goth. I live in New York City. You know, if you want all black equipment, I, you know, who's to, who's to, uh, to, to shame that? Uh, okay, so I want to talk to you guys really quickly about what's going on here. We're moving along nicely. We've got the Build Museum. There's some uh, personal artifacts and cameras from our personal collections in there. Plus, we've collected equipment from all the brands. Definitely got to check out the Build Museum. We got portfolio reviews. Uh, we've got focus tables in the portfolio review room. We got a creator stage over on the other side. That's all that newfangled short form video Instagram stuff going on. Uh, we've got a, can a Kodak 16 millimeter and Ari uh, film workshop also happening. If you ever wondered what it was like to load 16 millimeter film into an Ari camera, you can go right around the corner and check that out. We got that amazing expo. We've also got the build challenge where you can stuff camera bags, fold up reflectors, set up tripods. It's really fun. Let me know how that goes. I, I kind of thought of that idea, so I want to see how it works. There were some detractors, so let us know if you have fun over there. I love playing games. That was, that was totally fun to build that out. Build that out. Remember, there is no I in build. And uh, OK, so um, we covered that. We told that story. And right now, I think we've, we are just about ready for Art Wolf. Um, we're going to play some commercials, and then we're going to have Art come up. Yes. Lots of seats. There's lots of seats. So you guys are standing. Please, shuff, get away from the doors. Come on in. You may, if, if you sit next to an Olympus shooter, it's OK. They're, they'll understand. If you, sh if you sit next to a Leica M11 shooter, you can, you can say, how about that autofocus? <laughs> Only kidding. And I know you Sony shooters like to shoot together. All right, while we're shuffling along before Art Wolf comes out, I'll take a question if anyone wants to shout it out. Charles, you got a question? Uh, happy to be here. Charles Chesler, happy to be here. Charles is an amazing photographer. If you uh, Google the uh, Agreeable Strangers series, he'll come up. It's, a, it's, I think, groundbreaking work. And all right. Yeah. Art, here he is. Art, how was it going? OK, so let's go to the back. He's like, how you doing? Come on back. Okay. Okay, he's going to take your mic off. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Art Wolf is in the house. Yeah, all right. We, uh, we support Art Wolf across the country on his workshops. It's always a, always a blast to hang out and, and watch his presentations. I've seen a number of them, and they're, they never get old. They're always pretty amazing. Hey, guys in the back, maybe uh, roll a quick commercial for us?
Introducing the new Paybu credit card. Okay, folks, we're about ready to get that mic back on. We're about ready to bring Art Wolf onto the stage. He's getting a glass of water. I um, want to just bring up a couple of other things before we get this on here. Um, you know, we thank you guys a lot, and I just want all these years of B&H Photo, I've worked with some amazing people. This has been quite the event to put together, and I just want to give a shout out for uh, Jeanette, Jeanette Santagato. So Jeanette's probably down somewhere working really hard right now, but if you see Jeanette, give her a pat on the back. She really took us over the finish line. There's a number of great people at B&H Photo that have really done it, uh, but Jeanette is one of them, Jim McFadden, Dana Glidden, uh, there's just so many of them, and then the executive management that really kept the vision going, and of course my boss, I'm not going to mention his name, Benny Steigman, uh, but uh, he's uh, allowed me to do some crazy things over the years with, uh, with our marketing, and he just got his water, I think we are ready to go. Um, okay, I'm going to make that event space announcement soon, guys, so... Ladies and gentlemen, one of the, uh, you know, I was in Italy a couple weeks ago, and I checked my LinkedIn, and Art had posted the 50 most important photographers, living photographers, someone posted it, and, and you were like right up there in the top 10, and I was like, wow, it's so amazing to get to work with this guy, but he's got his own TV show, countless books, a massive influence in wildlife conservation, photography, a personal hero, I'm sure a hero to everyone. Let's make some noise for our wolf. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, in an age of depressing news, if it bleeds, it leads. Is that not right? I mean, on the news, all you hear about is terrible politics, increased climate change, heat, everything's kind of a negative. And over the last 20 years, but specifically the last 10 years, I've concentrated on traveling the globe, looking at a variety of the most charismatic species on the planet. And I have to tell you, there are animals in trouble, but there's a lot of animals that you think are in trouble that are actually expanding in numbers. And that's largely because environmental groups, NGOs, people that care are doing really good work around the globe and bringing back species that were on the cusp of extinction. So that's a little bit about how I'm motivated. I can't work on books that depress me. So I've tried to find a project or many projects that uplift me, get me out of bed so I can share that with a bigger audience. And so a book that comes out in a short time, and I never know whether it's going to be in late November or early December, is entitled Wild Lives. And it just looks at animals throughout the planet, as I just said. And every year, I and a friend of mine, Gabrielle Jacon, lead bear tours up to Katmai National Park, and we photograph these bears. But this book is looking at all different biomes. And in the Arctic tundra, we start with a polar bear up in East Greenland. And over the years, I've been all through the Arctic as my top esteemed colleague, Franz Lanting, sitting over here in the corner. Thanks for being here, Franz. This is a Arctic wolf shot up on Ellesmere Island. And on Ellesmere Island, their primary prey is muskox. So both those populations are doing quite well, pretty stable, largely because they're so far north, there's very little interference with their livelihood. Sharing the island of Ellesmere is the Arctic fox. And this is photographed right at 2 in the morning, uh, late in the summer. The Arctic hares are 25-pound rabbits. And here they're standing up, kind of boxing each other, like you've seen probably kangaroos over the years. But up in the Arctic, it's eat or be eaten. It's such a, a harsh environment. That, and it's remarkable that most of the animals that I'm photographing are largely white you know, seen or uh, hide from the predators, or in the case of polar bears, they're white because it enables them to sneak up on their prey. So here's an Arctic fox with no feet on the ground, just gliding over the surface in Svalbard, that archipelago of islands north of Norway, and it's got a chick in its mouth. But more and more now, 
as ice is receding further north and reluctant to come back south, polar bears that need ice to uh, hunt the seals that they primarily feed upon are finding themselves into bird rookeries like this great bird rookery up in Svalbard. So they are changing their behaviors according to what they need. And in other areas of the Arctic, polar bears are doing quite well. Where there's an abundance of ice north of Siberia, they're doing quite well. But in Hudson Bay and a few of the areas where the ice is more tenuous, they aren't doing so well. They're filling their great bellies with blueberries and kelp and anything that they can uh, feed upon to sustain themselves. Now, this bear I really thought had been in a uh, big battle with another bear, but in fact, it was just coated in blueberry juice. <laughs> this bear is literally standing above me, looking over the top of me at another bear. So it's not even concerned about my presence. There's places in the Arctic where you literally can walk with bears. And if they approach too close, you just virtually pick up two rocks and you click them together, and that's enough to dissuade a bear from approaching even closer. This is an aerial shot uh, uh, near Cape Churchill, and it just shows how these bears are just waiting and waiting and waiting for the ice to freeze over Hudson Bay so that, once again, they can return to the ice and hunt the seals that use the ice to rest after their feeding below. Yeah, they call out for pizza, and sometimes you hear the call. <laughs> so here a uh, mother is taking her two cubs out over the ice. As I say, the ice is becoming the main problem. And in the Brooks Range of Alaska, we're already seeing uh, polar bears and brown bears breeding together. And polar bears have uh, historically came out of the brown bear during the last ice age. So they... In our lifetimes, they may just go morph back into being brown bears. These are beluga whales, and I've literally watched a uh, polar bear from a helicopter trying to dive and hunt beluga whales with no avail. I mean, they almost tease the bear because there's no way he can catch up with a whale underwater. Okay, I hit the wrong button right there. Years ago, I had the great fortune to go and photograph a mother bear with her three cubs as they emerged from a den, first time out of the den. And we were walking on foot. There was no fear the mother would come towards us. Uh, she's not going to leave her cubs alone. And so we had, with impunity, the ability to get up close and photograph uh, the loving nature of these great predators of the north. Walruses, especially the western race of the walrus, is huge compared to what you would find in Arctic East Canada or in Norway and that area of the world. These animals are hauling out on beaches now where historically they would go to the edge of the ice flow and rest and then dive. What they primarily are eating are clams. Their population is pretty uh, stable at this present time. They're a magnificent, yeah, they're a beautiful animal. This is an aerial view over the porcupine a caribou herd. And they have the longest migratory route of any terrestrial animal on the planet. They virtually circle the entire uh, north and south margins of the Brooks Range every year. And in this point of view, they almost resemble the flies or the insects that they're trying to escape. They're seeking out the ice during the summer months to escape the warble flies and mosquitoes that uh, thrive on them. So within this book, Wild Lives, and you're just seeing a small portion of the photos. There's over 500 photos in this enlarged book. Uh, as I say, I've worked on it nonstop for 10 years, but there are photos that even date back 40 years. So it's just a, a great project. I love books and ones that have meaning and ones that inspire, inform, educate people. The um, puffins of Iceland are actually moving further north. As the waters are warming, it's bringing in other predatory fish that are consuming the fish that the 
puffins normally would feed on. And so we're finding that populations of puffins are moving further and further north. I'm not entirely sure what these little creatures are in this puffin's mouth. They almost look like a uh, small um, whatever. I, I just had what a, uh, a senior moment right there, and you were here to see that. <laughs> At least I'm not Mitch McConnell. <laughs> well, was that too much? <laughs> At any rate, in the alpine section of the book, we start with mountain goats up in the Glacier National Park. Again, if there's something bothering them, if their populations are crashing, I would bring it up. But no, these are populations that are quite stable. And in the case of the snow leopard, very stable. Uh, and in fact, in certain regions like Mongolia, their numbers are increasing. So I went to Mongolia earlier this year, or I'm sorry, to Ladakh, India, earlier the, this year. There are other photographers that have much better photos of snow leopards. But as a photographer, I just wanted simply to see them for myself. So I borrowed a 1,200 Canon telephoto lens and that's the only way I could see these cats. I could not see them with my naked eye. Here is a little video of one mo moving through the environment. And so just seeing a wild cat and not capturing it on a camera trap was important for me. I just wanted to see for myself them moving through. The aerial sheep is actually rarer than the snow leopard. And uh, these are one of the main preys of the snow leopard, beautiful sheep and is the Asiatic ibex. And in this image, a snow leopard has just killed a young ibex and is dragging it up uh, a slope. And they are using their tails, as you see, as a way of balancing. That tail is critically important as they're chasing animals down a slope. So here a mother is uh, leaving her cub above as it approaches one of the kills that it has made. So in a very short time, I, I at least satisfied that, but I would not have been able to get this with a normal lens. It had to be a 1200, and even at that, I'm cropping one third of the frame to this point. So you can imagine an animal the size of a dog from a mile away, and that's how we're looking at these creatures. And this is the closest one that came uh, by. But for me, it was great because they were one of those animals that you always hoped to be able to witness and see in their environment. Otters are doing very well in their environments, and here an otter is kind of looking cautiously towards a coyote. And prior to wolves being introduced into the greater Yellowstone system, the coyote really was ruling the roost. It was the top predator for the longest time taking down elk and uh, deer that were weakened by the winter. And then we introduced wolves, I think it was back in 1995 or something close to that. And here in this image, you're looking at a coyote looking up at its future. So the coyotes had to really change the way they were adapting to this new top predator that came into Yellowstone. And it has been a great move because the, uh, the wolves have restored many of the habitats that have been overrun by uh, large herds of elk. And now other animals, elk or moose and beavers, are moving into these areas that were not possible before the wolves entered the frame. By the way, this is not water, this is gin. So as I drink more and more of it, at any rate, these are wolves in Yellowstone. They've adapted quite well. Of course, poaching on the peripheral parts of the park does occur, but a wolf's response is to have larger litters. So once they've established themselves into a, a, an area, it's really hard to eradicate them, as ranchers would use the term eradicate. They're great creatures. They belong in Yellowstone and the other parts of the Rocky Mountain West. Here, a, a couple are take, have taken down an elk and then going for a drink right afterwards. This is the largest grizzly bear in the greater Yellowstone area. 
and it has just killed an elk, and it's a very clever animal, simply because it, in the fall when the, uh, elk are competing for the harem, they deplete their resources, they uh, often get injured, and then the bear just sits and watches from a, uh, afar until the end of the rut is over, and then moves in and takes the uh, weaker of the two animals. So yeah, in the Alpine area, there's a lot of animals to cover. I cannot, in the time I've got, tell you everything about this. This is one of my favorite animals, the great gray owl. Uh, I did a book years and years ago called Owls of North America. These were one of my favorite owls. It's sitting in an old uh, birch uh, tree with its uh, chicks right down to the lower right, if you can see it from afar. And these uh, owls are found throughout Siberia and the far north, in Finland, Canada, the United States. The spirit bear is a white form of the black bear. It's not an albino, it's simply a color morph. It's got dark eyes, and the local First Nations of the British Columbia coast have revered these animals ever since they first saw them. And so they're not hunted, and consequently, their behavior is very, very different. They are very tame to uh, the approach. They've never been hunted, and therefore, they just don't have that fear of uh, man. And what's also interesting is that black bears in the same region adopt that same behavior because they're on the same island, and they are not hunted as well. So a spirit bear can have black cubs, or a black bear can have a white cub. It just simply is the way they've... Uh, worked it out in their systems. This is a wide angle shot of one of those very tame black bears coming up and looking at me with a 24 millimeter wide angle. So I thought that was pretty brazen of it until it uh, turned to my friend next to me <laughs> and literally put a little bit of uh, nose juice on his lens. Whoops. This is even a rarer bear than the spirit bear. This is called the glacier bear. And it is only found between Glacier Bay and Yakutat, Alaska. And I've seen three different ones over a very long period of time. They're so hard to find because they resemble the big gray rocks that kind of align the shore of this great uh, environment. But when I found them, they are also very, very approachable. This one just stood up and shook its back against an uh, altar. Uh, young alder tree. This is a sea wolf. This is a wolf that primarily eats along the margins of the ocean. It eats kelp, it eats clams, it eats starfish, it eats anything it can eat, including sea otters. So it's a very different animal than the gray wolf inland. The other animal that feeds on the sea life all up and down the coast is the bald eagle. And in this particular case, a bald eagle has found a small octopus in the tide pools. And of course, it's going for that. So these birds are very predatory and very uh, opportunistic. They'll, whatever they can catch, they will try to eat. OK, I'm having a problem with my remote. Not the remote, no, 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 don't worry. The remote is working perfectly fine. It's my hand that's broken. I keep on hitting the wrong button here. So over the years, I think I was one of the first American photographers to find my way into central Honshu Island and photograph the snow, uh, snow macaques. And every other year now, I, I lead tours back to, to these great creatures. Uh, it's, they're drawn towards the thermal pools of a naturally heated spring. Uh, they've had help. The local Japanese have harnessed the water for themselves, thinking they would have a nice hot bath up in the mountains. But in fact, they get into this water every year in the winter. And they are so approachable. They are irresistible subject matter. And over the years, you know, when I first approached them, there would be an older Japanese a pair of photographers and myself. And we'd be there the entire day. Now we're talking about 35 years ago. Today, on any given day, there could be a 1,000 people coming and visiting these uh, amazing primates. 
And the challenge then, going year after year, is how can you find something new? That really is a challenge. And occasionally you can find a different perspective, point of view. Uh, there are individuals that really stand out. And this little one was catching snowflakes as they were falling. <laughs> Literally catching snowflakes. So every other year, Hokkaido is a great destination, not only for uh, on Honshu, the snow macaques, but to the north, Hokkaido, you have the Japanese cranes. I mean, there are designers, uh, perfect designers, uh, subject matter, but perfect for the camera as well as they go through these elaborate courtship displays. Uh, nearby are the whooper swans. These swans are in the Arctic of uh, Siberia. And during their nesting season, you would not be able to get within 100 you know, feet of their nest. And in the winter, they come down to Hokkaido. They're fed by the people, grains. And they are virtually uh, as tame an animal as you would ever find. You can lay on your belly, and their heads will hover over you. So it's great opportunities to shoot these guys in a number of different perspectives, environments, falling snow, and so forth. And then we turn to the stellar sea eagle that comes south as well during the winter months. And in late February, when the ice is really close to the north shore of Hokkaido, they, that provides the access to photograph these, these beautiful versions of the bald eagle, only they're from Siberia. Arctic, no, uh, red foxes abound on Hokkaido, as do the little flying squirrels, the Ural Euro owls are there. I mean, when I think of Hokkaido, it's just such a, a great place for photographing wildlife. We all think we want to go to Africa on safari, but Hokkaido becomes a great secondary location for the variety of wildlife you would find there. And in the temperate grassland chapter, we start with the uh, whooping cranes that were almost extinct, and their numbers are slowly and inevitably coming back up given uh, identifying their range and what needs to happen to preserve these great cranes. OK, I've done it again. So in the grasslands, of course, bison, uh, there are a lot of efforts to bring back bison in greater numbers. And there's a lot of different groups involved in that. And one day, one day, I'm sure, not to the record numbers that there were before Western civilization came to the Americas, but certainly there's a lot of plans to break, buy ranches, take down fences, and return the bison to big roaming grasslands of the Midwest. These are the original horses, Prowalski's horse, found in Mongolia. Bobcats in the grassland chapter of the book, and a crane dining on a vole up in Point Reyes on uh, National Seashore. And down in southern New Mexico, the Sandhill Cranes. And wherever I can, I'll take exaggeratedly long exposures. I want this book not only to have graphic moments and great biology, but it's also got to have an element of art. My background's painting and art and design. So as much as I can incorporate longer exposures or interesting patterns or lines, I will introduce that into the book. Here a uh, golden eagle is coming into a nest, actually within the city limits of Bend, Oregon, in that grassland of the eastern Cascades. And down south in Patagonia, the largest flying bird, along with the uh, wandering albatross, these great South American uh, condors, are amazingly tame and curious animals. You can literally walk right up under their airy, and they'll sit there maybe 100 feet away and look at you and stare at you with no thoughts to fly. They are just a curious bird of prey. So, of course, down in the grasslands of the, uh, the Pampas, in Torres del Piney National Park over the years, the uh, puma has become an um, ever-increasingly easier subject to photograph. At one time, they were hunted mercilessly by the ranchers. And then the ranchers really realized that there may be, in fact, more money 
in a live cougar than a dead herd of sheep. And so they stopped hunting the cougar, and the cougar has kind of chilled out and became, has become much more approachable and seen during the middle of the day. They're down there primarily after the guanaco, the largest cousin of the, in the Yama family. Beautiful animals right at sunrise as uh, they're being backlit by the rising light. And it's a great privilege to be able to walk with a hunting mountain lion. Now, I've seen one mountain lion in North America in five decades. But in Patagonia, I've seen five mountain lions in one afternoon. So the guanaco is their primary food. The mother on the right has four cubs. You can see three of them. You can actually see four cubs, but uh, the head of the fourth one's disappeared. She has just made a kill on the guanaco. And then after that, the cubs are playing, chasing each other. And another uh, mountain lion known as Blinky, because it's been swatted by a male lion, but it's a very good hunter. And I've worked with that cat for two years in a row. And it's amazingly tame. You can get up to her and her cubs without any issues. Of course, you're not going to walk on top of them. You're still using a 1 to 500, but it's amazingly uh, approachable from that point of view. So yeah, over the years, uh, some of my favorite photos will wind up in the book. I tend not to do books that have uh, a whole lot of redundancy. It gives me uh, a, a great challenge to replenish and have new photos for the people that actually buy the books that I uh, work on. This is a female bear that has brought her cubs right up to my group while we were eating lunch along a river in the backcountry of Katmai. And it literally is so smart, it realizes that humans can save the cubs' lives because the male bears, the boar bears, would naturally try to kill her cubs so that she would come in to heat and breed with her. But she doesn't want to lose her cubs. So she literally brings them up from here to the people in the first row, puts them right down in front of us, and then she'll go 100 yards up the river fishing, knowing that her cubs are safe. So brown bears are one of my favorite animals. I've photographed them a number of times over the years. I've done a lot of books on Alaska or magazine assignments that dealt with Alaska. And these amazing creatures, especially the brown bears, they look and act like big dogs as far as I'm concerned. You know, their snouts are longer because they spend an inordinate amount of time underwater fishing. And these shots are just obviously intended to be longer exposures to get, uh, give a sense of emotion to the moment, if you will. Sudden rainstorm is perfect. It, with a higher ISO, you can stop the motion of the rain. And I just love the time uh, we are living in as a photographer. And I think Franz and I would both uh, commiserate over the fact that for many, many of our careers, the years of our career, we could not get the shots that we really envisioned. Now, with higher ISOs, better lenses, better everything, we can get photos we only dreamed of a handful of years ago. And of course, once a bear is submerged in the water, they shake vigorously. And yeah, as you see, they just are such a, a, a great subject. And these bears are really very comfortable around humans, largely because they have been exposed to fly fishermen for 80 years. And so these are the great, great grandchildren of bears that reconciled that humans were not a threat to them. And so consequently, you can be very, very close to the uh, Alaskan brown bear, super grizzly, without fear. So one year I used the underwater housing to photograph the sockeye salmon. So we uh, lead our tours every year to coincide with the great salmon runs that are coming out of Bristol Bay. Of course, bears are not the only ones that are there during the uh, salmon run. Here are Merganser and her chicks are picking off the eggs that are in the water. Here is a helpless, hapless bear uh, surrounded by salmon. And there's, he never caught a single fish because <laughs> The water is too deep, and the fish were kind of toying with him, swimming around him, but he never caught a single fish. 
virtually thousands of fish were all within sight. To get this shot, I'm basically laying on my belly uh, and shooting the bear as it's running straight at me. And then at the last minute or so, I hoped it would lunge on the salmon and not on me. So the subjects are, are every year I go up there, I see and photograph something new. It, I just love it. It's, it's something I look forward to every year, photographing these great creatures. And they're doing very well. I mean, the uh, brown bear's populations are very, very stable throughout Alaska. And this is a little video just to show you how fast they move. Don't they look lovable? Yeah, I mean, they move fast. And uh, they were surrounding us. People are going crazy taking pictures of fights like this. And after a fight like this, they just get up and catch fish again. It, it's, no blood is really drawn on uh, these kind of fights. This little bear uh, last year, every time we approached it, it stood up and kind of did a little jig for us. <laughs> Love that bear. In the Savannah chapter, we start in um, Serengeti, of course, uh, down south into Botswana as the sun is setting during the fall season where a lot of farmers to the south are burning their grasslands, or their, their crops, I should say. Uh, you get br beautiful sunsets over the animals. Here, uh, the first time I went to Africa was in November 1980. I climbed Kilimanjaro, and then later went out into the Serengeti. And uh, this is in Amboseli at the foot of the Kilimanjaro, highest mountain in Africa. Back when I climbed it, uh, there were really sustained glaciers on the mountain. Today, they're just you know, hints of what was once. On the border of Tanzania and uh, Kenya, there's a beautiful, vast uh, lake called Lake Natron. And it has no outlet. So it's surrounded by volcanoes. And with the rainy season, uh, the rain washes down minerals into the lake. It becomes a toxic mix, but nevertheless quite extraordinary in the color ranges. But in addition, there's over a million flamingos that live and nest in Lake Natron, the greater and the lesser flamingos. And so over the years, from helicopter perspective, I photograph them. And again, as I said earlier, patterns, textures, long exposures, all of that is part of the repertoire uh, part of my uh, bag of trip, tricks, if I can't pronounce a word right in the moment, I'm like Porky Pig. I'm going to switch to something I can pronounce. So these are the greater flamingos. To the north in Chad, where I'll be heading next week, um, there's a great national park called Zakuma National Park. And five million quellias, these tiny little birds, swarm over the bigger birds like the marabou storks. But five million, they look like swarms of insects. And of course, the kites come in at the time they're swarming, and they pick them off. It's a national park that is very seldom visited. And so the spectacles of, and the numbers of mammals and birds are extraordinary. Great. Uh, crown cranes are in the thousands, whereas in other locations you would see, you know, small flocks. So it is an amazing place to visit. Crown cranes flying, and of course they're flying in front of the setting sun. I got several different shots of the same thing. Just focus on the sun and wait. I in that same park, and the reason I went up there was that John Jewit, that re renegade group from the Sudan that was raping and pillaging, were also coming across the border into Chad and annihilating the population of elephants. And so a, a, a co-Seattleite, um, the co-founder of Microsoft, George Allen, Paul Allen, put in radio telemetry into the national park and hired what he called the Black Mambas and over the time that they had collars on elephants and computers and the black mamba in the bush, they have effectively stemmed the 
slaughter of the elephants. And so I got up there, well, it was still a large herd of 300 elephants, which you would never really see a herd of 300 elephants in today's world. And I provided the photos to the park, and they were counting all the babies now that were within the larger herd. So that was a great project to see and experience a herd of animals that large in numbers was too large to photograph in one single frame. This is a drone shot over hippos in a river that's drying up during the dry season. And so now the hippos are relegated to pools that were once part of a river. But what makes it really interesting is that they're sharing that pool with other animals that they do not necessarily like. And hippos, as many of you that have traveled to Africa would attest, are one of the most dangerous animals in all of Africa. But the other animal that's really dangerous is the Nile crocodile. And these guys have to share the dwindling water supplies. And they don't do it gracefully. They are always at odds. And in the next shot, one of the foolish crocodiles tries to climb over the backs of the hippos, and he was bitten severely. And you know, if you've see, ever seen the pictures, you can see a couple of the teeth of the hippos. They're quite formidable. But crocodile eventually got away and survived. So the Great Migration, of course, would, I would be remiss without having versions of that in this book. We are loving some of these places to death. And so there's more and more uh, areas being converted into nature preserves. Uh, along with the Maasai cattle ranchers, there are areas where people can go and go on safari. Despite the fact that there could be a herd of cattle, you also have lions and leopards and all the other animals in there. This is a drone shot over uh, migrating wildebeest on the Mara River. They're frightened as they cross the river, and if they cr uh, choose wrong, they get pinned up against a cliff, and often that is when the crocodiles move in and take their share. Crocodiles eat once a year, and it's during the migration. Not only are uh, two million wildebeest on the move, but there could be 100,000 Zebras also migrating at the same time. They're following the rains and the grasses. They're great subjects for photographers, as are the cheetahs and the other spotted cats that you would find in East Africa. The Cape buffalo is yet another formidable animal, and especially if it's an older bull by itself. This is something that drivers and guides are very wary of. And one time we were at the edge of a small water hole, and suddenly a herd of these great ox came running by, and we were trying to figure out what was the catalyst, why were they, in fact, running so fast. And at the end of it, there was a pride of lions chasing them. In this particular image, it's a pack of uh, hyenas that had already taken down one Cape bu 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 buffalo and a calf, and now they're chasing others. So I had no idea that these uh, hyenas were going after such a big game as a Cape buffalo. Here, a hyena is being chastised by a pack of wild dogs. He's come too close to the den site. So they bit him a couple times and released him. They could have torn him apart, but they, they let him go. And in this shot, a pack of wild dogs are taking down a wildebeest. And for the most part, the book would be remiss without this drama of prey and predator, but as little as I can make it, you won't see too many entrails and blood. Like, for instance, here pups are playing with the head of a baboon. And right before this, it wasn't believed that the wild dogs were going after primates you would often see primates sitting on a log, kind of watching wild dogs go after impala or wildebeest, and now these particular herd of, or pack of dogs have turned towards primates. Blackback jackals in the springtime. Here's several mothers with their uh, 
lion cubs. And there has been places in Okavango where a pride of lions have really effectively learned to take down the buffalo. And that, to me, was an amazing sight to see the play give and take. And often, lions are killed during the process of trying to take down buffaloes. So it should be of great comfort to know that in the year 2023, there's a lot of this going on beyond the headlines and all the strife and the worry and the, all the things that we've been subjected to, COVID. There are still animals out there living their lives and uh, staying in stable numbers. This one uh, elephant w had enough of watching these lions breed, and it just decidedly broke it up. <laughs> Several cats. It's amazing to see a uh, leopard stalking a prey. And you can see why the leopard is so effective, because with all that, the spots, it just virtually blends in with the complexity of the environment. If it was all one color, for instance, it would be very easy to see. But look at how low to the ground as it's stalking its prey. So leopards, again, are one of the least seen of the big cats, but the most plentiful throughout Africa. Their numbers are doing extremely well, not only in Africa, but in India, Sri Lanka, uh, they are quite widespread as a top predator. So water holes are a, a, a great place to get up and close to subjects. How am I doing for time, by the way? I think I'm okay. Somebody's going to take a cane and take me off stage. So this is a water hole uh, in the southeast corner of Botswana. And right at eye level, we're in a container that uh, no animal can get to us. And uh, for with wide angle shots, you have this uh, amazing ability to see and hear and actually get splashed by frolicking elephants at uh, sunset. In the desert chapter, we start with the Biso Oryx in uh, Namibia, again uh, from the vantage point of a helicopter. Great landscape, light, and subject come together occasionally, and that's what happened with that. In the deserts of Namibia, you have a small viper. Uh, can you see it in the distance? The eyes are pretty evident center right. And that li it's a tiny little snake, but its prey is the uh, geckos and other animals that c cross the dunes. In the Tosha National Park in the north of Namibia or north central, uh, everything comes. It's almost like Noah's Ark. At one point, if you spend the day at a water hole, virtually every animal you can imagine comes in for a drink. We are in the desert chapter of the book, and so platoons of elephants, platoons of uh, Bisa oryx, and once they've uh, drank, then they frolic and dust, and everything waits for them to leave before they come back to the water. That is, only one animal doesn't wait. He comes in, it's the rhino. It's amazing how even the elephant herds kind of give way to the black rhino. It's a tough ombre in that environment. And at that one particular day, 10 rhinos with their calves came in. So the black rhino is a formidable animal, a beautiful animal, but it's also, as one would guess, highly endangered because of uh, the poaching that goes on. These elephants are very light in color because they've been dusting in silica, and then they've come to a dead family member and ran off a pride of lions that were feeding on the elephant. So that's what you're seeing in this image. In Madagascar, a leaf-tailed gecko blends in with the lichen on the rock. So I've done a, uh, the first English version of a uh, chameleon's book. So I spent a lot of time in Madagascar shooting that, as well as East Africa. Uh, but you go there for other reasons as well. The ringtail uh, lemurs, they wrap their luxuriant tail around their bodies at dusk. The Sapacus lemur is jumping, and I was so concentrating on getting it midair, I failed to recognize that it has a tiny, tiny baby in its belly. 
So yeah, the lemurs are irresistible. They're like the friendly monkeys. They tend not to bite. Some of them are a little strange. You know, the eye eye comes out at night. Very uh, strange animal in the world of lemurs. Staying in the desert chapter, we're high in the Bolivian Altiplano, or the high plain of the Andes. And would you believe it that at 16,000 feet, at 14,000 feet, there are lakes that have flamingos. We think of flamingos as being very delicate, warm, you know, tropical birds, but in fact, they live and thrive in very freezing environments, going after the tiny crustaceans that live in these lakes that have a lot of alkaline. So six of the, three of the species of six flamingos around the world thrive in the arid air of Bolivia and northern Chile. In the ocean chapter, we start off with humpback whales. Humpback whales are, and the, I'm snorkeling, I'm not diving, so I'm just on the surface with uh, underwater housing, snorkeling. This is known as a heat run. The whale in the upper left is, is the female, and all the males are chasing it and trying to breed with it. And she's swimming very fast. These are the giant uh, rays off the coast of Mexico, and from a drone, a blue whale in the Sea of Cortez. The largest animal that ever lived on the face of the planet, the blue whales. This is the second largest. This is a fin whale also in the Sea of Cortez. And the largest shark in the world is the whale shark off the coast of Mexico. Unfortunately, moments after I shot the shot, it turned around and gobbled those two humans. <laughs> so, no, yeah, most of what I say is bullshit, uh, <laughs> just to keep me awake. At any rate, uh, these guys are really, they sieve small crustaceans. They're totally harmless to humans. An orca has learned and is teaching other members of the pod how to ride a wave in on Peninsula Valdez to catch unsuspecting young sea lions. And then it trains other members of the pod. So it's an extraordinary sight to see a beached whale come up, grab a seal, wiggle its way out, and then consume. In the north, I have photograph. I've seen orcas from my bed. I live on a viewpoint overlooking Puget Sound, and there's three pods of orcas that come down uh, during the winter months. So they're one of my favorite species because I see them quite often. And in Alaska, uh, they're quite plentiful. They are probably, I can't even imagine, honestly, a predator that could even uh, hold a candle to these things. At one point, there was a great white shark and uh, a single orca coming together, and they thought there would be this big battle, but in fact, within minutes, the uh, great white was dead. It just flipped him on its back, bumped him, and that was it. So these guys, there's no, I don't think there's anything that can compare with an orca in terms of being a top predator. But fortunately, they don't kill, kill humans at all. They don't even think about that unless they've been really uh, trained in a circus or an underwater park where their natural behavior has been changed. They're, they're feeding off stellar sea lions. They even learn to eat the sea otters, which are exploding in their ranges. For the longest time before Alaska was uh, bought from the Russians, the Russians really annihilated a lot of the uh, uh, sea otters for their pelts. But that was then. Now is now, and there's just an explosion of sea otters in Alaska, almost to the point where they're really harming the environment. So the orcas are coming in and feeding on these guys like, you know, gummy bears. What also comes to Alaska during that time is the humpback whales. And uh, the historic low of the eastern race of humpback whale, the Pacific, was down to 1,600 animals. 10 years ago, the number was 26,000, and I'm not sure what the latest count is, but they have recovered, and in fact, most whale species have recovered and are, in, are doing very, very well around the globe. That's a good news. Those are good news to hear. 
the yeah, humpbacks are a great subject. You know, late in the afternoon, their spray is coming up, catching the last light of the day. They have this tradition of bubble net feeding, and they just uh, dive deep. They emit these bubbles that trap the herring, and then they come up with their mouths agape, and they consume the herring, and they do this time after time after time. So every other year, I uh, rent out a luxury um, yacht, and we go up to Glacier Bay, and we spend a week over the water photographing everything you can imagine. Orcas, humpbacks, sea lions, sea otters, black bear, brown bear. Here, uh, this was just shot. Two uh, jumping at the same time is very unusual. And in fact, I did, it was so fast that I only thought there was one, but somebody corrected me and made me look at the photos and said, oh, yeah, there's two. This is a stellar sea lion happily playing in the, the wake of a humpback whale, which you often find. You know, they just like to frolic on the um, pectoral fins of the humpback, and they're just playing, and the humpbacks don't seem to really care about that. And then, of course, the great tail of a humpback as it's diving. In the Galapagos Islands, a uh, Get, uh, booby is looking at me while I'm underwater. The marine iguanas are truly suffering as the warming waters off the Galapagos Islands are really damaging the vegetation below the water surface, which is what the marine iguana primarily feeds on. So their numbers are at risk. This is an American crocodile, and I was assured I could get in the water and it would be safe. And I kept on saying, are you really, really, really sure about that? They said, oh yeah, get in there. So I got in the water um, and photographed them with my underwater housing, and they literally come up until their snout bounces off the dome port. So I'm kind of positioning the dome port of my underwater housing in between me and this nine to 10 foot crocodile. Yeah, it does look like your worst nightmare. And it doesn't make me look all that intelligent, but I did manage to get the shots without any harm, and the people were right. And what really is the story behind this is that there's fishermen that have little huts on stilts, and they, they remove the bycatch that, of the day's fishing, and they huck it in the water. And these now, these crocodiles, have associated the people with food. And so that's why they're coming straight up to me. They're looking for food, and I have no food other than a hand to give them. So uh, I just got recertified a couple of years ago during COVID so I could get into Indonesia and not just do s specific specimens of fish, but I wanted the coral and the myriad of fish to be within those photos. And as you know, corals are taking a, a dive as the water's off Florida and other locations. The superheated water is frying them and bleaching them. And so that is becoming a real problem in the oceans. Um, people are trying to develop corals that would be resistant to the increased uh, temperature of the water. I don't know the end of that. Other people would be more qualified to talk about that. This is a scorpion fish. I did a book called Vanishing Act, so I first got in the water looking for sea creatures that were invisible in front of me, and of course the scorpion fish is one of them, so beautiful in their shapes, and a pair of clownfish, and again, the beauty of the corals behind. And the largest of the seahorses is the leafy sea dragon. Uh, that was photographed off Adelaide, uh, Australia, probably 20 years ago. So in the tropical section of the book, and I'm now, do I have like two minutes and 12 seconds left? Okay, good to know. I only have two chapters to go. <laughs> so speed talking now. These are gibbons in the tropical forests of Kaziranga in India. Um, my favorite macaque, my favorite monkey now is the Selaway's macaques. They're very, very nice little monkeys. They'll jump on your head, sit on your head, but they don't bite. That's the critical thing. They won't bite. <laughs> so they see their own reflection in the wide angle of the lens, and so they are reacting to that. 
One of the smallest primates is the tarsier. It's got a little hand just like mine. And uh, they live in the same environment as the macaques. In Kaziranga, the great one-horned Indian rhino population is increasing, highly endangered, but the numbers are up and up and up. And again, it just takes a concerted effort by environmentalists and uh, forest rangers keeping poachers at bay. Tigers are doing well. They're increasing everywhere in India. And again, they are identifying tracts of land that have historically not been preserved. And as long as there's food, like the spotted deer or the sandbar, they can put lion, uh, tigers from other parks in there. The tigers breed well in an environment where there's food. And so their numbers are coming up virtually everywhere. Great hornbill, wreath hornbills. I mean, the tropical regions of the book has so much color. Virtually raining bat shit over me when I was getting this shot. I kept, I kept on thinking, is this starting to rain? No, it's the bats coming out of a cave peeing on you. OK. Five million of these bats come out of a cave in central uh, Thailand at a time. I kind of uh, gerrymandered a pole that had a tripod head and a wheel and put a, a camera with a wide angle that I uh, started clicking. Every second it would take a picture, but I'm still 12 feet away, and I ran it under these uh, Komodo dragons. We thought that Komodo dragons had a toxin in their saliva that could infect you if you were ever to get bit. But now we now know that they have a poison. They're like a cobra. And so they'll bite a goat or a cow or whatever and then just slowly follow it until it drops. These are nine-foot lizards. Chimpanzees. And of course, the mountain gorillas. So again, the mountain gorillas' populations are stable, if not growing, in um, several of the countries, Rwanda, Uganda, the Congo. And when they're habituated, they are an amazing animal to photograph. This is virtually right at my feet with a 24 millimeter wide angle. And they're just looking at you curiously. Staying in the tropical section, we head south to South America. Red and blue macaws in front of a, uh, yeah, that dark background is a crater. And here we have hyacinth macaws at a nest, mountain toucan one of the most extraordinarily beautiful variety of colors on a single bird I've ever seen. Ocelots in the rainforest, and of course the jaguar now has become a very visible and photographable animal within the last 15 or 20 years. I was on one of the first excursions to experiment to see if we could get them. It was the only boat on the river for four days, and now there's a lot of people going down and getting great, great shots of what was once a myth of the forest is the jaguar. They're feeding along these rivers in the Pantanal for caiman. They like caiman. And they're a water-based cat. They also spend a lot of time in the water. Here is a male trying to breed with a female heading down one of the tributaries of the river. They share the river with the giant river otter, one of the top predators in the whole Amazonia. And pink river dolphins in the Amazon. This looks like a wary animal. This is the ukari. He's wary because a lot of primates are wary of one thing, the harpy eagle. The top eagle in the environment feeds on monkeys and on sloths. And uh, they're a force to be reckoned with, especially if you're in their sights and coming in and feeding their single chick. Whoops, sorry. So the last chapter, that last chapter is of South Georgia Island, a place that I went down in 1981 for the first time. And things are changing in South Georgia Island as well. When I first went down there, there was just a handful of fur seals on one end of the island. Now there's three million. But 
with the warming of the temperatures also, there's more krill and therefore there's more king penguins. So they're mushrooming in population. Whales are increasing in the, the subantarctic waters as well as more krill are breeding. It's a great place for Franz and I. We've both been down there multiple times with different uh, projects over the years. It's, to me, it epitomizes the term uh, primordial. It's just got millions of birds and seals and mountains and glaciers and so forth and so on. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, Franz and I are going to share a stage and share some of our favorite stories. And I highly recommend coming and seeing Franz and I drink too much tequila and talk about our lives. I'm not done, though. I'm almost done here. Uh, these beautiful little wieners grow up to be a grotesque largest seal on the planet. And um, here a Waddell seal is uh, curiously coming up to me. Again, there was never a population of people that hunted in Antarctica. So consequently, penguins and seals are very, very approachable. They'll walk right up to you, look up at you, walk through your tripod. These are Adelie penguins. And once um, Adelies or Gentoos in this case hit the water, they're also looking out for what? The leopard seal which is a very efficient predator of these beautiful little penguins. So everything's got to eat, you know? It's, there's no ideal environment on the planet where animals need to feed. I was fortunate to be on the first exploratory trip to find emperors on the Waddell Sea uh, oh, a good 25 years ago. And these photos were taken at 2.30 in the morning, and this is, in fact, the last photo I'm sharing with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meet and greet area where you can take some Q&A and yeah. get flooded with about 400 people. All right. Um, but I you know, just want to say that this was very promising. You're saying good things. that. The, eco the ecology is stabilizing in some areas. Well, you know, if, all, if everybody heard nothing but negative news, you would give up. So I think it's important to highlight where, what good people are doing around mm -hmm. the world that wouldn't necessarily make the headlines every night. So it's something people need to hear, actually. Awesome. All right. Okay, thank so you. thank you so much. Art. Okay. Okay, we got Art's going to be uh, back tomorrow uh, for two presentations, one with Franz Lanting, and that's going to be taking place in the optic room. Right now, uh, we have Gene Fruth, and if we could, uh, we got that pick, the clicker back, yep. Uh, if we could just let Art get outside the room, there's a speaker meet and greet table, you'll be able to ask him questions and meet Art, and it's gonna be all good. So we're gonna turn, we're gonna play a commercial, and then we're gonna come back with Gene Fruth in about three minutes. Alpha.
Introducing the new Paybu credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your Paybu credit card. So you wanna save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The BNH Paybu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over six or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new Paybu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either Paybu savings or special financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved Paybu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new Paybu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today. Alpha. Thank you very much. Wait a minute. We're just talking. It looks like birds are more popular than sports. But uh, here at Build, we really want to create a very expansive, all-encompassing, and fit all the disciplines. So when we said we got to get someone for sports photography, Jean Fruth, Sony Artisan, came to mind. She is an expert sports photographer. She's got a couple of books under her belt, and we're really looking forward to having her share her wisdom, her tips, and her images. Jean, come on up. Here's the clicker. Why, thank you. Okay, thank you Everybody so much. wants the clicker. So really, are birds more popular than sports? No, no. Well, following Art Wolf is like uh, having the Rolling Stones open for you. So here we go. I think it's just I think it's just hair clicking on the thing. When we turn the mic? Oh, look at that. That's great. Okay. We're on to handheld. So no no lav. Do you want to go back to the lav and just test it? Now their hair is back. Is that the feedback okay. problem? Okay. We're good. Oh, that's great. Hey, yeah, we'll do handheld. Yep. Okay. I took this image quite a few years ago during the Major League Baseball playoffs, the ALCS, the American League Championship Series. The game was slotted for a 3 p.m. start time, which is unusual for playoffs. Usually, um, especially in a big market like New York City, games would start at 7.30 or 8 p.m. And I thought on my way to the ballpark, wow, we could really get some some special light for this game. I, I wonder if I could make a special picture. So I got to the ballpark early, as I always do, and I traversed my way up to the top before fans arrived to the stands, into the ballpark, and I scouted a position that would require me sitting in a fan seat to make this picture. I noted the seat, headed back down to the field, started to shoot batting practice, and then when the game began, got into my photo position and started to shoot the game. And in a game like this, there's probably 50 or more photographers, and we're all pretty much shooting the same thing. And as the game progressed, sure enough, the light just got more and more beautiful. And I thought, well, do I make my move, which may sound a little silly, but during a playoff games, for those of you who know, and I can see some in the audience who certainly know, you just really don't leave your, your photo position, especially at Yankee Stadium. But I decided I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna make my move, and I traverse my way up to the top, the taking the stairs through the 55,000 people, and found the seat, introduced myself to the fan, and lucky for me, he said yes, I could shoot from his position. And uh, we're still Facebook friends today. Um, and I made this picture. And that is what sports photography is 
for me. I'm not interested in making 200 mediocre pictures. I'm trying to make one, to make one special photo. And sometimes you take risks to make that photo, and sometimes there is, for your risk, you have no reward. You know, what if I miss an Aaron Judge home run? Okay, no risk, no reward. I got so excited after I made this picture that I wondered, what would it be like outside with this beautiful late October light that you only get you know, in the later months during baseball? So I went outside and I made this picture against the facade. The light was so beautiful and by the time I got back inside, got through security, got back to my photo position, all the photographers in my section were saying, is everything okay? Are you okay? Where have you been? You missed so much. But I was more than okay because on that day, I made a special picture. One of my photography heroes, and probably yours as well, is Henri Cartier-Bresson. And these four quotes from him sum it up for me. And you may ask, well, what does a 1940 surrealist photographer have to do with a modern day sports photographer? And for me, it's everything, because you can't make a great picture unless you know what one is. So these four quotes, if I go to a place that's trying to make a picture that concretizes a situation, at one glance says everything. A strong relation of shapes, which for me is essential. A visual pleasure, geometry, structure, an intellectual pleasure to have everything in the right place. And the difference between, and all you sports photographers know this, between a good picture and a mediocre picture, it's a question of millimeters. A small difference, but it's essential. And my favorite, it's seldom that we make a great picture. We have to milk the cow quite a lot and get plenty of milk to make a little cheese. Oops, I did the bad thing. I pressed the wrong button. As my photography career in sports progressed, I became the traveling photographer for the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. The museum wanted to attract a younger audience. The marketing department wanted to attract a younger audience through social media. Social media was just starting to heat up in baseball and in the world. So they tasked me with tying the contemporary game back to history. And it was a tremendous years of growth for me um, and my job became far more reaching. And it was there that I learned to become a visual storyteller. And it also gave me a year-round shooting schedule in baseball, which I still have today, starting in spring training. And then every four years, we have something special called the World Baseball Classic, which is where all these countries participate for who's the best in the world. This year, it was 20 countries that participated. Japan and Shohei Otani was the star of the show, and they took home the trophy, and so was their manager. And it's very special because they're playing for country pride, and it only happens every four years. And the regular season then begins, and I travel to ballparks, shooting the game and storytelling the major league game. And then the postseason begins, and it starts with a wild card, it ends with a World Series, and people will ask me, well, who's your favorite team? Who do you want to win? Who are you rooting for? And it's not a cop-out. I really don't have a favorite team. All I'm looking for is to always root for a Game 7 because I never want it to end. But it does end, and somebody gets a trophy, and then there's a parade. And then the fun begins because there's baseball played somewhere in the world all the time. And then the Caribbean series, the, well, the, the baseball in the Caribbean, all of their seasons begin. Puerto Rico, Cuba, Venezuela, Panama, Mexico, Colombia, and all these countries play their regular season and then they play what's called the Caribbean series. And this year, this past year, Colombia won for the first time in history. And it was, it's a very exciting level of play. It's very festive and they're playing for country pride. So it means a lot for these countries to take home that trophy. While shooting the professional game with the Baseball Hall of Fame and before then, I always continued to shoot the amateur game, the grassroots game. And still today, it's my favorite part of the game. It's before money and contracts and lockouts. 
So if I'm in Japan and I'm shooting the World Baseball Classic, I take time to find a Little League game in Tokyo. Or if I'm in the Dominican Republic shooting Winter League, I might wander the streets of San Pedro de Macorís looking for baseball. High school games in Mobile, Alabama, Little League games in Oakland, California, old guys playing stickball on the streets of New York City. This is singer-songwriter Paul Simon, his second round of me and Julio down by the schoolyard. A pickup game in Havana, Cuba. And that's how my first book, Grassroots Baseball, Where Legends Begin, came about. I connected with Hall of Famers and asked them if they would tell their stories of their young years, their younger years of playing baseball in the regions they grew up in. And I had a chance to work with the Hall of Famers, taking portraits and doing projects with them, but this was very special because their stories of their younger years was something that I hadn't heard before, and everybody knows about their playing years, but their young years were just not told. And so I paired them with these images, these grassroots images for each section. And guys like Ricky Henderson just told great stories of what it was like growing up. He said that he didn't want to play baseball, he wanted to play football. His mom wanted him to play baseball, and we all know mothers know best. So, uh, so anyway, she, uh, the mom had the coach pick uh, Ricky up uh, after school to go to practice, and in the back seat would be a glazed donut and a hot chocolate waiting for him, and that's how he decided that baseball might be a sport. Guys like Hank Aaron from Mobile, Alabama, tells an incredible story of what it was like. He started in the Negro Leagues and then played in Major League Baseball at 20 years old with the early days of integration, and he had tremendous adversity that he faced his whole baseball career during that time in the 1950s, early 50s. I had a chance to photograph Hank Aaron's childhood home in Mobile, Alabama, and I invited four historically black high school baseball teams to join me at Hank's home and pose for this picture. And I invited them all to please come in full uniform, and they're teenagers, so I wasn't quite sure who was going to show up. There was only one day where they didn't have games and they just had practices. But they did. They showed up, and we made this picture, and we talked about Hank Aaron and what it was like for him growing up with this tremendous adversity. And then we talked about their adversity, their socioeconomic adversity, because baseball has become an expensive sport, and it's really divided the have and the have-nots, where equipment is expensive, private lessons, travel ball that a lot of kids can't afford. So we took this picture, and we talked about it a lot, and we left uh, Hank's rocking chair open in honor of him. Guys like Whitey Ford talks about how wonderful it was to grow up in New York City and then have the chance to work and play for the New York Yankees back in the 50s. Rest in peace, Whitey Ford. Nolan Ryan tells a great story of what it was like to, to grow up in Texas with parents who really instilled values in him at a very young age that he took to baseball, delivering newspapers with his dad at 2 and 3 in the morning every day. And Vladimir Guerrero was the third Hall of Famer, inducted to the Hall of Fame, the third Dominican player to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, coming from this tiny town of Don Gregorio in the Dominican Republic, where there's dirt roads, and him and his family all still live in Don Gregorio today. And uh, you know, he does have the biggest house in Don Gregorio, I'll give you that. But um, it's just an incredible feat to come from such humble beginnings and not only make it to Major League Baseball, but make it to the Baseball Hall of Fame and inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, where only where less than 1% of Major League Baseball players make it, and what a story he is. Shooting the grassroots game, the amateur game, is very different for me than shooting a professional game. Baseball is played the same everywhere, but it looks different in different places. And that's what's interesting about it, the stories of baseball, the geography, the topography. Cathedrals versus the sandlots. 
action is certainly still part of the grassroots game and it's exhilarating to shoot, but these images need to tell so much more. It needs to tell a story, show a sense of place, and ideally show the culture. After Grassroots Baseball Where Legends Begin, my first book was released. I wanted to do something more and give back. And I was in a point in my life where I wanted to give back to the craft I love and give back to the sport I love. And I started teaching a lot more, which I still do today, is teaching a lot more sports photography workshops. I work with a group called Summit Workshops, and they're terrific. And it's just wonderful for me to be able to give back in that way and also give back to the sport I love. And so we, uh, with a partner, Jeff Idelson, who had retired from the Baseball Hall of Fame, announced his retirement, I reached out and asked if he wanted to co-found with me Grassroots Baseball, a not-for-profit, promoting and celebrating the amateur game. And our first initiative was to give back to underprivileged communities at the youngest level. We decided to start our not-for-profit along Route 66 because it doesn't get more Americana than baseball on Route 66. So we got ourselves an RV and a bunch of sponsors, and we started in Chicago. We ended in Santa Monica. Jeff drove the RV the whole time. He also pumped all the diesel, and I edited my photos in the back. We connected with Boys and Girls Club and partnered with them all the way through uh, the Route 66. Minor league ballparks opened their doors to us. Hall of Famers joined us all along Route 66 to give lessons to kids, taught them how to throw a ball, how to play catch, words of inspiration. And it was just a terrific experience for these kids. Each kid got a new Rawlings baseball glove and ball thanks to our very generous sponsors. And young players got a chance to meet their heroes from the very same small towns that they grew up in along Route 66. This is a fun story, Johnny Bench in uh, Oklahoma City. We were pulling up in our RV with, with Johnny and this young man with his parents was looking at Johnny's statue and I asked him, would you like to see your statue come alive? He absolutely had no idea who, what I was talking about and he didn't know who Johnny Bench was, but his parents did and it was an exciting moment where he signed his cap and the parents got to meet Johnny. And all of this is about a lot more than baseball. Sure, as you can see, I'm quite partial to baseball, but we all know that kids who play sports have better outcomes in life. They have better outcomes in health, better outcomes in their academics. And that's what this is about. Sure, it's, it's for me it's baseball, but really it's any sport. It's getting kids away from the video games and outside and having healthier outcomes, improve physical health, mental health, and of course teaches important life skills. We spent three years along Route 66. And it was just an absolute blast. And my second book, Grassroots Baseball, Route 66, came out of that. And like the first book, Hall of Famers and retired players, legends from their areas, told stories of what it was like growing up along Route 66, and it goes through eight states. And my job was similar to the first book, where I was telling the stories of these urban cities and small towns Oklahoma looks different than Kansas. Texas had different stories to tell than the Pueblos of New Mexico. And the light in Arizona, that beautiful light in the desert, looks very different than the sunsets in Santa Monica. And I also got to flex some different photography muscles for this project, shooting the Americana all along Route 66 and intertwining it with the stories of baseball. It made this, the project more interesting for me to be able to shoot something different, and it also widened the audience for the book. This is the balloon fiesta in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was supposed to shoot this my first year of the project and the timing didn't work out and I missed it. 
And I thought, no problem, I'll shoot it the second year. And then COVID happened and there was no balloon fiesta. And then I had to beg the publisher in year three to please keep these pages open because I need balloon photos in this book. Because the uh, legend who tells his story, he starts off talking about seeing balloons and bal the balloon fiesta and how big of a deal that was in Albuquerque. Alex Bregman from the Astros. So I took this picture, it was my very last photo of the, uh, for, the, for the book, and I was in a media balloon, and we went up, and it was a beautiful sunrise, and I made my pictures, and then we weren't able to land. Uh, for some reason, balloons are tricky, and the wind, and where we're going to land, and there's all these balloons, and we were up there for hours, absolute hours. The light was ugly, it was you know, just harsh 11 a.m. light. I ran out of things to talk about. With this pilot, we talked sports, we talked kids, we talked everything, and uh, then I was saying things like, "How about there? Can we land there?" And which, of course, is ridiculous. Um, but what he did do is he told me that he said that balloons. He said, "Do you know that balloons have the right of way over every other aircraft in the sky?" And that is because they have absolutely no control over the balloon. So. That's my first and last time in a balloon. Anyway. Uh, so the train's rolling down the track, and Grassroots Baseball, our not-for-profit, now has a new initiative. And we are telling the stories of women and girls in baseball, past, present, and future, and around the globe. And women are not new to baseball. The door has opened and closed for us throughout history, starting in 1866 with Vassar College, the first uh, women's baseball team. And then uh, during World War II, our Major League Baseball players went off to war, and Mr. Wrigley, who owned the Cubs, um, sent his scouts out to look for women's softball players and convert them to baseball players. And that's when the first Women's Baseball League uh, came about. The AAG PBL, the All American Girls Professional Baseball League. I had a chance to interview a few of these women. One is Maybelle Blair, 95 years old. She was one of the women that a league of their own uh, was based on. Here's a little clip of Maybelle. Oops, no clip of Maybelle. There is a video. Okay, we'll just keep going. Okay, let's try that. Yeah. Oh, bummer. Well, you would have loved Maybelle. She was fabulous, and so. Okay. Did you? <laughs> That's shocking to me. I th would think you're good at everything you do. What position did you play? It was. Just a pitcher. Oh, so exciting! I'm gonna follow a pretty strict one. code. You know, ladylike skirts, lipstick along with your mitt. You know, what was your reaction to wearing it when you saw the uniform you were supposed to wear and having a look at it, what'd you think? No problem whatsoever, you know. The only thing uh, I didn't like about it is when you slid, you'd get gravel in your rear end and it's still sticking here if you want to feel it. That was the problem was uh, the girls just getting uh, terrible strawberries, uh, but we didn't go on the DL list for two months like the men do when they break their fingernail. We had to play or we would be replaced and that's what happened. This is a very new and different project for me. Um, I'm doing a lot of firsts. This is my first time um, in video in a very significant way 
my first time directing, my first time producing. I'm doing all the interviews because it's a woman in baseball interviewing women in baseball. Um, and also, uh, I'm still taking the stills for the project because I want a, a book as part of this project to, to come out of it. Um, and even though now I'm entering this video world, my heart is still in still photography and always will be. I carry my A1 camera wherever I go. And as we're doing this project, the cinematographer that I'm working with says, well, we got to put you behind there. And I'm like, well, I still got to do both because I'm not giving up my, my still photography just yet. And the thing about, just going back for a second, um, doing something like this, doing something new for the first time and having this you know, momentous uh, project with so many news, working with partners like Sony and like b &H is so important to me and I do wanna make that and you can say, well, this is a plug and yeah, I guess it is, but having partners and having companies that you're working with that where you're values align really mean a lot because you're you're trying to do a lot and you have a lot of questions especially with this video gear for me i need i have so many questions about how it all works and what i'm supposed to be using and and anybody at b and h can help me you know and that's a really important thing it's not about just buying the gear it's not about just selling the gear it's really a partnership and it's really a big reminder now that I make, I make the phone call. And in a day and age where you can't get anybody on the phone anymore. I mean, have you tried to call a bank lately? I mean, it's like you can't, there's nobody to talk to. And so being able to pick up the phone, not only get somebody to answer, but get somebody who knows what they're talking about and who has the knowledge is a big deal to me. And so that's my point there. I'm going to keep going. Anyway, Women in Baseball, um, we just got started with this project, but already we're moving along. We had the first Women's College Club Championship in Compton, California. And then they played their second year, um, and their level of play got a little better. The first woman coach in Major League Baseball, Alyssa Nacken, who's in my backyard in San Francisco. Kellyanne Jenkins is uh, one of the 20 women who are playing college baseball, who played college baseball on all men's teams. And uh, she, uh, I got to shoot her and interview her, and she let me know that um, she didn't want to switch to softball when she got to high school. So she told her dad she wanted to stay in baseball, and her dad taught her how to throw a knuckleball to keep her in the game longer and be, enable her to compete against the boys. And she did all four years at Chatham University, and I got to see her uh, start a doubleheader, and I got to see her, her knuckleball, and I can tell you that she mastered it and she got the win. So it was very exciting to see Kellyanne Jenkins. Veronica Alvarez was a roving pitcher, uh, catching instructor, excuse me, with the Oakland A's, and now she's been promoted to international player development and works out of the Dominican Republic. And she's also the USA baseball women's coach. And there's women now in every level of baseball that's starting. It's, it's just a really exciting time to be doing this project. Rachel Balkovec is, is coaching, I'm um, sorry, managing for the New York Yankees minor league team. Kelsey Whitmore is the only woman being paid to play baseball in the United States. She's the first woman to get, oops, a hit in the... Uh, Atlantic League, first woman to pitch. She is a two-way player, just like Shohei Otani. There's only two uh, currently two-way players in baseball, and that's Kelsey and Shohei. Olivia Pichardo is the first woman to play D1 baseball at Brown University at 18 years old, and she's from Queens, which I love. There's so. women college is now, there's more and more colleges are starting to have club teams and we're seeing more women teams, women staying in the game longer. Berkeley University now has a women's college baseball team. And the youth is where it's at. There is over 1,000 girls playing baseball across the United States, mostly thanks to an organization called Baseball for All. And why is this all happening? Well, as longtime female umpire Perry Barber is fond of saying, 
If you can see it, you can be it. And just like our first initiative, this is so much more than about baseball. Here comes another video, so I might need that guy to come back up on stage. Oh, this one works. Okay. You play ball like a girl! of mine is just gratitude, just reflecting on the women who inspired me when I was getting into the game and thinking about, man, if I hadn't had them, where would I be? What took so long for someone to hire Kim to be a GM? I don't know. I'm glad they did. Yeah. Obviously, because yeah. she's here now, right? When we decided to make a change, Kim was the first person I called, and she's the only person I called. You know, growing up, we'd always play catch, my dad and I. My brother and I'd be in the front yard playing wiffle ball, all the kids, even in the house. It was just one of those things that I just, I love throwing, I love hitting, and being able to be in the outfield, be able to be on the mound. Like, how can you not love, you know, when you do it every day? And it's, it's the one thing you wake up working towards and trying to continue being a part of. She's had a lot of obstacles that she's had to overcome, uh, being a girl playing in a boys' sport for so many years. Her ability to overcome those obstacles and continue to pursue and push forward is probably the most impressive thing. People only know Kel like Kelsey Whitmore, the girl that plays baseball, but they don't know her like Kelsey. And it's crazy because it's like as time goes on, sometimes I forget like who, who is Kelsey? She has a heart that only wants to make impacts on others and she just wants to change lives. She wants to change other lives more than her own. I really wanted to play college baseball. And when I tried out, the coach cut me. And he said that they didn't have enough uniforms. It, the whole idea is like to get me to quit, which of course is never gonna happen. When girls play together, it's magical because they're so used to being the only girl. Now they can look to the right, to the left, and see someone who looks just like them and they can, in baseball for all, not just see someone to the right and left of them, they can look up and they can see someone older still playing. Girls are staying in the game longer because they now have a community. And in a small way, baseball for all has gone ahead and, and lead the girls' baseball movement. I just believe in letting kids be who they want to be and they can grow up and they can grow up outside the box and then become these wonderful people and these leaders that help make our world better. And it might start with a baseball game, but to me, it's the change that the world needs. It's a shame that the women that came before me were not more visible as role models, because we have a saying, if you see it, you can be it. And if you don't see it, why would you want to be it? Or why would you even know that it's available to you? When I first started, it was more about me and my upward mobility and the umpiring hierarchy. And now it's, it's much more focused on helping others attain the proficiency and the opportunity that I had to fight for. When I was growing up in the 1940s, a woman's place was at home. But I always knew it was at home first, second, and third. <laughs> Pro baseball player, 1951 to 1954. I just think about a young girl looking up and saying, what? Pro baseball player, 1951? Well, it's possible. It's in the future, though, right now. It is. It's it is in the, in the future. future. If you can see it, you can be it. If you can see it, you can be it.
I'm fond of saying that my camera has given me an entree into so many worlds that I would have otherwise never been in, and certainly had an opportunity to meet so many people that I would otherwise have never met. And so I, I just want to thank B&H and I want to thank Sony for giving me the opportunity to meet all of you today and, and thank you for listening. It'll be outside in the speaker meet and greet table right out to the right of the door for Q&A. And uh, you can ask her any questions. And uh, that was an amazing presentation on baseball. Who knew about all those women? That was pretty, pretty incredible the way that that's been building up. OK, we're going to do some commercials. But then stay tuned. We have Roberto Venezuela coming up next. And uh, he's a Canon speaker. And it's going to be pretty amazing. So uh, be back at your seats right at noon for Roberto. In the meantime, we'll play some commercials. JVC. Thank you. 
Plain and simple, if you're getting paid for your work, your gear needs to be able to adapt and overcome any environmental challenges you may encounter.
JVC. Plain and simple, if you're getting paid for your work, your gear needs to be able to adapt and overcome any environmental challenges you may encounter.
JVC. Plain and simple, if you're getting paid for your work, your gear needs to be able to adapt and overcome any environmental challenges you may encounter. Right on, it is noon. I'm glad you're all skipping lunch so you can be here for Roberto. Roberto. <laughs> I, had, I had the pleasure of, uh, I met Roberto one time before and we were doing virtual events because of some pandemic that was going on and it was really a pleasure to work with him. Uh, we've asked him to, to come back and he's a, a canon explorer of light. He uh, teaches, uh, uh, runs the Photo Creators Workshop, uh, has multiple books out, Classical guitarist, teacher, uh, jack of all trades. I was like, how old are you? And he's like, I'm 62. And I'm like, you look like 38. But anyway, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let's put it together for Roberto. Thank you so much. Hello, hello. Hi, guys. I'm so happy to be back in New York. It's been five years. Oh, my gosh. I've missed it so much. I'm actually 65 years old. So I don't know if you knew, but I was born in 1950. Six? Is that what that is? 1956? Um, can anybody guess my age? 38. 38? I mean, you're, you're all guessing high because you know that when somebody asks you that, they're higher than it is, so forget it. Don't even answer the question. But just so you know, yesterday I went to have a drink at a bar and they, they carded me because they thought I wasn't even 21. 
And I'm like, lady, I'm 46. She's like, no, you're not. I was like, yes, I am. Here's my ID. And they're like, if you're going to fake your ID, don't fake it that much. <laughs> like, just keep it, like, within range. You know what I mean? It's like, whatever. Um, how you doing, guys? <laughs> Woo! Are we going to get our, so, I'm, I'm, so after this, you all go to lunch? OK, let's do this quickly. We have 45 minutes together, 50 minutes. Uh, because the presentation's relatively short, I'm going to go as fast as possible with one goal. I decided to teach a class on the most incredible subject that I love so much, which is posing. Posing sucks. Nobody wants to do it. Do we agree? <laughs> nobody wants to do it, and nobody wants to be posed. What's the problem with posing? Don't people want to look reasonable in their photographs? <laughs> but yet, people don't like it. Photographers don't want to do it, and clients don't want to be posed. Am I right? Except when the photos come back, they, you can't fix a pose in Photoshop, not even with Adobe's Firefly AI. You can't. Maybe soon. <laughs> but right now, you still have to nail the posing. And the posing, to me, has been the savior of my entire career. I believe in teaching posing in a way that's not crazy. The reason why people hate posing is because you learn posing the wrong way many times. You learn posing by doing rules. Like, if you are a guy, you do this. If you are a girl, you do this. And if you're a girl, you put your leg and you go like that and you bring your chin up. You know what I'm saying? And if you're a guy, you put your hands in your pockets and you don't point your thumbs to your penis and all these different things that people say. And this is the struggle that when we approach posting in that way, we look like robots and we can no longer be our organic selves because we're in this robotic position that the photographer put us in. Things had to change. Things had to change. Because without posing, no matter what you do with your lighting, your posing is going to be the first thing a client sees and says, I don't like the way I look. If you take a photo of, of a family and they're all like this, and they're all with their arms around each other, it doesn't matter how expensive your pro photo lights are. <laughs> you are screwed. Because you can't fix this to this. You have to be able to produce something that looks at least decent. So in 45 minutes, I'm going to try to put as much knowledge as easy as possible on the subject of posing, even though we only have a few minutes together. That's the goal. Are we pumped about that? Yeah. Are we pumped? And I mean it. I really mean it. OK? So let's have a little challenge with each other. Let me see how much posing I can pass on in a small time together, shall we? When I started this little goal of mine, I decided that the first thing I need to talk about is this next little slide right here. This slide took me over 10 years to realize that this was the secret to a lot of great posing. The mechanical side, the mechanical side of posing is the, is the style, of, it's, where you put your, it's where you put people's arms, legs, heads, torsos, and heads in whatever position you want them to be. That mechanical side is a nightmare, and people hate it. This is why people run away from posing, because they don't want to do the mechanical side. It looks mechanical, OK? But today, I'm going to show you a way to get that mechanical side and totally understand it. You're going to be able to pose after you leave this 45-minute class without being an expert in posing. You'll be able to produce great post images. That's the goal, OK? The next part is mechanical is basically, just to make sure we all understand, mechanical means the body parts moving in whatever direction you need to move. Is that clear? So if you tell somebody, put your leg here, put your arm there, let's put your chin there, that's the mechanical side. The, the next one is the movement side. This is the part where people get, people get tripped. Movement is necessary in posing, and mistakes are introduced when you start moving your subject. So if you tell your subject to move into a position, you're going to introduce mistakes. Those mistakes are going to manifest themselves in the mechanical part of the pose. And here's the first quite shocking thing I'm going to say. Mistakes, some mistakes, not all crazy mistakes, some mistakes are preferable in good posing. You actually want to have a couple of little things go off, because that means that the movement that you created makes the photo look on post. And a mistake here or there makes it look more realistic. This has been a very successful formula for me, even at the highest levels of photography. 
I, I'm a fashion photographer now, I used to be a wedding photographer. Even the highest magazines in the nation that I get published in like those little mistakes, and they like that about me, and I'll, I'll explain what those are. The next part is the last part. This is the part where a lot of psychology comes in. This is the expression side. You have to, you cannot tell people this. Whisper something in her ear. And then people are like, I'm whispering something in your ear. And you, you, people, no, stop it. Stop it, you. Because every client knows that you're using the same cues to every, with every client. Every client gets told, look out the window and see your unborn children in the clouds. No. Enough is enough, okay? We don't want to see our unborn children in the sky. We don't care about looking out the window like we are dreaming about something. In, like, we need to stop this. You need to tell people where do they need to look, and then from there, you create movement, and then the mechanical side happens to be something that happens naturally. Let me explain that one. Here's the first, here's the first, can I get a volunteer, please, real quick? I don't have much time, come on. Let's yeah, come this way. Guys, here's the first round of applause for her, please, because that's very brave. <laughs> round of applause. Okay, just sit right, sit right there, right here. That's, that's good. Yeah, just sit right there. That's amazing. Yeah, just chill. Let's just get comfortable for a second. There you go. Okay. Okay, don't move now. Freeze. 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 Do not move. Not even your chin. Freeze. Okay. St stay frozen for a minute. Okay. Guys. Remember I told you the mechanical side is the part people hate because it's all these rules and you have to memorize all these things and none of these things make sense when you're under the pressure of a photo shoot, you forget everything and your brain goes to Jamaica and has a margarita, <laughs> right? Am I right about that? When you're about to pose, don't you freeze and forget all about everything you learned about posing? That's because I'm gonna show you a new way. Trust the body, but do not trust the spine. The spine is the betrayer. Do we hate the spine? Yes, we do. We hate the spine, okay? You go talk to it when you go to bed tonight. You say, I hate you, because the spine is programmed by the brain to relax. See, you're all slouching right now. Look at yourselves, you look terrible, okay? I mean it, I mean it, I, I mean that with love. You guys look like you're all slouching. Um, sir, what's your name? Alan. Alan, you're slouching. Yeah. Can you please, can you please, yeah. Uh, okay, you straightened out, that's fine. Okay, everybody's fixing themselves right now as we speak. That's fine. Whatever. Don't move. Don't move. Did she move? Yes. No, not at all. Don't move. <laughs> Keep your fingers. Keep your fingers. Uh, you moved your elbow. Your elbow was slightly bent. There you go. <laughs> Guys, here's the main thing. Trust the body, but do not trust the spine. What does that mean? Here's the biggest secret I'm going to give you in the 45 minutes. If you want to leave after this, you can. Don't do that, but you totally could. The body is programmed by the brain to get itself in a comfortable position. It's, it's programmed that way. The body doesn't need to be posed by the photographer, every angle, every finger, every joint. It doesn't need to do it because your brain, if you put someone sitting down or standing or sleeping or laying or whatever position you put them in, they're gonna put themselves in a comfortable position. Am I right? Nobody says stand up and they stand like this, nobody unless you're the guy from the karate kid, right? Nobody stands like that. Nobody, stand, nobody talks to people like with their arms off because it's not comfortable. Now, what's your name? Chantel. Chantel, that's a beautiful name. Now, take a look at Chantel for a sec. Can you all see her? If you can't, maybe stand up in the back for a second. But take a look at Chantel. She crossed her legs. Did, did I say to her, cross your legs? No. Her elbow is also a little bit bent, she strained it, but it was a little bit bent, right? Her, don't, don't adjust your spine. Her spine is doing what? Take a look. What's her spine doing? It's a, it's a slouch, it looks terrible. That's a major slouch, okay? But, <laughs> it's true. But both of her arms are touching the floor. Why? Why do we, why do we, we either touch our legs or the floor, why do the, why does the brain do that? Because the arm has weight. Do you want to carry your arm weight by yourself or do you want to rest it on the floor? Or do you want to rest it on your leg? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Your brain says this arm, well this arm is full of muscle as you can see, so it weighs a lot, all right? This arm weighs at least 10 pounds. Do you want to carry this 10 pounds like this, or do you want to just rest it? 
do we automatically look for a place to rest our hands and legs? Have you ever seen a person stand and then they cannot bend their knees like that and they cannot bend their leg a little bit like that? Why do we keep switching our weight like this? Are we trying to give one leg a break and, and then we, we stand on both and then we give the other one a break like that? That's why you can trust the body. The body will never betray you, but the spine always will. So if you don't, if you don't know how to pose, and you don't want to study posing because you don't want to read my books or anything like that, you just want to be a master without learning anything, just trust the body and don't trust the spine and you're good. You don't have to read my books or nothing. <laughs> you're set. Okay, you can leave. I'm just kidding. You're good. So if we were to take a photo of her, I would just say, okay, we're going to have her sit. She automatically put herself in a good position. Do you agree? Does she look like she's like totally sloppy like all over? Or does she look like she's pretty much ready to go? The body gives you 90% of the pose or 85% of the pose for free. You don't even have to study posing. It gives it to you 85%. You just have to add movement and expression to it. Remember the last two things we talked about in the little arrows? So if I want to add movement, how would you do that? Chantel, right? Chantel, go ahead and get up again. And I'm going to have you take a seat again. And I want you to take a look at this young lady over here. What's her name? Yeah, Cindy. Cindy, take a look at Cindy, then take a look at the screen, then take a look at the floor. Okay, take a look, you relax, relax, nice and neat, take a look at Cindy, take a look at the screen, take a look at the floor, start laughing at the floor, have a good time with it. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah, that's so good. Now go ahead and look at the screen and laugh at that. Ah, that's so funny. Okay, and then look at Cindy again, that's amazing. Go ahead and take a look over there and with my friend with a white shirt right there. What's your name, sir? John. John? Don. Don. Take a look at Don, now take a look at Cindy. Take a look at Dawn. Now go ahead and give a good laugh to, John, to Dawn. That's amazing. You see how she leaned forward a little bit? This is, these are precious gems the body's giving you. If she didn't lean forward, I would have had to ask her to lean forward. I'll move on. But do you see how she looked natural? She was smiling. She was moving by herself. If you were to take a photo of her like this, she will look decent without knowing what's going on in the background, OK? So let's move on to the next slide real quick. Here's my wife and my two children. These kids don't pose, they're, they're a disaster. I mean, I love them. <laughs> but the two are like, literally they know that daddy's a photographer and they, they think it's funny not to listen to me, okay? So I put them in a position very quickly and I knew that they were going to put themselves in a good, cute position without me doing anything. Even my wife looks good. I mean, she always looks good. All I had to do was tell my wife to push their spine up because I wanted them to have a good posture, because you cannot trust what? Never trust the spine. Look, look, it's a disaster again, OK? <laughs> no, really, it's a disaster. Go ahead and straighten up. You want this curvature to be almost exaggerated. You want the, all your organs to be lifted by your spine. This is proper pho photography posture. This is, this is how we move 24-7. This is how we get photographed. If you, if you don't have the right photographer, this is how you get photographed if you have the right photographer, okay? So anyway, it works in every direction that you want. Family, who's a family photographer here, anybody? Great. You don't have to do all these crazy rules. Put them in position, put them in position. And 85% of the posts will be given to you for free. Look at this, look at her spine. This is a fashion editorial I was doing. Take a look at that spine. Does that look like it's nice and curved? Because I told her, you're doing great, just need to adjust the spine. Chantel, thank you. Round of applause for her, she did amazing. <laughs> this photo just got published in Major Magazine and it's so funny because people have tried to replicate this photo and guess what the secret to this photo is? It's not the face, it's her spine. Her spine is lifting up her face and bringing her chin up and her neck like that. It was her spine that made it. Look at the spine, look how curved that spine is. That spine gives you that. Put that monitor, see if you can try to hold that. That's fine. Where you had it, right there, hold it right there. Look, everything moves, oh but the God, spine stays. Great. Okay? Good. Ooh, that's Look cool. at her spine. No, you cannot move the spine, and that's the result of that. As soon as my eyes are going through the camera, I'm scanning that posture. I'm scanning it, because the body is going to do its thing. If you tell someone to stand here, they're gonna automatically put their hands in this pole, in what it, whatever this is called, a rail. They're gonna do it. 
If I would have told anyone here, can you come up and chill here, you're gonna go like this, okay? And you're gonna rest one of your knees. You're not gonna stand like this. This takes more effort. Chilling like this takes less effort. This, this is what you would do. And this is a photograph. You just have to go from this to this. Does that make sense? And that's it, all right? Uh, let's take a look at the next one here. Look at the spine, guys. Every single time people think, wow, Roberto, you are the most amazing people at posing ever. You're like, yeah, right. I didn't say anything. I just kept track of the posture. So I told the guy to stand behind the girl. Yes, I did a little bit of posing, but minimal. I just told him to stand straight, to stand as straight as possible. Look at her spine. It is actually overwhelming to me how unappreciated the spine betraying you can be and, uh, and trusting the body can be. You can literally walk out of here now and tell uh, any client you have, lay down, sit down, stand up. Use, your, use, use objects like this or the speaker or the podium. Look at me. Here's the podium. Do I look okay? Because now my arm is resting on the podium. Now let's do the same pose without the podium. Does that look okay? What's wrong with this? Does this feel weird to you? Does this feel weird? How about, does that feel weird to you? What was the difference? The podium is carrying my arm's weight. So when our brain sees this photo, it's at peace. It's saying, oh, okay, the arm is resting. Look at my knee, it's bent. It's resting, okay? As soon as I go like this, the person, your brain, looking at me says, what is wrong with that guy? <laughs> like, something's wrong, does he need to go to the bathroom? I don't know, maybe that's his thing, okay? So, you just have to keep track that when objects like the floor, um, a, a railing, a speaker, a podium, a tree, a swing, whatever, if you use that to carry part of the body's weight, you are golden because the person will pose themselves and all you have to do is keep track of what? The spine, okay? So, let's move on to the next slide here. I'm gonna go a little quicker. Does that look like a good photo to you? The answer is no. What's wrong with this photo, guys? She's slouching, okay? This is a photo shoot for a commercial, commercial shoot for the jewelry and the dress. The jewelry and the dress, two different designers. So, I tried to put the jewelry in the front, the girl slouched. Why did she do that? She's a professional model. Why would she slouch? Because she has a brain, and her brain says slouch. Slouch from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. That's what happens, okay? Unless a photographer tells you to, to adjust your spine, you're not, you're not gonna, okay? How about this? So this? Here's what happens. The one on the left is what your body does not wanna do. The one on the right is what we do all day long. All day long, okay? Now let's take a look at that. Does that look better? So, she's not only with her spine arched, but she's also leaning forward. That's another major thing. Our lenses, our photographic lenses, whether you're doing video or photography, it compresses the scene. If you compress somebody, I see this all the time. I see a, a photographer and clients, and they lean them against the wall or they do whatever, but they don't lean them towards the camera. So you're not taking into account the lens compression, which makes, if you point a lens at somebody in their body, which is normally what they do, right, you're going to make this part look disproportional by like three or four percent. It looks weird. All you gotta do is fix the spine and do a two inch lean towards the camera and the compression will not be your friend. It will not be your enemy, okay? So, look at that. Now, there's a small posing mistake here that I actually did on purpose, but I'll tell you what it is. The arm, the left arm, should not be that far out when the light is coming from the left because it makes it look brighter in the face and it's too distracting. The reason why I did that is because the jewelry was on the left hand. So I didn't tell the designer anything. I just took, took the photo with a mistake in mind and I said, forget it, she's never gonna know and she never knew, okay? So that's the thing. Look at the spine. Doesn't matter what we do, the spine is, always, I just told her, sit down, relax, enjoy, have fun, lean forward, boom. Done. The next part is have a vision. When people start posing, they start guessing. They start talking like this. Can I get a volunteer real quick, please? Another one? Somebody else? Come on. Thanks for volunteering quickly because I have short presentations, pressure presentations. So, and, all right, stand right here, my friend, right on the stage. 
right there where the rail is. Could you maybe perhaps possibly, I don't know, let me think about it for a second. If you would be so kind to put your hand on the rail. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. Could you maybe possibly, if you don't mind, I don't want to anger you, but maybe switch the leg weight to the other leg? You're so kind. Could you, um, how about, um, how about maybe we, um, nah, nah, maybe turn around and lean your back against the rail. Nah, let's go on the other rail. Nah, let's go on this one. Yeah, that sounds good right there. Yeah, I'm not really feeling this, let's move on, right? So we, we begin the posing process like this. Do we agree or not really? Do you see yourselves in this position sometimes? Doesn't, doesn't that feel terrible to you? Don't you wanna know, don't you wanna just know what's up? Watch this, relax everything, man. Go, go back down the stairs, please. What's your name? Daniel. Daniel, nice to meet you. Go back down the stairs. Okay. Please sit down, I'm just kidding. Come back over here, come back over here, Daniel. Go ahead and chill by the pool there, stand all the way and just chill. Did I tell him to cross his legs? No. Did I tell him to put his hand on the rail? No. Did I tell him to put his hand in his pocket? No. The only problem is his thumb is pointed towards his penis. <laughs> no, I'm saying the, the, the body gives you 85%, remember? So you just have to keep track of the thumb. Men love pointing in that direction. <laughs> Don't know why, but it's a thing. Maybe it's to protect it, I don't know what it is. But every time you do anything, they're always like. It wasn't in your book. <laughs> Did you read my book? I have three of them. You have three of them, all right. Did you actually read them or are they collecting yeah. dust? Okay. Usually people buy my books as paperweights. <laughs> no, nobody reads them, they just buy them, you know. Um, does he look like he's ready to go for a photo? So, yeah. So now from here, I would have them turn your face this way a little bit, not so much, a little bit, come, come back this way. Now lean forward from the hips, that's it. From here, just lean forward an inch. That's it, guys, don't go any further. Boom, picture, stay right there, stay right there. Now bring your chin towards me, more this way, more this way, boom, picture. Um, I'm gonna go over here, keep yourself in that position, bring your eyes to me, boom, picture. I did not have to pose anything, he did it for me. Are you a master at posing? Just say no. <laughs> okay, thank you, man. Appreciate it. All right. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> Have a vision, guys. Um, a vision turns a, a snapshot into a photograph, and a photograph with proper posing and lighting can turn into a portrait. Let me ask you a question. Go ahead and talk because we don't have much time. What is the difference between a snapshot and a photo, uh, just a photo of a person? A, hand, a snapshot, what's the point of a snapshot? Quick. It's quick and it's to remember what, what was happening in that moment. You're not caring what it, what's going on, you just take a snapshot, right? So if you wanna remember something, you go, boom, snapshot, right? What's the difference between a snapshot and a photograph of someone? Now the, the, the photograph means that the, the person you're shooting is the main subject. Now you have a subject, right? And what is the difference between a, between a photograph and a portrait of a person? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh God, can we please give her a round of applause? Because that is funny. <laughs> Who said that? That's good. Can I use that? Thank you. It will be on the next book. What's your name? In case I remember, I'll credit you. Yeah, Roberta Valenzuela? <laughs> okay. When I started my career, I bought Canon's most expensive cameras and all I was getting was snapshots. And I couldn't, I, I, I took my camera to CPS. I, I didn't understand why my photos were so sucky. So I kept taking the cameras to, for repair. <laughs> okay? I was like, something's wrong. Um, this is a snapshot of Joe. Joe is a legendary cowboy that models for us at the Photo Creators Conference. Who has heard of the Photo Creators Conference in Tucson, Arizona in this room? Four people, five people. No, seriously, have you heard of the Photo Creators Conference? Okay. He models for us at the ranch, uh, uh, at the Photo Creators Conference, and I took a snapshot of him to make this point. Then I asked him if I could take a photo of him, just a photo, which means he's the main subject, but I didn't care about posing or lighting. I just wanted you to know he's the main subject. 
So here's the photograph of Joe. Look at the lighting, terrible. And the posing is terrible too. But then I told Joe, because I was teaching a class at the Photo Creators Conference, I wanted to do a portrait and I wanted to use posing and lighting for that portrait. I wasn't worried about what I was gonna do because the body takes care of itself. I only have to worry about one thing. What, it, what is it? The spine. So I knew that when, when I knew that he, this guy, he's the one that makes the, um, what do you call those things that you put on top of a horse, a saddle? He's the one that makes the saddles for all the horses at the ranch. So I asked him, okay, a portrait is supposed to say something about the person, right? Now people think you have to be this posing master to be, do these portraits. You don't have to be posing nothing. You don't even have to buy or read my book. It's a waste of time. Just pay attention to this and you're good, okay? Look at this. That's a photograph. Look at the portrait of Joe. That is a portrait. The saddles that he made are in the background. And the posing was so simple. I just, he was leaning for, does this have a laser? Does this have a laser? Oh, he does. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. What the heck? Um, he was standing over here in the middle of the saddles. And I noticed this piece of wood. And as soon as I noticed that piece of wood, what did you think my brain thought of? What did I just say about body parts being heavy? Rest them. See, you don't have to know anything. I, I used a piece of wood and I said, hey Joe, can you just come up and just chill here? And he just chilled. I didn't even tell him, put your hand on the wood. As soon as his brain saw the wood, his brain held, held on to it, okay? Now, I did tell him to point his face in this direction because I wanted to make it look like window light. There was no light in this at all. This was a dark room with a little, terrible little tungsten light bulb from the 1960s just hanging around. It, it was like exposed cables and everything. It was very bad. And I was just like, okay, let's just do this. So that's the only thing I did. Look at his posture. I fixed his posture and that's it. And then I took the photo with two, three lights. One for the background, one for the, one for the front overall, and one for his face, the, the, the key light on the, on the right side of his face. Here's another one of posing. Posing is incredible what it can do to somebody. Here's a normal headshot posed properly, but it's boring. Lighting is boring, posing is boring. The next, the next one is where I decide to use my posing knowledge to create more excitement in the pose, even though it's still just a headshot. So take a look at this. There's, one shoulder high, one shoulder down. That's, that's starting to be more, more active, right? I asked her to kind of bend her lip a little bit, play with her lips. Why did I do bend your lips, play with your lips? That's the movement side. Remember I said movement? So even if you tell someone, stay there you are, just kind of play with your jaw, and they start playing with their jaw, that's the movement, okay? I had a class where people said, oh, I thought movement was they have to keep getting up and down the stairs every five seconds and redoing the pose, no. Movement just means moving the eyes, moving the chin, moving the lips, moving the jaw. Anything that's movement, it's all you need to do. This is why reading my posting book would be a waste of your time because I'm giving it to you right now. Everything, okay? And then the third one, the next photo is to demonstrate the power of posing and lighting to create even a more exciting photograph. Someone, a photograph that makes you feel something. Look at this next one. Okay, that's a beautiful picture and I mean portrait, right? And this, how was this post? She was laying down on this one. I had a chest of, um, what do you call this, like a little treasure chest thingy for posing props, you know what I mean? You know those old things you buy, the, they look like little chests for treasures and stuff? Locker. What is it? A, a what? Locker. Yeah, it's like a little thing. I just said, I don't have to know posing, I just have to lay her down and her body will fix itself and then I adjusted her, her, her spine. So was I worried about telling this actress in LA to please like lay on this weird thing and be all uncomfortable? No, because I trusted the body and all I had to do was keep track of the spine. So she laid down and then I, I changed her spine to be straight and then there it is. Then I, took, then I did the lighting to make it look like that. Which one do you guys like more? This one? C can we go back one? Oh, can I do it here? Which one do you guys like more, the normal one, the more active one, or the more portrait one? That one, okay. 
Okay, I'm gonna have to uh, skip a few things here because I wanna make sure I get to the good stuff, but actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and do this, but here's the, uh, here's the have a vision, okay? You are free to have a vision now because whatever your vision is, the body will take care of itself. Look at the vision here. Here is my work, I was teaching a class here. You see those bushes? You see those bushes right there? That was enough for me to have my vision. I thought I would put the people there. So I put the people there, see there they are. Isn't that cool how they just magically appeared? Okay, and then I, I didn't know what to do. I put the, the two models there and I'm like, well, I'm screwed. Don't know what to do now. I put them on top of a chair because I wanted to get the full trees in the background, no floor. Now, as soon as I put them in on top of the chair, my brain froze, just like everyone else. And I was teaching a workshop where I'm supposed to be the expert. <laughs> so I just said, hey, I'm gonna trust the body. So here's the final photo of that. I told them, lean against each other, and I, just, I adjusted their spine. This is, this, is an, this is a very awesome result. This was published by the, for the designers. Here's another one that was done. So very simple thing that I'm trying to put in your head right now. If you have a vision, don't be scared to execute that vision because the body will take care of itself. Trust me, it will. It will give you 85%. So it will not give you everything. It is your job to study posing to get the extra 15%. But if you don't know what to do, trust the body, but do not trust the spine, okay? Here's another one. I had two guys leaning on a, in, this was taken in a hotel room like this, in the carpet, I found a mirror. I thought, okay, I'm gonna use this mirror. I put them there. I told them, look, look at her spine, totally straight. Look at his posture, totally straight. This is a cool photo. Did you think my brain visualized this entire photo before I took it? No. No one can do that. I mean, maybe you can. It's just very hard to do. What I'm trying to say is visualize where the body's gonna be positioned. On the floor, are they sitting, are they standing? And then go ahead and let the body do its thing. Okay? I'm gonna skip this one, because this one, not as important. Okay, I do wanna get to this one, though. I don't want to get to communication. This is what kills me about, this is where I really want to help photographers, okay? There is a psychology to talking to people when you're posing them. Can I get a volunteer real quick? Yeah, we have one right here, a model that we brought Oh, oh, yeah, can you come here? Wait, Teresa? Teresa? Round of applause, guys, Ter Teresa in the house. When you're working with moms, dads, high school seniors, babies, children, or models, she happens to be a professional model. At the, she's gonna be at the Canon booth tomorrow. I'll be there at four. Make sure you don't miss that. Um, here's Teresa. If I have a camera and I'm talking to her, okay, at first, I'm gonna communicate with her like I like everything she's doing, and maybe I do. That's gonna give Teresa confidence that whatever movement she's doing, it's being received properly by me. So for example, okay, there's a stand right here like this, cross your legs, and let's just move shoulders and start to move. I'm taking photos, okay, let's see. Take a picture, boom, take another one. That was, that's amazing, beautiful. Bring one arm down, amazing, good. Keep that straight, uh, good, arms back. Oh, that was really nice. From here, from here, now her and I are connecting and she feels like whatever she's doing, it's, posit it's a positive thing. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? While I am appreciating what she's doing, my brain is looking at possible posing mistakes that could be causing problems. She's a model, not a photographer. If she brings one of her hands towards the camera like this for any reason, that hand is gonna become the main focus on the, because of the lens. Does that make sense? If she brings her elbow towards the camera like that while she's posing, I cannot have that because this will become a photo of the elbow. But you don't want to tell a person, a mom, a dad, a baby, a high school senior, or a child, or a model, can you bring your elbow, like, just, oh God, don't do that, don't do that, no, 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 okay? That's not good energy, all right? So what you do is you go like this. All right, let's go ahead and bring the elbow back down, and then we'll do, we'll do it in movement, okay? So here's, I'm gonna do it again. 
Okay, so we're moving a little bit, small movements, beautiful, bring the elbow, just make the mistake naturally, bring the elbow towards me. There you go, and, and, I'll, and I'm gonna be, okay, that's super nice, look over here, beautiful, bring the elbow down, back a little bit, nice, bring your arm down, oh, that's amazing, beautiful. You see how I just kind of, I just kind of slipped it in? Now, people think that's crazy, well, it's not. You wanna have really good positive energy between you and the person you're shooting. You don't wanna have a, no, don't do this. Can you imagine if I went like this? Go ahead and let's try this again. Let's move a little bit, that's good. Cross your legs, keep moving your torso. Yeah, I don't really like that. Let's switch that. Yeah, that's not really working for me. <laughs> How does that feel to you? <laughs> do, you do you like that? No. no. Um, is, that gonna res is that gonna give you good results with moms, dads, high school seniors, family, portraits, whatever? Never. Slip it in. Slip it in, okay? So, thank you. Thank you. Guys, I'm gonna have to go quickly because I wanna get through this, but you gotta speak with energy. Don't grab your camera. Let me see, can I borrow your camera, Mandy, real quick? Of course. Don't do this, guys. And this happens a lot. That's okay, you just leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. Leave it, leave it. oh my God. Don't do this, don't do this. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I like what you're doing there, that's beautiful. Yeah, you cannot hear me, what? Oh. Maybe try to uh, put your hand on the, no, you're not, you know, you, you're, you're terrible, just get out of here. Like, you can't talk to people behind the camera. You gotta get out and you gotta talk to them. When you, when you are shooting, if the camera is in front of you, you gotta be loud, you gotta be direct, you gotta be decisive, okay? You all, it will also help you to do this thing called pre-pose instruction. Pre-pose instruction is when the model is getting her hair and makeup done, you tell her some things that you're going to tell her, and then she, she will know, okay, when Roberto tells me this, I'm gonna do that. That's pre-posing, let me show you what I mean. Here's me pre-posing this model. I'm talking about her eyes and her forehead muscles. Let's try that. Let's bring your chin up and bring your closer eye. You're gonna, it's like a sleepy look almost. So keep looking at me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to bring that bottom eyelid up. Get in there, but. What happened is every single person, when you tell them to bring their chin down and eyes up, they activate their, their muscles on their forehead. And that is a death sentence for a photograph. You don't want a, per a person looking like this, okay? So I'm telling her pre-posing, pre hey, when I tell you to do this, this, keep your forehead really relaxed. You guys wanna try it real quick? Bring your chins down, and then, and then bring your eyes up back at me. See, all of you, I can, I can tell by the light you activated your forehead. S snap out of that, try it again. Snap out of that, you guys are terrible, okay. Bring your chin down. Do not activate your forehead. Now look up with your eyes, do not activate your forehead. Does that take more work? Yeah, that's how you do it, okay? Now this is, this is pre-set posing. This is before I'm about to do a set, I tell her, hey, if I notice there are things that she's doing with her body that are not working, I don't tell her don't do this, don't do that. I do it before the set, watch this. And then you're gonna pop your head forward a little bit. It's gonna make your face more prominent. If you do this, your shoulders fight with your face. Keep, um, keep the whole, yep. And it's gonna make your neck look longer too. You can, you can go chin up, chin down, left, right. Just keep yourself in movement. Okay, a lot of magic in those words. When I say keep, keep yourself in movement, I'm just basically hiding the fact that I just told her stop doing this. Does that make sense? If she, starts, if she starts doing this, she's looking like she's slouching. So I, I'm telling her, hey, let's do this, let's do that, and you know, keep yourself in movement. But if you do this, it's, it's gonna look like you're like slouching and it's competing with your body. So she's getting an explanation. I'm never telling her, you're, you're, you're screwing up, never. I'm just telling her, let's do this. And she was like, okay, cool. There's the model, and this is Miss Yuta. And so don't worry, the key is to keep the breathing like and the movement and keep believing, strong, confident, own it, get into the music, Stepping feel in. movement. Stepping in. Okay, that was the most important part. If you're posing somebody and they're in the middle of the posing, if you give them face, uh, psychological reinforcement, like, like what I just told her, own it. Own what you're doing, like you're looking, the confidence has to be there. If you're photographing a family, say, mom, you're looking, that looks amazing. Like, you gotta give them that confidence and then, then fix the spine. Let me, let me play that one more time. Pay attention, please. So don't worry. The key is to keep the breathing and the... I said don't worry at the beginning. So don't worry, keep moving, keep moving. Don't worry, watch this. 
So don't worry. The key is to keep the breathing and the movement and keep believing, strong, confident, own it, strong. get into the music, confident. feel movement. You can, almost see her you can almost see her come out. Do you see her? And this is called conversational posing. I'm, it's actively conversing with them while you're posing them. So you're hiding the posing instructions in a conversation. Does this make sense to everybody? Is this helping you guys at all? When you go out with your cameras and you pose someone, try it. Try conversational active posing. Don't tell them, don't do this, don't do that. Give them reinforcement and then have them move and say, that looks amazing, more confident, powerful, own it, strong, beautiful, yes, graceful. And their personality will come alive because you're saying, don't worry about it, just keep moving, keep moving, okay? That's what I wanted to show you guys that's really important. Uh, this is a funny one, but uh, corrective posing. Oh, yeah. This is corrective posing followed by positive reinforcement. So the model was screwing up, and I had to find a way to tell her not to do certain things without telling her not to do certain things. So check it out. It's called corrective posing followed by positive reinforcement. So check this out. Good. Good, that was like, that was fire. That was fire too. Bad, bad. bad. Fire. Good. Really El bad. Bend the elbows just a little bit. See, there That's it is. It. Good. There's the correction. Good. Beautiful, beautiful. Good. Good. Beautiful. Nice. 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 Good. If I would have told her to keep, stop putting your arm like this, in my book, Picture Perfect Posing, I say, if you have anything that, that is a straight line, it looks like a pointer. Like if I'm telling you, um, if, I'm ask, if I'm having a conversation with, what's your name? If I'm having a conversation with Cindy about my breakfast, and then I point my arm in this direction, and I'm talking to her about my cereal this morning, she's not gonna be able to understand anything I'm saying because she's looking at my arm pointing in this direction. That happens the same in posing. If you put your finger, if you're doing this with your hand and your one finger becomes straight, now you're pointing right at your nose. What's wrong with you, right? But if your finger is nice and soft, you're cool, okay? So you have to keep in mind that if I try to correct her while she's posing, I might affect her confidence. If you mess up a person's confidence, very hard to get it back, okay? Very hard to get it back. Here's a funny video. I don't know why I'm showing you this, but just, just laugh at it. You don't have a double chin. What you do have is bad posture. So all you need to do is two steps. Bring your shoulders up, back, and down. Bring your chin slightly forward and then slightly down and look at the difference that makes. <laughs> I couldn't help myself, but I was like, okay, that's very true, and that looks terrible. But, you know, anyway. The next photo is, uh, I'm gonna skip through it quickly because I don't have time, but I, 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 when I saw this video, which I'm sure some of you have seen, uh, when I saw this video on TikTok or whatever, I thought, okay, they're, they're being funny about how this guy interacts with his clients, but one thing you're missing is that he's keeping that client active the whole time. There is an active energy in that client at all times because of what this guy is doing. Now, by no means am I saying do this because this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. I just want you to concentrate on the energy that he puts out without the ridiculous movements. Is that clear? Okay, watch this. Look at the groom and the bride, look at the energy. Guy walking towards me, holding hands, holding hands walking towards me. I don't know why he's hopping and knowing all these things. Like, I don't know why that turnaround was necessary. What? I don't know what that was for. Like, that hip. Forget about the bow. Forget about the bow. Loving it. Loving it. Brian. Loving it. I just want you to concentrate on the fact that his energy matches the energy he wanted from the client. Whereas photographers hide in their quiet little shy selves and then they expect the client to be full of energy. If you want the client to have energy, you gotta put energy too. It, it, it goes both ways, it's a two-way road. Does that make sense? 
So in posing, you gotta have, if you want the posing to look active, you must be strong and active yourself, okay? I'm not saying jump around like this, but I'm saying be strong. Uh, I'm gonna show you this photo shoot I did and how I post it, and I wanna be very truthful about how I post everything because people thought this was post to perfection, and it was actually done 90% by the clients because of trust the body, do not trust the spine. This is an actor, and this was gonna be in, the, in a cover of a magazine in Latin America, and they asked me to do an editorial story on him, and here is the photos. So I saw the chair, I, I had him sit down. That was my decision, that was my vision. Sit down was the vision. Why not standing? Because by sitting, you get another perspective on him. Here's what I'm saying, in posing, usually you have the photographer stands and the client stands, and they're both standing directly in front of each other. That's the most common type of photo, post photo people have. You have the photographer on one side, and then you have the client on the other side, and this is the interaction. The minute that angle changes, it becomes a lot more interesting to the eye. So I said, sit down, because I wanna change the perspective. So I had him sit there, there is the lighting. Look at the pose, really cool. I put a piece of furniture, whatever it was at the bottom, and he by himself, put the leg up there, put the elbow there. So this was all done mostly by him. Do you notice that spine is super straight? Okay, here's another one. I use my pro photo light to, to mimic the sun every time through a doorway. If you ever see a doorway, even if the sun is coming through, put a light there and it, it will look a lot better. So here's the light, here's the light position, and here is me, and there is the guy sitting down again, and there is me telling him what to do and how to pose and keep the spine straight and lean forward, and this is the final photo for that. Super simple. I just had to do two seconds of explanation. This is the energy I want you guys to have. Posing takes five seconds. The body will do most of it, okay? Here's another one. Here's another one. Now he's standing by the bar. Look at the lighting, how terrible that lighting is. But I'm pre-posing him. This is the pre-pose. So I'm telling him how to shake how to shake the shaker, how to stand, how to cross his legs, how to do all this, and this is the final photo for that, okay? Here, this one was the most risky, and I'm gonna show you this because this was a lesson for me. There was a couch, and I saw those, those little leaves. See those little things? What are they called? You buy them at Z Gallery? What are they called? Pampas? Okay, they're pampas, whatever, they're, whatever that is. Okay, I saw them in a little vase, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's like, I gotta use that. So I, la I laid him on the couch, and here's this actor who's pretty big, and I'm telling him to hide his face with his things. And I thought, man, I'm gonna screw this up. And I, I said, I gotta trust myself. Trust the body, trust the body. And I made a lighting mistake. So you see how the lighting is pointed directly at him? Well, if you do that, the lighting is gonna hit the pompous. Is that what they're called? Close enough. Close enough? and it's not gonna hit his face and it's gonna cause a shadow. So when I took the first photo, it was a total disaster. I was like, started sweating, you know? I was like, oh man, this is bad. And then I pointed the light towards the roof and I made the whole light bounce from the roof down and that, that created the most amazing photo, which is funny because there's a story about that, but check this out. This was the most risky photo I took. I took the risk because I knew that the body would take care of itself. So I wasn't afraid to take a chance, okay? So that photo, as ridiculous as it looks, turned out to be like, once I fixed the light and it pointed towards the ceiling, it looks like this at the end. You guys like this one? You guys like it? If you like it, say yay, and if you don't like it, say boo. Yeah. Yay, all right, all right? And the funny part about this is that this became the cover of the entire story. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, the, the magazine guy's like, yeah, this, this is gonna be the cover of the story, this is gonna be everything. It's like, that's, that's hilarious, that was the worst imaginable situation I could have done, but that's what happens. Um, let me show you a couple of other things here, because I wanna close it. Yes, lens compression. Take, take a look at this lens compression situation. In posing, the lens that you choose really affects the pose. So here's what happens when you become good at posing, here's what will happen to your brain. You grab your camera, when you put a 50 millimeter on, you know what poses look good with a 50 millimeter. When you put a, sev yeah. when you put a 70 to 200 on, and you zoom that to 200, I know what poses will look amazing at 200. 
If you put a 15 to 35 and you click it on your camera, my brain has like an entire encyclopedia of things that will look amazing with a 15 to 35. But if you don't know this, and you combine a 15 to 35 lens with a post that goes for the 70 to 200, you're gonna end up with a really stupid photo, okay? So here it is. Take a look at this girl on the, take a look at the girl on the left. Look at her arm. Looks nice and normal, right? She has her arms down, this one has her arms up. Then she lifted her arm and I didn't say anything and I took the photo. This was taken with a 200 millimeter 2.0. Look at her arm now. She looks like T-Rex, <laughs> okay? She looks like T-Rex. Now, my angle and the lens that I had wasn't the right combination for that movement. That's why you need to know these things, okay? But that is shocking. Now, here's a 15 to 35 done for a shoe commercial. This makes the shoe look bigger. That's what you want. So this distortion works because it's a, it's a photo for the shoe. But this would have worked if you're doing a shoot for Ju Jurassic Park. <laughs> but I was not, okay? All right, let me skip to, let me skip to, are we having fun with this right now, guys? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I hope you guys are learning, really picking it up. I only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna skip a few things, but you guys mind if I talk to you about the Photo Creators Conference? Because I have a coupon for you if you guys wanna go, okay? Is that cool with you guys? Or would you like me to do that after the presentation's over? Yeah. Let's do it after. Okay, I'm gonna finish with something kind of cool. I'm gonna show you two main things here. This is practice that I do. It's called the free form posing challenge. I do this, I don't know, I used to do it every week. I do it every month now, maybe every two months. It is a difficult exercise, but I'm gonna give it to you, so if you wanna try it, it will make you really sharp with your posing. If you can do free form posing, means that there is no props, there's no metal, there's nothing. You're just having the person stand in front of you and you are gonna have to move elbows and arms and legs and head and legs and, and twist. You, the photographer, does that and you take a photo. Then you take another one and you take a photo. And you take another one and you take a photo. Out of the 50 photos that you take, you're gonna go back to your hard drive and you're gonna see them all. And you're gonna study what percentage of those photos got screwed up and why. And if you actually write down why the photo looks screwed up, you are on your way to mastering posing. Does that make sense? So here's my exercise. This is the time lapse of it. So you can see every single photo that you're gonna see here, I post her. And I took a photo and then I put them all together. This is the exercise. I do this all the time. Right now, maybe once every two months. <laughs> Days been dark alone, unknowing to go, go and know. Look at her hips, legs, arms, head, neck, Walking shoulders. In the rain, finding better days, go and know. Cause you've got the sunshine, you're on a cold night, you've been on a night. But I got you by my side, sunshine, got me up. That took me a long time to be able to do. A long time. Now, out of 100 photos that I take, 98 are right on the money. But it takes practice to be able to do that. Who's going to try it? No one? Awesome. Okay, two people. Um, Okay, the last thing I wanna say is, I wanna just finish with something fun. Um, I think that when you become, uh, when your lifestyle is about practicing your photography like a pianist would practice piano and a violinist would practice violin, if we actually take photography the same way, you're gonna become quite good. And when the pressure's on, you will come through. If you keep your camera on the bags and the zipper is closed and, and it's on the closet until you have a photo shoot, you're not gonna become a great photographer, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter how many books you read. The camera is like a musical instrument. It needs to be practiced for you to perform a concert. Does that make sense, the analogy? Okay. Um, I got a call by Adobe, and Adobe wanted me, and Canon, and Adobe and Canon wanted me to do 
an exhibition shoot that was done out of camera. They wanted an out of camera exhibition shoot at Adobe Max. You guys have heard of Adobe Max, the convention? And I was like, okay, what do you want me to do? They're like, we want you to take the most spectacular photos in front of everyone out of camera, and then we're gonna print a photo large for everyone to see, everything you take. And there will be no, there will be no time. It will just be from there straight to the printer. I was like, dear Lord. Um, no, no problem. No, until I saw that the, the place they gave me was from this corner to this, and from here to here, and this is my entire shooting area. I, I only had a few pro photo lights and a little background. I was just like, this is where I'm gonna do all this crazy magic? That's right. Okay, so here's what happened. You guys wanna see it? These photos are post and lit by me out of camera, okay? Here's the first one. So you guys noticed when the model moved like this and she turned around like that? That was the movement I needed to create this photo, okay? Let's go to the next one. Do you guys like that one or no? Yay or boo? What's that? That was drag shutter, not double, but this, this, these photos I'm gonna show you are gonna get extremely complicated very soon. Watch this. Look at this one. That's out of camera, okay? Um, with just a couple of lights and nothing else. I just her face, and then I created this out of camera. You should have seen people's reactions when I was taking this out of camera. And it, my point was, you guys, have, we, we buy these machines. We, we have to respect them. They do amazing things. Look at, the, look at the next one. Here's the photo that you saw earlier. Let's look at this one now. One, two, three, go. There's the movement. One more time. Sorry. Keep I'm going. Speed up. One, two. Here's this one now. Out of camera. Now let's go to this next one. Let's try it. One, two, keep the, keep the way it is. One, two, three. A second. One, two, three. Turn it around. Camera backwards. Look, I'm shooting with my camera totally backwards now. Completely backwards. One, two, three. And that photo. Okay, pretty cool. Give me one sec. I'll show you guys in a minute. Do you guys want to see the photo or no? I'm going to now do. All right, right here we go. The second. That's out of camera. Isn't that cool? Now, because I have to go, I'm gonna quickly move on to the next one. This is the grand finale. So Adobe told me to do a grand finale in front of everyone that was the most spectacular one of them all. I was like, yeah, no pressure, thank you very much. So that background is the makeup, makeup artist scarf. I took it out of her neck and I used it as a background. And then I used every camera technique that I knew to make that look like tra translucent, uh, fluorescent. Watch this. And then chin down the, on the side. Ready? One, two, ready, go. Record me doing this for you. One, two, ready, go. Look at that shaking of the camera. And here's the final photo. Okay, go the other way. Huh? So take a step in the camera. That's it. Look at that guy holding the light. Let's go to 2.5 seconds. 2.5 second exposure. Go. Boom, camera shakes, camera shakes. Oh, that looks cool, second guys. exposure and Final photograph. Thank you. Here's the video of that happening. Final photo, guys. Because of, because you have a coupon in your shares for the Photo Creators Conference. You have them. This is three hundred dollars off. It's in May six. You might want to take a look. I'm gonna go answer questions now. If you have any questions about the conference, just talk to me outside. All right, let's hear it for Roberto one more time. Right on. Roberto will be right outside the room. He'll be. Uh, answering questions, you can meet Roberto, but stay put. If you guys are into food, we have Melanie Dunea coming up next, and she's gonna blow your mind and show you how to, an amazing journey of photographing food and all sorts of stuff. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, man. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, if you could please return to your license photography and talk about a little bit of food photography and it's going to be pretty amazing. She has a, a project called The Last Supper. I, I, that resonates. Who doesn't love The Last Supper? Melanie, are you ready? Okay, come on up. Everybody, let's give a warm welcome for Melanie Denea. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've got a clicker and a laser pointer, a script, and I'm ready to go. Um, Thank you so much for having me. I mean, I'm usually on that side of things, so to be here today is incredible in New York City. Did anybody travel here to actually, is, is anybody not from NYC? A couple people, wow, well, welcome. Um, thank you, BNH, thank you, Melissa, for having me. Um, today I'm going to share the things that I've learned so far in my career, and they are not technical, I didn't learn them in a book, not by a robot. There's things that uh, nothing a manual could have taught me, and you can't buy it in the store, so I'm very sorry, BNH. Um, what I'm here to talk about is the most essential things that you need, plus one little bit of special sauce that will make your photographs, I'm telling you, leap off the page, or I guess the screen, if you're I guess I should be more modern and say the screen. Um, but before I get started and jump into food and celebrities and all of it, um, I want you to know that my photographs are very labored over. They are planned. I take a lot of time to execute them. I, uh, everything is shot with great intention. Um, and that all comes from the very basis, which is you must have a strong foundation. If you're a plus one today and you're not into photography and you're a chef or you, whatever your field, I do believe you need to understand your craft because um, without that, you can't add the extra ingredients. How did I get mine? Well, I had so many hours as an unpaid internship. Um, I worked for amazing photographers. Richard Avedon was one of them. I mean, it would be, um, you know, I learned from him, sit down and have lunch with your subjects if you can, or set up a little area and show them your work. Then they can, you're kind of double showing off. Um, so I worked and I practiced and I practiced. And all of that showed me what I want to be and what I didn't want to be, um, which I thought was essential because remember, when I started taking pictures, I had a camera with film in it. There was no AI, no computers, no phones with filters, and again, like I said, definitely no AI. So let me introduce myself for those of you who don't know. Um, I have my fan group here, my friends who do know who I am. <laughs> But for the people that don't know who I am, my name is Melanie Dunay. Um, over the course of my career, I have photographed many, many celebrities. Um, Chloe Sevigny, John Leguizamo, most of these are commissions. Poor Sally Field in this, um, this picture, she actually, it was like 30 degrees um, in 
uh, Malibu, and somebody was standing right off site next to her with a, you know, a jacket so that they could throw it on when she started complaining. And I just said, remember, you were Gidget, weren't you? Like, didn't you do everything in a swimsuit? Um, there, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> Sorry, clicker, novice clicker. Um, Bernie Mac, this is for New York Magazine. They asked me, what can you do for our fall preview for a funny guy? And I thought, you know what, for a funny guy, let's zip up his mouth. That'll show him. These two shoots just happened this year. Um, Kevin Bacon and Minka Kelly. I uh, did have to confess to both of them that I've not, not only have I not seen Footloose, but I also never saw Friday Night Lights. I stuck this picture in for Melissa because she said you have to include Heath Ledger and talk about the day that you guys just roamed around the Chelsea Hotel and uh, he got high and you didn't. But sorry, this has got to be a uh, PG talk, doesn't it? Without actors, as well as actors, there have been choreographers, Taylor Swift, I've been lucky enough to photograph her a few times. Um, she's absolutely lovely, Kenny Chesney. Some that weren't so lovely and maybe don't behave as well as they should. <laughs> Some icons, um, writers, which is also one of my absolute favorite uh, topics. I love an author. And apropos to now, tennis players, I've actually only photographed one. One cake maker. Um, I'm lucky that my work has been published in many places. Um, it's been on a tequila bottle. It's been in Times Square on a billboard. Trust me, I went and had my photograph taken a lot in front of that. Um, book covers, TV shows, you know, they flash it. They say credit by. I've um, photographed a movie. And I've also done six of, or five of my own books. I always get that count wrong, including two books about chefs. So people often do introduce me as a food photographer, which is an interesting thing. Um, I'll take it. You introduce me, I'm good. Lots and lots of chefs over the years. Martha Stewart, that was just shot last year. Um, Rachel Ray, one of my favorites. I was just talking about her. Um, and, you know, uh, just heaps and heaps of chefs. So now that I've introduced myself, let me get on with it. Let's talk about the picture that everybody really wants to talk about, the bone. When you look at this picture, what do you see? Well, you can see a man standing there. He's naked. He's got a bone in front of him that, by the way, I had bought like 10 minutes before I got to the studio at the local butcher. He has a cigarette butt pointing, you can see, oh, I'm gonna use my laser pointer. Oh, wow. Okay, so right there, he's holding a cigarette. Did you know that? He actually, this is before retouching was in my life, he, you can see the indentation of the socks on his legs. So that makes you think, you know, this picture was just taken. He stares directly into the camera, provoking us. This man has confidence. How did I pull this photo off? Well, this shoot, just some background, was for uh, one of my two books about chefs called My Last Supper. I got this idea and a book deal to photograph 50 chefs, so it was 100 in total if you're following, um, and ask them what their last suppers would be, what they would eat, what they would drink, who they would be with, who would clean up, what would the music be? And I thought with those questions, we would sort of understand the mind of a chef. Tony had told me, my last supper is bone marrow, and that was it. And I thought to myself, bone marrow? How on earth am I gonna show bone marrow? Um, so I decided, okay, I know. I've gotta just photograph him naked, provocatively, with a bone in front of him. How am I gonna tell Tony this idea? Well, I had photographed him many times, and I thought, call him up. Tony, hey, I have an idea. Melanie, I'm good, I'm good. No, really, are you sure? Are you sure you're okay? Because this photograph is gonna be noticed. I trust you, he said. I repeat, I trust you. 
Fast forward to the day of the shoot, I always like to get to the studio two hours early or someone's home or I want to be prepared, right? So I go to the studio and I'm walking around and nothing is working. The light's too severe. The background is this gray I chose. I don't know why I chose gray. I mean, it's so random. I'm pacing around and I see the bloody wrapper that I had wrapped the bone in, the one I had just picked up and taken to the studio. And behind it was the brick wall. Ta-da! Look, see, right there. Be nimble, be flexible. Goodbye, backdrop. Let's shoot him against the brick wall. Tony texts me, I'm here, but I need some um, liquid courage. Hey, let's go next door, I say. Let's have some tequila at the local Mexican restaurant. I faked drinking. He took a few shots. Um, we joked around. He's like, how's the book going? And I said, listen, um, it's, uh, it's going. You know, like Gordon Ramsay was really tricky. I asked him to uh, smile, and this is what he did. <laughs> OK. So I was telling him about my trials and tribulations, and then I said, are you ready? And he said, I'm ready. So we went into the studio, and it was time. He changed into his sarong. Um, I definitely thought where I was going to keep my eyes, which was between his eyes and my eyes. I gave him a smile, a smile that showed trust, confidence, friendship. He took off the sarong, he looked at me, and I said, I've got you. Because of this trust, because of our exchange, I knew that we were gonna be okay. I had my back, he ha you know, we had each other's back, we trusted each other, we were in this together. So no matter where you are, if you're naked in a photo studio in New York City, or you're in Africa with an elephant or a panda, trust. Watch and trust who you're around. Because the rapport with your relationships is absolutely everything. The crooner, sorry for my messy papers. Um, so when I photographed Tony Bennett, RIP, he just passed away, um, we were, shooting at his house, which is always a little bit worrying because you come in there, you've got a photo assistant, you've got some equipment, and it just feels intrusive. I would rather just set up, and then you come and I go, ta-ta, it's time to photograph. So we removed our shoes. Always have to take off your shoes when you go to someone's house. I mean, it's kind of protocol. I scoped out a spot for my four-foot backdrop. Um, the entire studio, this was actually his painting studio, was full of memorabilia. And I suppose all of us being photographers or storytellers are snoops. So it was hard for me actually not to look at all this stuff. There was a letter from Bill Clinton. There was like something from Mother Teresa. Focus, focus. So I had three scenarios in mind. Um, I find for me, in my preparation, if I have three things I'm gonna, three ways I'm gonna photograph somebody, one of them's gotta work. It's kind of like the law of averages. So I'm picking out the backdrops, we're taking our Polaroids, and um, in walks Tony Bennett. He's got his turtleneck on, he's an hour early, and he is ready to go. Okay, Mr. Bennett, come over here, sit by the uh, window. He sits down, he's looking at me, he's like, uh-huh. He's not into it. It's not a picture for him. It's not working. So, Mr. Bennett, oh no, I skipped ahead to the next slide. Spoiler alert. Um, he jumps in front of the backdrop. We take three or four or five photos. Bang, my camera falls. Shit. He looks at me. I look at him, we look at the camera, and he says, well, I guess this shoot is over, isn't it? And he walks out. Whew. Takes me a minute to collect myself. Mr. 
what I would have liked to have said is, Mr. Bennett, I always travel with two bodies. We could have carried on the shoot, but off he was, and thank goodness, I already got the picture that I needed. And in fact, I was rushing to catch a plane to photograph Kenny Chesney in the Caribbean, so I quickly called a rental house. I said, somebody meet me at LaGuardia, actually it was JFK, with another body, here we go. The moral of that story, be prepared, technically be prepared. Don't bring one camera body because you might be in trouble. Um, I call this shot Wonder Woman. This was my first and only fashion shoot. Actually, that's not true. I did shoot a wedding dress once, which um, comes with its own set of dreadful, dreadful challenges. Um, this was for a book for a fashion designer called Carmen Mark Valvo. He asked me to take some pictures to sort of zhuzh up his book. Um, I agreed, but I also thought, um, like, what are the rules? Um, are, are the clothes meant to look a certain way? Um, like, what am I supposed to do? So we started the shoot, and as I took the pictures, the model like knew what she was doing. The way she moved was extraordinary. Um, but I didn't really, wasn't conveying the moment. And I'm like, what are the rules? Fashion photography, are the clothes meant to look good? What, what should I do? And then I thought, first of all, Melanie, stop looking at her face. It's not about her face. This is about a feeling. This is about movement. This is about a moment. So I said to my photo assistants, turn off the flash, turn off the flash. Let's just use the light that's right here. I grabbed my tripod. This was working. Wow, this worked. This is like, I, I could feel it. This picture was like powerful. Um, it was, it, it showed his clothes. Um, it reminded me, forget the rules. You don't always have to follow the rules. Be nimble. Be in the moment. Throw the stuff away. You've already got that foundation. I call this shot um, Wonder Woman, and it is a reminder to me, a constant reminder, to be nimble, to be flexible, um, and to turn that frown upside down. The balloon. Well, this one, whoo hoo, I hope you're, buckle up. Um, comedians, this is Steve Martin, are meant to be kind of depressive, don't quote me, but um, <laughs> you know, a little bit like not funny. And it's also a lot of pressure to sort of think, I'm gonna be funny, does he think I'm funny? Um, so my commission was to photograph Steve Martin. I knew a few things about him, but I, could, I, I thought I've gotta really think of some clever, clever concepts for this shoot because um, I just, uh, he, he, he's gonna be tough. So I hit the Google monster, and I Googled and Googled and Googled, and I found out that he had a passion for the banjo. He loves all things French, Francais, and he worked at Disneyland when he was a kid. Ba 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 bingo Disneyland. So I had a hook. As I explained, I always get to a photo shoot two hours early, so I was there setting up. We were listening to Bob Marley, relaxed. I had my concepts. Um, again, he comes an hour early. <laughs> What's with these guys? He, uh, he comes in and he comes straight up to me and he says, no, I don't like the music. Turn off the music. And I said, well, welcome, Mr. Martin. I'm so happy you're here. Um, here's where you're going to be setting up. By the way, you are an hour early. And then I ran, recollected myself. I thought, well, this has gotten off on a bad foot. We jumped into the shoot. I thought, come and stand on the, white back, uh, the gray background. And then I thought, <laughs> here I go. Here's a Mickey Mouse watch. You know, he, uh, get it, get it? He's like, I understand. <laughs> he put on the watch. I took a few pictures. All right, now I had something for the client. That was a relief because if this didn't, if I didn't get this shoot back on track, at least 
I had something. Because you must get what your client wants first. Let's say you're shooting a wedding. Please get a picture of the bride, like pronto. <laughs> You can go around with the buffet after, but it is about the bride. So after the watch, I thought, oh man, I've really got to like warm this dude up. How about the banjo? A shot I was literally not interested in. Um, he started strumming. Okay, I thought, well, this could maybe sell, I could sell this to him as his album cover or something. Then he said, hey, go get my hat to somebody. So somebody went and got his hat. And I thought, oh, I know a funny idea. Why don't we put the hat on the floor in the front, and then the story is like Steve Martin is a Steve, you know, a street busker. Um, I was laughing, like, ha, 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 ha. He wasn't really laughing. Back to the gray wall, Mr. Martin, and I handed him some Mickey Mouse balloons that we had gotten. Now, he looked at me hard. I thought, okay. I've been keeping the shoot moving fast. We're getting on the same wavelength. Then he started to animate. He loved the balloons. I thought, this is the guy that's like, you know, the joke, like the jerk. Like this is something I recognize. I'm in, I'm in. Now time for the kill, the shot I really wanted. Quick. I took the balloon, I gave him the tie balloon. I thought this would be the perfect cover for this magazine. We finished early. On his way out, he came up to me and he said, oh, by the way, my wife and I gave all your books as Christmas presents. Oh, I said, thank you. He left and all I kept thinking was, Bless the research. Thank goodness I researched. I didn't try to be clever. I didn't try to be funny. Thanks to my research, I got the shot. Research is essential on an island, except we're not really on the island. Um, it is very rude to pick favorite subjects, but I'm going to do it. I loved Sir Ian McKellen. He was delightful, charming, interesting. He walked in, he was interested. Um, we were supposed to shoot in this place in Times Square. It's a real theater hangout. It's called Sardi's, the restaurant where actors are. And you know they go after the, the theater. Um, it's okay. It's an interesting place. It was chilly outside. I thought, okay, he has 20 minutes for this photo shoot. Um, I'll bring a backdrop, but he's doing a play in New York. He's all been photographed like on Daily Mail and in the New York Post on the streets of New York. So I got, I went early and I walked around Times Square. It was a chilly day and I found this perfect sort of island in the middle. And I thought, if I'm worth my metal and my fettle, I'm going to get Sir Ian McKellen out here today. So he walks in with a pep in his step. He is super charming. As you know, we've already been there for two hours. We have our three setups, um, you know, organized. Um, he definitely was very pleased by my male assistants. He was having a good um, time checking them out. He, we quickly went through the shots. Mr. K you know, sit in front of your picture at Sardi's, please. Um, how about in front of the backdrop? Cup of tea, your English, wink, wink, nod, nod. How about a serious face? Because you are a very, very famous, famous actor. I started to chat with the PR agent. She was coming on board. Um, I also knew that without her on my side and without him on my side, we weren't getting outside. Lots of sides there. Um, so I took her and I said, listen, there's this one shot. We've only been shooting for 12 minutes. I technically have eight more. Do you think, will you come with me on this idea? I promise you it will work. Okay, Melanie, sure. Out we went. I said, Mr. McKellen, will you come with me outside? He said, I would love to. He grabbed his leather jacket. We ran out into the middle of Times Square and he lit up a cigarette. He was leaning on that kind of you know, divider, people were wandering by saying, hi, Magneto, 
from the X-Men. I didn't, I hadn't seen the movie, I hadn't seen that movie either. It's on my list next to Footloose. Um, so we were standing on this island. The, the, my assistant was holding a light. He was resting. It was, it felt so right. And it would not have happened without the collaboration. Because I spoke very nicely to the PR person, I got her on my side, again, back to the bone. It's the trust, it's the exchange. It's not about me taking the photos, it's about all of the people together in this moment, right? So we've talked about respect and rapport. We've talked about being prepared. We've talked about being nimble. Um, doing your research, collaborating. But what is the glue that binds this all together? It's the me. It's what's within you. Now please put down your phones, not that you can see. Um, you can't Google this. There are no data points. I can't prove this. But I can tell you that inside you, you know what interests you. You know what you're passionate about. Is it pandas? Is it soccer? Is it food? What is it that you are interested in? Go home, please. Take a piece of paper and write it down. Because that is where your unique lens will come through. You cannot learn that in a manual. You know, it, it is what will make your work truly the exception. What's your passion? Um, for me, um, I have, as you heard earlier, played with my food. I love the intersection of art and food. So what did I do? I went out, I bought some pizzas, some Negronis, and I played with the food. I didn't have a photo assistant, I didn't have a light. I got a pizza and I stood there and I thought, this brings me joy. This interests me. I love this. I try to spend a lot of my, 30% of my um, time giving back with my photography because I, I definitely cannot pay $10,000 for a charity table. So this project was for Operation Smile and I went to eight countries on missions with them to help amplify their voices about this quick, quick surgery that can repair a cleft lip and palate and send these kids on to an incredible, incredible future. That interested me. That didn't feel like work. That felt like within me, all I wanted to do was share their stories. So we all went through, you know, the pandemic. Um, I had a huge, my first really big exhibition, which was gonna be in my hometown of Chicago, home, long time ago home. My dad was gonna come, and then of course, the pandemic. We were all, what, at a standstill. Didn't know what to do. I'm an extrovert. I mean, I looked at my fiance and I was like, whoa, this is gonna be a test. Um, so what did I do? I put my hazmat suit on and I went out. I went and showed the people on Instagram and I documented what I saw in a city that I am passionate about. I love New York City. I'm so grateful to be in New York City. I went on the subway, obviously, it was empty. I walked across the Brooklyn Bridge, both for my steps, and you know I needed to get those 10,000 steps. Um, I visited my favorite restaurants just to see what kind of state they were left in. Because I had just been to the Odeon restaurant and now it had a padlock in front of it. I went over to Bouvet, or actually that's Edwards. It looks like they just, they just left. I mean, they just left. I couldn't believe what I saw in front of me. Grand Central Station, empty. I picked up my camera and I took pictures because within me, I knew that this is how I needed to respond because I was interested, I was passionate, I was feeling it. I heard these huge noises outside. Black lives matter, black lives matter. There was a social justice movement happening right out there. What did I do? Picked up my camera. Because it wasn't time to stop. 
It was time to hit the streets, show what was going on, show what I saw, what I felt. I felt the rage. I felt the um, pain. And to me, it's not different than pizza because a story is a story and it's how I look at it. It's not an imitated story. It's a story that I see. So then there was looting. They were burning out the cars at Bloomingdale's. In fact, uh, I was just at Bloomingdale's yesterday and it, it didn't look like that, did it, Ava? <laughs> I knew that I would roar on. So this has been my life in pictures so far. I'm going to correct the title, which was actually called My Life in Pictures, because I feel like I am just getting started. And I have so many more stories to share, just like you do, because they live within us. And we owe it to our subjects, to the people that we photograph, and to ourselves. Because if we don't take the pictures, who will? So thank you so much for coming. Um, so I will be signing books and I am taking questions and I actually don't have any idea what time it is. Oh, I'm early, so please ask some questions. I might, I don't wanna get in trouble. Anybody have a question? I'm early. You are done, it's all good. You know, you've, you've got a ton of books to share. I do have books to so sign. We have a, a book signing area across it. We wanna take uh, some questions over there and also do some, uh, get, the, get the book thing. Also, I wanna make an apology. I sort of thought you were gonna talk a little bit more about food photography than portraiture. So that, that's my bad, everybody. I apologize on that one. No bad. But, uh, amazing stuff in the bone was, that was a. The bone, well that's bone, food. Yeah. A little <laughs> leftover food. <laughs> So okay, did, so... Um, any questions? Oh, yeah, we, you get 15 minutes for questions. Yeah. Oh, if, yay! Please. And if you could repeat their question. I'm not sure if you saw it, but you saw the way you saw it, you saw the Uh-huh. These are really 15 minutes for... For you, but <laughs> I think other people might be a little bored. Um, I, it was just talking about how I believe that it is um, so important to have a foundation, understand your camera, understand what you want. Um, and I sort of proved it with some pictures I had taken in tough situations I was in. Um, so really I was trying to just emphasize um, how important a foundation is. Know your craft. Does that answer, I hope? Yes. What year did I switch to digital and was the um, bone picture on film or digital? I switched to digital, I was the last one hanging <laughs> for sure. In fact, my last supper one was photographed uh, in, ooh, yeah, 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 2003. One of those pictures is on digital. Um, and uh, so none of those are retouched, none of those are composites. I mean, I always try to shoot what I see. Um, what was the second part? Oh, the bone, yeah, that was shot on film. So um, they're probably better pictures, but they're in the archives in Long Island City, so. Um. That's a great question. It is if you um, bring, what lighting kit do you bring in case suddenly you're shooting inside and you thought you were shooting outside? Boy, that's happened. Um, so I always customize the, I don't own my own lighting, I rent it. So, and uh, from B&H, <laughs> I buy, I've been shopping there for 20 years, by the way. Um, I try to think of worst case scenario. I will, and I also don't bring much because I always think, well, there's light. I mean, the sun shines. So, for example, I was photographing a governor who used to be a wrestler called Jesse Ventura in Wisconsin, and my lights didn't turn up. And it was the cover of Newsweek. 
So I got, I said, hey, do you guys have photocopy paper here at the Capitol? And I taped together a bunch of paper and I took him outside and I balanced the paper and I used that light. So I will bring very basic um, one or two heads, one or two heads, battery if I, I don't, if there's not gonna be um, any outlets, if I haven't had a chance to check, maybe one battery, one plug-in, um, two heads, probably minimum, but sometimes I just wing it and don't bring anything, which is definitely a reason that some of this hair is gray. <laughs> you had a question, sir, yes. Oh, my present day kit. Well, I use, I'm a Canon, uh, I buy all my Canons. I wish I didn't have to. Um, I use the, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I use the Mark II um, and I have two bodies. I have a 28 to 70 lens. I use the 100 for portraits. Uh, I have the super long stabilizer. I never use it, it's so heavy. Um, I take two laptops with me now because I get nervous about one of them not working. As I said at the beginning, be prepared. Um, I have a very, very light tripod. In my litmus test is, can you pick it up with your index finger? Do you always shoot raw? Yes, always raw, yeah. And I, I you know, I, I, the switch to digital was tough because I was ha having what, what I call the digital twitch, where you take the picture and then you look, you take the picture and look. And what I loved about film was, there was the unknown, right? You were like, boy, I better stay until the end of this because what if he gets shot or something? Like, now you sort of think, oh, I have the picture. I'm done. And you know, the good stuff comes later. So, um, yes, sure, thanks for coming. Hi, great job today. Thank you. Um, so, in the food delivery and the product experience class yesterday, so I can see the art and how it is being applied to food. So, who was the shot that was the best for you to get? Like, all the different stuff that you had to do? Mm, good question. So, uh, it's what do I give the client, right? So, so the client wanted a cover and a double page spread and an inside, and I um, was like, okay, here we'll go back to those pictures. Um, and so I knew I needed a clean backdrop for a cover because they have to put picture, you know, lines, text all over. So I planned that no matter what, we had this. If he walked out because he was kind of being grumpy, um, I knew I got it. I have probably 30 pictures of that, of him going like this, looking in, looking out. Um, so I, I knew I was covered. Then I thought, well, if they're not gonna put something on the cover, they ended up using the balloon actually. But I thought, okay, well, you know, now some inside stuff, he doesn't have to be looking at the camera. So again, back to my two or three setups, just so they feel like you're moving, you know, they're not, you're not, laboring over something. I've already tested so much, so I don't need to test on him. The banjo I knew he liked, I, that picture, you're the first people to see that. Because um, <laughs> why would you care? Um, and then Disney, the balloon, and then I saw like, this was the Steve Martin that I've seen in the movies, and that's what I wanted. I didn't want him at home reading Proust. They wanted him to be like, cool, oh, I'm a comedian. And boy, did he deliver. Sure, thanks for coming. Yes, Ava. Oh boy, I think everyone in this room has. Have I ever had a creative block? Oh man, yes. Um, and what do you do about it? Vodka tonics. <laughs> Florence, are you here? <laughs> um, Yes, oh yes. Well, that goes back to what I really wanted to say here about your special sauce and about what's inside you. That's part of it, right? It's frustrating because it's meant to be frustrating. It's meant to be a block. You have to sit with it and try and push and be nimble. I mean, back to, you know, a, there's a lot of creative block in the moment. Um, if you go back to the, I think it was Wonder Woman, I don't know where it is, yeah. This was a in real life creative block because I didn't sort of imagine when I, I was all prepared, I didn't imagine that that wouldn't do it for me. That I didn't, I thought that would be good enough. It's, it's a fine picture, but it's not this picture. 
and I pushed, and I sat, and I thought, I didn't sit like down, but <laughs> I thought, okay, 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 what, what is this about? It's a feeling, it's a movement, and I tried to just simplify it, get back to that thing, because that's what's within you, your special sauce. You've got your own unique lens, your own je ne sais quoi. You and I can stand right next to each other and photograph the same thing, and it's gonna be different. So, and gin and tonic. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, yes, all the way from Chicago, just for this. Well, you know, that's a complaint that I get, is that um, actually, I thought you were gonna talk about this, but you were just gonna talk about this. I have such varied work, and there isn't one lane. So um, I like everything I'm working on. Um, and sometimes I'm frustrated because I'm blocked, but I know that if I start something, I always finish it because there's a reason that I've started it. So it's as interesting to me to photograph some french fries on the floor as it is to photograph a woman in a fashion dress. Um, I love what I do, and we're so lucky with what we do. And how about, there are 30,000 people here. So, I mean, long live photography. <laughs> Thank you, thanks for coming. Okay, everyone, if, uh, we're going to be at, uh, take a little break at 2 o'clock. We're going to have Brian Scarry come, Oceans Matter. Uh, Brian Scarry, National Geographic photographer. It's going to be pretty amazing. So make sure you're back here in 20 minutes, or you can visit another stage if you wanted to, but I think the party's going to be here. But thank you so much. We're going to roll some commercials. my new EOS R50. I am a content creator and vlogger. I love expressing myself and my experiences online. The first time I picked up the EOS R50, I noticed immediately how light it was. Not only that, when I turned on the camera and saw the footage that it was capturing, my mind was blown. How can the quality be so good while it's this light in my hand? I love that anyone can express themselves with the easy to use EOS R50. Introducing the new Paybu credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your Paybu credit card. 
So you want to save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The B&H PayBoo card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over 6 or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new PayBoo card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either PayBoo savings or special financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in-store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved PayBoo card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new PayBoo card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today. Alpha. my new EOS R50. I am a content creator and vlogger. I love expressing myself and my experiences online. The first time I picked up the EOS R50, I noticed immediately how light it was. Not only that, when I turned on the camera and saw the footage that it was capturing, my mind was blown. How can the quality be so good while it's this light in my hand? I love that anyone can express themselves with the easy to use EOS R50. Introducing the new PayBoo credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your PayBoo credit card. So you want to save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. 
the B&H PayBu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over six or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new PayBu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either PayBu savings or special financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved PayBu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new PayBu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today. Alpha. love my new EOS R50. I am a content creator and vlogger. I love expressing myself and my experiences online. The first time I picked up the EOS R50, I noticed immediately how light it was. Not only that, when I turned on the camera and saw the footage that it was capturing, my mind was blown. How can the quality be so good while it's this light in my hand? I love that anyone can express themselves with the easy to use EOS R50. Introducing the new PayBu credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your PayBu credit card. So you wanna save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The B&H PayBu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over six or 12 months. It's easy. 
Use your new Paybu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either Paybu savings or special financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved Paybu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new Paybu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today. Alpha. Love my new EOS R50. I am a content creator and vlogger. I love expressing myself and my experiences online. The first time I picked up the EOS R50, I noticed immediately how light it was. Not only that, when I turned on the camera and saw the footage that it was capturing, my mind was blown. How can the quality be so good while it's this light in my hand? I love that anyone can express themselves with the easy to use EOS R50.
Hey, everyone. Well, we're back. Right on. We're going to start up in a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, did anyone do the photo walks? Did anyone jump on a photo walk? Yeah? How was it? It was good. It was cool. OK. Those photo walks, we, they just kept coming in. We were like, we got to stop. We got too many photo walks going on. <laughs> so good to see you guys had some fun on some photo walks. So we have a couple of different big shows that we do that are B&H branded. One is Optic, the Outdoor Photography Travel Imaging Conference, which is, uh, goes on usually in June. And last year, we actually brought it across the country to Monterey, California. That was amazing. Uh, the grandson and great-grandson of Edward Weston cooked a spaghetti dinner for myself and the B&H team in the house on Wildcat Hill. That was pretty incredible. Uh, then we, we came back from Monterey, and we did a, a big one a couple months ago. Was anyone here for Depth of Field, DOF? That was in uh, late February. Yeah, we got a couple of hands here. Okay. So Depth of Field is about, like, we do different programs. We have Optic, which is about travel photography, leisure photography, wildlife, having fun with your cameras. But Depth of Field is more for the professionals. It's tips and tricks and inspiration to help you actually make money in photography. Does anyone like to make money in photography? Do you like to make pictures more than money, or do you like money more than pictures? Okay, let's hear it for money. Money? Pictures? Okay, so I hear a little bit more photography than the money part, but we're going to show you an amazing speaker, Flo Nagala. We brought her in for the first time to be an H family of our conferences at Depth of Field this year, and she really blew us away. She was on one of the smaller stages, and when we were kind of filling out everything out for this conference, I was like, God, we got to get someone in on fashion. And I was like, I know, just the person, straight in from the Met, straight in from our Depth of Field program, Flo Nagala. And she's going to show you how to hustle and flow with Flo Nagala. Flo, are you ready? All right. Come on up here. Come on, let's bring it up for Flo. Come on. Thank you, Flo. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for that awesome intro. Um, yeah, it's so crazy to be on this stage again. Like, I remember back in February, it was super surreal. And this is still really surreal, mainly because, you know, I'm a New York City kid through and through, grew up in Harlem, you know, graduated from City College, used to take the mega bus, like, right around here to go to, um, you know, out of state and stuff. So to just be on this stage at the Javits Center, which obviously is an iconic um, venue, means a lot. So thank you to B&H for having me again. And thank you all for coming to this talk. I like to keep things very, like, punny. Dad jokes are my vibe. Like, I love, you know, just keeping things light. And I tried to make something that felt um, reflective of my own take as a fashion photographer, and when they first reached out to me about this, I was a little wary at first, you know, imposter syndrome and stuff. I'm like, well, technically, I consider myself more photojournalism, portraiture, um, but obviously, with the really awesome assignment last year of working with the Met, um, and even before that, different versions of fashion photography that I've done, I kind of, as I, as I made this presentation, realized more and more uh, of how I wanted to approach my own um, kind of perspective and maybe empower those of you who maybe don't necessarily think you want to be a fashion photographer, but like kind of want another take or another perspective from, sorry, another perspective from someone else's experience. So we can, um, oh. <laughs> yes, okay, so we can start with my title slide. So um, this is an amazing, um, outfit, first and foremost. And again, kind of like what I was just saying with this sort of mesh of fashion photography and also my own style of photography. Um, I wanted to start with this picture from 2021. This is a Victoria's Secret model. Um, and she was getting ready to go to the Met. They had a little gathering um, basically in the lobby taking photos. Um, and so yeah, this is how to hustle and flow with fashion photography with Flo and Gala. <laughs> Let's go. OK, so I always like to start off with like my own definitions of things. I try and not look them up and just think about like what comes to mind when I think about certain words. So for me, with hustle, I just thought about like you know moving quickly, moving you know at a quick pace, obviously to acquire money methodically, strategically, that's another way of hustling. Um, and then on the contrast, flow, um, short for Florence, my name. 
and then also meaning to move with ease. Or if you think about water, you know, obviously it's like a kind of continuous stream or a flow of water. I like both of these words because you hear them kind of, you know, pop culturally put together, whether or not it's the movie or just like, um, you know, the phrase hustle and flow. I'm not sure exactly where it came from at first, but they kind of do mean opposite things and obviously can work together at the same time. And I feel like that kind of brings me into my first uh, tangent, which is how I got my first fashion photography gig. Um, I'll keep this kind of short, but I always like to start with a little bit of a backstory. Um, in 2016, I was a junior at City College. I took this photo of someone during Fashion Week, which is starting tomorrow officially. And I, the person that put it up online, I got a DM a few days later from a friend of hers saying like, hey, I saw this photo you took of my friend Amy, and uh, my name is Sophie Zinga. I'm a designer from Senegal. And literally, she asked me to go to Senegal. So I'm 21, and I'm like, hey, mom, like, I'm going on a flight. And she's like, no, you're not. Like, where are you going? We, <laughs> we ended up you know, on Skype and having to make sure this was a real person and nothing dangerous, obviously. Um, but you know, we've all been there when you get that first gig or that first thing that really excites you. So this was really what it was for me. Um, and ironically, my work now kind of has veered a little bit more from the kind of aesthetic here. So like, um, you'll see kind of where I still show my own, um, I don't know, visual eye that feels like this, but this is from like seven years ago. So still one of my favorite bodies of work ever. Uh, the models didn't speak as much English. I don't speak as much French. Um, so it was also a really interesting language barrier, but just the hustle of, you know, Getting on a flight, you know, I had no lighting assistant. Obviously, like I was just like in Dakar, Senegal, running around. So that was a little bit of the hustle energy that I thought of, and why I wanted to put it in here. And then the flow, obviously, you know, in the pictures, in the water behind them, like just the setting. I just felt like the synergy of the day was really beautiful. So that's like kind of where the hustle and flow term first took me as far as my photo career. And then before that, this is sort of what I was doing um, in my apartment. So I've always been really into self-portraits. I think, I don't know if anyone here does it uh, of themselves, but I think it's really a great way to learn about your camera, learn about just the lighting you like, the editing, and so on and so forth. And so these images um, on the far on the far left, those two were commissioned by like a magazine after they saw photos um, that I would post on my Tumblr. Um, I used to post a lot of photos on my Facebook. And so on the far right, it's a portrait from 2015. Um, I'm from West Africa, so the fabrics I'm wearing are my mom's. And a lot of people think that the far right photo was photoshopped, but that's actually just a garment that um, African women will tie around their waist. And again, just kind of going back to the backstory of, you know, before the Met, obviously, before kind of how my career is formally known as now, these were sort of the ways that I was thinking about fashion photography or the ways that I was implementing fashion into my own photography. So I just wanted to acknowledge this young, less jaded girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> So here we are now. This is um, a bit more of like what you guys are really here for. So basically, I put a few slides together. I shared brief tips and try to keep it really straightforward. I know you guys are immersed in a lot of amazing information and education today. Um, and so I'll leave a few minutes for questions at the end. But I just kind of put my photos that I thought were related to the tips together. And so we'll kind of go step by step. So first hustle tip. You're never really finished at a location. There are infinite angles and perspectives. Practice minimizing location moves and maximizing perspective views. So we've all been there where it's like, you know, maybe we had a, a plan for what the run of show would be. Maybe we thought, you know, we would do three locations and 50 outfits and this and that, and whether that's just shooting by ourselves or with a crew and so on and so forth. And when you think about hustle, right, going back to those first slides I showed of just like moving quickly and keeping things moving, I found, I, I found that um, one of the easiest places to start is just minimizing how much you move around. So if I stood right here and like took a photo this way, took a photo this way, took, you know, there's just, to me, right, an infinite, oh, I hope this is still working, but there's an infinite 
amount of actual perspectives or angles that I could shoot in just this one spot, right? Not to talk if I sat next to you or if I sat back there with you. So when working maybe on a timeline or trying to minimize like the kind of logistics of moving around, I thought these were a good example of two pictures where it's like obviously you see, you know, the close-up shot, she's against that background, she's against the leaves, and then on the right you see a completely different image um, which is in the same environment. And that automatically, to me, at least in fashion photography, feels like different things, right? On the left, you're seeing more of a highlight of the details of this beautiful bag, the details of this beautiful jacket, the nails. Um, it's a bit more of like a beauty kind of editorial shot, whereas on the right, you zoom out, you see a bit more of like the environment, a bit more of the outfit and the styling. Next, again, the same shoot, and then if we just ignore all that stuff on the left for a second, um, kind of just echoing that sentiment before of the location. So this was um, taken like upstate somewhere, and um, the client decided that she wanted to work in like this kind of house, like vintage castle vibe. But even if you just looked at the photos, I picked these because I think that, again, a lot of them feel like they could just be, you know, like sitting on a ledge or sitting on the ground. You it doesn't really feel to me like many big moves or anything, but you can still see the versatility and the usage of the bag in different ways. And so that kind of leads me into my next little tip. Um, on the left, you'll see I put down telling different stories or tell different stories with the same products or subjects by animating the inanimate, right, which you see on like that far right. I really love this picture because obviously it's a statue, but just that juxtaposition um, I think is so quirky. Um, and gives more personality to the overall gallery, the overall shoot, you know, like you have one model, but then this, this is something that the client could decide to use in a different way, cropped in or zoomed out. Even down here as well, kind of deciding to crop her um, upper, like her head and her shoulders out and just show the bag and its functionality. I love this picture so much. Um, a lot of these are also a mix of medium format and digital. I'm primarily a digital shooter, but for this, I decided to rent a medium format camera because once I saw the location, the greens, the red of the bag, I just thought it would kind of read really beautifully. Um, so yeah, I mentioned the excess, oh, sorry, I mentioned the personality point, and then next I put, oh yeah, sometimes doing the opposite of first, oh, I meant what comes first, can help shake things up. So for me, my photos tend to be a bit uh, stoic, a bit still. I kind of like people to just give me like straightforward looks or, um, sometimes I'll tell people maybe to laugh if it's a group or if it's an event to kind of get that casual, candid moment. But I think if you're trying to find ways to hustle and flow with fashion photography or switch things up, while I was putting this together, I thought, you know, why not just do the exact opposite of what maybe comes most naturally? As photographers, there's a bit of muscle memory here, right? Where like, you know, you know what you like or maybe you know how you shoot or maybe you're used to um, framing things a certain way, which I know I can get in the habit of, especially for a lot of us who've been doing this for years and years. And it's important to kind of keep our portfolios obviously versatile and add variety. So a, a tip I thought about that I also um, try and practice is, you know, if I'm used to having someone just stand with the bag, maybe just something completely opposite, maybe like laying down, maybe something that's jumping, maybe just something completely unconventional from what I like, but I think that helps us push ourselves into kind of more unfamiliar territory and who knows, evolving our eye and what, we're, what we may be into. Um, I kind of made this point before about infinite shots being available in kind of one setting. Um, and I wanted to show this picture, one, because you see obviously this beautiful dress um, on this young woman. Um, this is actually Shawnee O'Neill, who, it, oh sorry, Shawnee Henderson is her new name. Um, but I got to photograph her wedding. Um, she's a love and hip hop star. Um, and this wasn't a fashion photography shoot per se. Obviously, I just mentioned it was a wedding. Um, but I love that you can always kind of find ways and moments to create fashion images if you are, again, like not approaching things maybe so standard or maybe so obviously. One tip for that is never just sticking to eye level. So in this situation, right, you wouldn't be able to tell that behind her were like her kids, her mom, her dad, her aunts, her uncles, like, you know, a bunch of wedding guests. Um, and so what you see is me kind of cropping down, one to kind of just, I think the lighting on her face, you can kind of see on the, on the, on the 
front of her face is, is really pretty there. I was probably trying to get some really nice lighting and get them out the way. But it's really amazing to me how many different kinds of images you can get when you just kind of change your perspective. And especially when I have you know, situations where it's, again, an event or like something that's not technically a fashion photography shoot, but I can still get like a strong fashion moment or a strong fashion portrait out. Just kind of changing your perspective um, not only allows you to get different kinds of photos, but get rid of, you know, background characters or, you know, extra details that you wouldn't need. Obviously, the sky is one, the ground is one. Um, and yeah, it just depends on the setting, but I love this photo. Um, it's a BTS photo that another photographer took while I was taking this. Okay. Let fashion bring, oh, I should, I should pause actually. Any questions or comments? I can't actually see you guys, but. <laughs> okay. Um, let fashion bring life to, to the background. So um, again, like kind of putting this together, I enjoyed coming up with these prompts and these uh, kind of small takeaways that I thought I could put together with the pictures. Um, on the left here, you'll see a BTS, well, it's not a BTS image, but it was an image um, during a fashion show of a designer named Kirby Jean Raymond um, with Pierre Moss. And he held this really amazing show at um, Madam C.J. Walker's old mansion. She was, uh, actually, everyone should know who she is, but she, I'm sorry, he um, was the first African-American to show during Couture Week. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone who knows that fact, but I'm pretty sure um, that's the official title. And so he did this kind of like creative direction that was inspired by African-American inventions. So um, chess was one of the um, inventions. And so you'll see there's like a bishop and a pawn and like these different um, actual chess pieces coming out of this uh, young lady's outfit. But I think for me, what was interesting in putting this in the slide Obviously, it's a fashion moment, but with the white background being so plain and not as busy as, you know, the actual place where we were, which was this house and this, like, beautiful venue, I felt like the simplicity and the cleanliness, you know, this is kind of maybe straightforward or obvious to you guys, but as a reminder, it allows the fashion to really, you know, stand out and to pop and be the focus. On the right side, you'll see the same kind of situation. Um, this is a rapper named Tierra Wack. She's a musician from Philly. And she did a really great kind of collaboration where her fans got to design um, outfits that were like inspired by Adobe or in collaboration with Adobe. And so she wore these really unique and creative outfits. And um, it's, it's really fun to, one, work with talent who has very high energy. Um, this photo seems very still, but you know, we had a trampoline on set. I had her with like these oversized like pencils and kind of like props to just hit the design point home. But um, it's interesting that of the selects, this was one of the ones that made it in because even though, you know, you can't see, for example, her shoes, which were like fully creatures, or you can't see some of like the ruffles, you know, if she was standing up, it just being, you know, kind of poised, simple, minimal, um, the background being really plain, right, allows you to really focus on the fashion, focus on the eyes, focus on the hair, even her face, the smirk on there. Um, and then if you're paying attention and looking at her eyes, you can see like some of these, um, sorry, if you're paying attention and looking at her shoes, you can see some of these like eye kind of creepy additions there. So there's kind of like fashion bringing, sorry, yes, fashion bring, bringing a plain background to life in white. Here's an example in black. Um, it kind of reads a little darker on that screen, but um, you can kind of see a little bit more of the drapes on my screen. The point still being, you know, whether it's a white background, as you see here, or a black background, and obviously this model, her name's Ad Ad Akesh. Um, I think I might pronounce that wrong, but she's a um, very big model, and her complexion clearly catching the flash, um, the moisturization on her skin, just created this really beautiful gloss and glow that in editing, I just felt like the black and white was stronger. Um, and then the background also being black, I thought with the contrast and some of the shapes, it really allowed like this plain, back this plain black background um, to just, you know, pl 
play its role, and the fashion, um, the earring, which has a whole moment up there, the hair, and then me asking her to kind of turn to the side. I just felt like it was all highlighted because the background was, you know, kept simple. Um, I did another slide with no text, just to kind of show in my head, you know, where it goes from obviously, obviously just like a PowerPoint presentation to like, you know, a potential campaign or a potential uh, banner on a website or something like that. And this was, you know, behind stage at a behind the stage at a fashion week show. I really like this picture. I'm curious if you guys are into this or like this vibe more, like the colors or the more noir. Maybe by a show of hands, who's into this guy? The colors, the white. Okay. And then who's maybe more into this? Oh wow. <laughs> okay. Go for them. Yeah. Yeah. Can someone, oh, I, I, I'm really like um, curious, can someone maybe share like what in your, oh hey, can someone share maybe what in their head they see? I think I might have said the same thing, but just to get another opinion, like why, why did you raise your hand for this one, if you raise your hand? What is it about this picture? Is it the black and white, the gloss, the mood? That's a good word. The negative space, yeah, yeah. Intriguing, the reflection. It's not what? And then the highlights, that's a, a good thing someone said to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting how like this is technically like a proper image and this might to some be too dark or like, you know, but in fashion I love that the whole point is aesthetic and mood and energy and like you get to decide, you know, what, or your client gets to decide like what they want to evoke. Um, I talked about this in February, but editing is something that I'm really big on, and I feel like one of the things I find with photography is like a lot of us will take really great photos and maybe not make the right selects, or a lot of us may, I don't know, take really great edited shots or like have really good editing, um, but maybe the photos are not as strong. And I, I, I keep trying to find a way to mesh it together and explain my own thinking and my own philosophy. I'm around it um, because it's very intuitive, right? Like we all kind of just shoot how we shoot or edit how we edit. But then at the same time, we come to places like this to learn and to become better photographers. So I always like to just hear other people's opinions. Um, so I'm not just seeing it through my eyes. Um, okay, let fashion bring life to the background. So um, some of you may know my work uh, through, I don't know, coming to B&H before. Uh, but I am a celebrity photographer, technically, and a music photographer. My start was um, having the privilege of being a personal photographer for Cardi B on sets or music videos for about six years or so. And um, this photo was from like her initial Reebok deal days. So what was really cool was because of the BTS I took being used as stills, I got the opportunity to come on set for um, not just a music video, but an actual like advertising campaign she did. So this was like 2018, 2019. Um, and even though the outfit maybe like to some is more casual, obviously like, you know, we can all acknowledge that it's still fashion forward, right? Like it's styled. She looks very like dressed down, but um, the hair, the, um, the necklaces and like the belts, I felt like it was a cool addition to this presentation. And on the left, I have down here, with styling and setting, don't just do what looks good, be unafraid to place unconventional looks in unconventional backgrounds. So um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm the kind of photographer who likes to juxtapose things a lot. So I'll be like, oh, you know, let's put this person in a dress next to like, uh, like a laundry machine, or let's put them in the corner, just like eating an icy. Like I just had a shoot last week that was like, in Harlem, but like uh, I decided to make the, the sorry, I kind of talk really fast. In Harlem was where the shoot was, but I decided to make the girls' outfits very um, kind of dainty and just sort of like show this juxtaposition of like the brownstone and the corners and the block, but also um, something that maybe felt a little more editorial, a little more sophisticated. So with the point I'm making about 
the unconventional looks and unconventional backgrounds. I think that that can be a good kind of hustle tip and trick with photography where, you know, maybe you feel like you need to have a studio, right? Maybe some of you feel like, you know, you need to have a whole set and everything. A lot of the work I started off doing, and I'm sure a lot of you maybe also started off doing, just comes from working with your resources, right? Working with what you got. So in this situation, um, this background looks like a very kind of old school retro hair salon. Um, and even though this was, you know, not my local hair salon, I'm sure, like, if I walked around my neighborhood, I could find something that felt, you know, just maybe mundane or chill to use as a backdrop or a background. And in this situation with Cardi's, like, hair and the jewelry and everything kind of being a little more fancy, I, I would say, for, not fancy, but a little more distinct um, than the background, I thought that it was a good kind of example of one of the things I love about fashion photography where the background is very dull, very, you know, desaturated, but she herself just having this color and, like, this attitude and this energy, even the stance, um, still gives it this, like, kind of strong photo without, you know, us having to run and find, like, a perfect background, a perfect backdrop, but just acknowledging the reality and the authenticity of this moment. So, very long-winded, but I promise there's a method to my madness. Um, this is a more kind of, uh, I guess, straightforward um, fashion photo. The one on the right, obviously, I showed towards the beginning. Um, and this is my favorite photo from that series. I think just the drama, like, that's one of the things I love the most about fashion um, and fashion photography is just there's so many clothes, there's so many different types of clothes, there's so many ways to style them. And um, Mother Nature sometimes, like, you know, does the work for us. And uh, here we kind of have, like, this natural wind moment, the backdrop being this beautiful, like, sea. And then on the left, even though these are completely different places across the world from each other, I thought they would be good to pair together because you're seeing, you know, that yellow, that blue, but also two different ways that um, backgrounds can kind of bring fashion to life, right? So on that left photo, which is another uh, moment from the Pierre Moss show, Couture Show I, I mentioned, she's wearing a chair, I believe. Um, so another invention, um, another African-American invention that was included. But I think having it be zoomed out versus close up, something about the flow of the, like the, uh, not the garment, the, oh yes, the garment, but also the curtain on the floor and the backdrop. I love the folds. I love seeing how the light really interacts with um, just like this right here is like my favorite part of the photo. Um, I just feel like even her face, even though it's really small compared to everything else, it's, it's perfect because it's not showing so much. The bucket hat kind of covers it. So it just feels very moody to me, even though obviously it's in broad daylight. Um, and again, if I was a little closer, you know, even if I showed the yellow bottom of the background, I think just the angle that I'm at um, being off to the side or being um, just a little wider makes a difference um, than being straightforward and capturing her right on that backdrop. So I'm curious again about if you guys like the one on the left or on the right more. I like. Okay, everyone think about it first. <laughs> and then prepare to say, be prepared to say why just in case. All right. Ready for hands? Okay, who likes the left more? Okay. And then the right? Yeah. Okay. Let's hear from someone who raised their hand for the left, which is less, yeah, selected. Say it again. The impact. Ooh, what do you mean by that? The impact of the show, the impact of the photo, or? Everything that has a more of an in-your-face contrast, white, black, and yellow. Mmm, the contrast. Gold gold. I think that's why I like it, too. You said it better than I would, so thanks. <laughs> um, anyone else for the left photo about why they're into it? He said impact, the contrast. Yeah. Oh, hi, guys. <laughs> Yeah, I think the white is something for me too. The, 
And the, and the dark background, like you can tell it's sort of like velvet or something, it like absorbs the light a little bit. Um, okay, maybe one more for this photo. Anyone else that didn't hear something? Confidence. The confidence, yeah, the attitude. I feel like that's a good point um, with fashion photography too that I'll talk about a little later. Just like directing you know, your subjects and trying to get that energy if they don't maybe bring it naturally or if you gotta push them there, like how do you do it without it looking too posed, too forced, or too chill? Um, the one on the right, I think we all like for obvious reasons, but <laughs> anyone want to share? It's, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, like that, like slight, yeah. I feel like she was just kind of like trying to like survive, and I'm like, just keep going. <laughs> People will be like, they're cold. I'm like, we haven't got the shot. So, yeah, but I, I love that you noticed that because it's, it's like the little things with fashion photography. And I think it's like when it's done right, I might, I might be borrowing this phrase from advertising, but it's like if it's done right, you don't notice it or something like that. So it's like even just like how limber like our limbs can be or just like small gestures. Um, I'll find myself often... Um, like mir mirroring people because it's hard to explain exactly what you want. And then sometimes it'll be like those off moments that are like the perfect shots. So I feel like the body thing, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, so this is a contrasting version of the same point about the backgrounds bringing the life to fashion, right? But I'm just gonna go between these two for a second before I even make my point to see if you guys kind of see where I'm going. <laughs> So one's obviously more editorial, simple, and the other one's a bit more busy. Um, but I, I loved catching this while I was putting this together because, again, with like the method to my madness, we all have different ways we shoot. And I remember, you know, with photography, people always saying like, you have to organize your website so that people know if you're like an advertising photographer or like a fashion or a journalist. And I'm like, I just want to take good pictures of anything. Like, I don't care what the subject is, you know? But then I got pigeonholed, so whatever. So here we are. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a celebrity photographer to most, but I still consider myself just, you know, someone who likes to take good pictures. And I've always been a stickler on like the technical elements of things, as we all probably are. And so flash photography has always really intimidated, intimidated me because I feel like, I don't know how you guys do it. It just like scares me. It's like, oh, I hope I got the shot. Like, ooh, I hope, I hope it's like, exposed correctly. And sometimes it comes together really synergetically. And I thought these were good examples. On the left is a model named Jasmine Tooks. This is at the Met Gala last year. Like um, in the back, you'll see kind of James Corden, like, like that guy with, oh, I have a pointer this guy here. Um, and then there's Pier Paolo Piccoli, who's the creative director of Valentino on the right. But obviously you're looking at, you know, this beautiful like green dress, glowing like woman in the middle. Um, but I felt like, you know, seeing this against, uh, you know, a plain background, like let's say she just did like a getting ready photo or she was just against like a step and repeat, it would be a very different energy obviously than all these men in suits, right, behind her. And then on the right, even though it's really simple, um, well not simple, but even though it's less busy in the back, it's still like these steps. I think it's the Ritz Hotel or something. That, yeah, maybe the Ritz Carlton. Still these steps, still like this gold. You know, it's not like she's standing there, you know, by herself. I mean, she's by herself, but it's not like she's standing there without like a bunch of other visual things happening in the back. But I feel like with both of them, the backgrounds bring the fashion to life because it kind of gives gives context, right? Obviously, like I mentioned, with event photography, um, you can still get great fashion moments because people are gonna be, you know, it's, it's not just fashion photo shoots when people are fashionable. Um, but if you have that, like, perception of um, f fashion and photography only being photo shooting, modeling, studio, I feel like you can limit yourself, right, from just capturing moments that can be used or can be seen as fashion moments. So I'm always just trying to figure out how to get a clean shot if I need to, or if I don't have control of my environment, my settings, like in these scenarios, one person's like, you know, at a party, 
on the right, she was on her way to the Met, so just kind of getting like paparazzi, paparazzi or whatever. I feel like, um, yeah, but I can't control the backgrounds. I always am still trying to figure out how to make the right select or find the right moment to get my, sub my subject's attention. So you can still kind of get photos that on the left, you know, feel intentional, feel very um, connected with the photographer. And then contrastingly on the right, where, you know, she's just waiting for a cab, it's like, to me, very much like Sex in the City, very like, you know, just elegant, um, and her dress is beautiful. So these are two different examples that I think kind of do the same thing, or four different examples, rather, that I think do the same thing. Um, and last but not least, I wanted to include it, I wanted to include it. <laughs> I'm trying, guys. Um, last but not least, I wanted to include this awesome photo, these awesome photos of Method Man. This was for Essence Magazine, um, a fashion photo shoot, and I think I probably photograph, even though you don't see it here, I think I probably photograph more male musicians um, editorially. So even though I mentioned Cardi, I think that like when it comes to being on like sets for photo shoots, like this was probably like one of the most iconic like you know musicians I got to work with and um, it was a very successful shoot but I think what people won't see behind the scenes when you're working with talent is you got to still hustle for the shot without hassling the talent um, so that's pretty straightforward but you think about you know the moving parts of a set right like the actual the makeup the glam um, in his case you know just like the tailoring for some things, or like his entourage, his crew, his management. And as a photographer, people are looking at us like, you know, are we done yet? Did we get the shot? You know, is it, you know, how does it look? Can I see? And there's a lot of stuff going on a lot of times, and I, I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that. I think for me, with the hustle and flow kind of theme and just wrapping this up, it's been just really important in my career to find that fine line of like, making sure we're moving efficiently, getting what we need without the talent feeling pressured or, you know, uncomfortable. And that's really, I think, what um, allows them to give you that trust, knowing that you'll have them look good, you'll get the shot. You know, he wasn't doing anything too crazy here. He was sort of being himself, and I was trying to get these, like, vignettes of him, you know, posing a little bit on the right. I feel like that's like, a little bit of an off guard with a really great jacket, but you could tell by his energy, you know, the comfort level, like, you know, he's a cool guy, he's hanging out, just being, you know, casually photographed. But with fashion photography, it's still important to know when you're working with talent, whether it's celebrity or your models or, you know, whatever the case may be, just kind of hustling and flowing to get the shot without them feeling stressed or hassled or rushed. Um, so yeah, last, last question. Left or right? What are we thinking? Let's think about it. Let's think about it. Okay, hands. Oh wait, wait. Everyone, everyone decided. Okay. <laughs> hands for the left. Okay, that's like half. Okay, hands for the right. Really? I think the right is so. Okay. It's... My right is your right. Like it's still, yeah, good point. But it's the black, <laughs> the black and white one. I just, okay, I'll say my opinion. I think it's just really clean. They didn't run this in like the official photos, but the 3M jacket obviously is so crazy to me. And I think like the black and white, the glasses, like the hair, even the shadow, I think kind of just makes it really edgy. But who said left and why? Yes. On the left? But wouldn't that make you want to see him in a different light? So it's more so like seeing him in a way that you know, but still not, like still a little different, yeah. Okay, yes? Ooh, I know her, that's my friend. <laughs> okay, anyone for the one on the right being their favorite? I 
I agree with her. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hold on a second. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, he's turn it around. <laughs> turn it around. Look at that crowd. <laughs> All right. Thank just, you, everyone. I think. Thank yeah. you so much. I just hustled for the shot. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's it. It's a hustle. Is there anything else you need to know about outside or anything? My, I think I'm done. You're, you're do good. It. You're good. <laughs> we have a, a so there's a, a speaker meet and greet table right outside the door to the right. You can go and greet your throngs, answer any questions. Everybody, hang out because you know one more time for Flo. Flo Nagal, right on, Flo. Awesome. We are going to have Jared Poland, otherwise known as Frodo's Photo, coming up next. So stick around. We'll see at 4 o'clock. Jared will be on the stage. So come back and see Jared. We're very excited to have Jared. Thank you, everyone. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you.
creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. 
the new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer.
Introducing a completely redesigned experience that you can sense. And that senses you. The new Dell Latitude laptops bring your work closer to you. Creativity is in the air. Instax Mini Link 2 Smartphone Printer. Okay, everyone, we are in the home stretch for day one. We've only got two presentations left. Did you guys catch that? Flow and fro? Yeah. Is that order? The flow fro thing? That was pretty, uh, we realized that later on. We're like, yeah. Okay, so we're going to start this off in a couple of minutes, but a couple of things I want to go over with you guys. I was just going through the crowd talking a little bit, and someone said to me, what is your favorite part of build? And obviously, the main stage and the amazing speakers are my favorite part of build. I mean, that kind of goes without saying. But... Uh, we want to come up with contests, and man, the team, we sat around this, this uh, conference table in a conference room on the fifth floor of B&H Photo, 449 ninth Avenue, and we were all scratching our heads, and we're like, well, we could, we could use raffle tickets, and I'm like, oh, I hate raffles. Nothing's worse than like calling out 15, 20 raffle numbers in a row for people that aren't in a room. We were going to try to do photo contests, and photo contests are complicated, and legal has to get involved, and they work better when they're online, and we talked about maybe doing a photo print contest here, and it was just, it was a little bit too much, and we, we went out of the meeting without a, a good idea for contest, and then we had a next meeting the next week, and I had a, had a revelation, because I'm a, I'm a gamer, it's a little bit of a secret, Jeff, our, our stage manager, he, uh, he knows where I'm coming from, I play Warhammer 40k, I'm a Dungeons and Dragons player, I love like, rules should be in a book this big, my daddy always said I should have been a lawyer, anyway, came up with a cool contest, so for those of you that haven't done it, you can only do it once during the whole build time, it's, on, it's right outside of the elevators, it's called the build challenge, and from 11 to 1, it's going to be stuffing camera bags. And the way it works is like this. I'm here, and then my opponent is right next to me. We have a camera bag with all a bunch of equipment are outside of it. You've got to take all the equipment, place it neatly, reverse the hoods, pack up the camera bag, zip it up, and whoever gets it first wins. So then the person who loses steps off. Another person comes up. If you can win three times in a row, you get a $50 gift card. $50 gift card's a nice thing, because if you buy something at B&H, and it costs $550, slap that gift card down, and now how much does it cost? 500 bucks, making sure you're paying attention. So that's the first heat is the camera bag, and then a couple hours later, they do uh, extending a tripod and leveling a tripod, which if you've ever tried to watch a, an amazing sunset as that sucker gets on the meridian and starts to sing fast, and you're like struggling to get your tripod, get the camera mounted on the quick release and flatten it all out, uh, whoever gets that first wins. And then the last one is the hardest thing to do in photography. Do you guys know what the hardest thing to do in photography is? It's not pay the rent. Folding your reflectors. Folding your fold, yeah, folding your reflectors. The hardest thing in the world is uh, folding. So that is a contest with folding reflectors. If you can stay and win three times in a row, you get that $50 gift card. So tomorrow, go check out the B&H challenge, the build challenge. It's really fun. You'll notice that the team, they all have striped shirts 
and they take it really seriously, and it's a ton of fun. So you want to go check that out tomorrow. So that's one of my favorite things. Uh, my other favorite thing, really, is that just working with these speakers. It's an honor and a privilege to work with numbers of these speakers. Some speakers are really easy to work with. Some are a little bit different. Some are incredibly ad advanced and historic. Some are beginning, and we're platforming, and we're hoping to bring up. So it's really a blast to actually have this job and work with these speakers. They're so interesting. So uh, I'm kind of, I'm old. I was born in 67. Uh, I, I grew up with dark rooms and silver highlight, and I still, even a digital camera, I, I put it into JPEG mode, and I, I shoot with a style black and white. Uh, I just, I don't do raw. I know some people do raw. The guy who's going to be coming up next, T-shirt says something about raw. Uh, but uh, that's photography. That's what it's all about, is finding your own path and working your way through it. And uh, something has changed in years, the, the YouTube revol uh, revolution, and these creators that have come out, uh, these photographers that are really using their YouTube channel, and uh, they make very special stuff. And it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, we've got two great YouTube personalities here on the Build main stage. Today, it's going to be Jared Poland, better known as Ferrono's Photo. Whew. And then tomorrow, we got some other guy named Casey. He's going to be here at uh, 10 o'clock, so we'll see that. Uh, but uh, this is going to be pretty cool, because uh, I think you're going to see a little different side of Fro. He's going to share some personal work. And uh, really, it's an honor to have Jared Pollan. Welcome to the, the Build main stage. Yeah. Let me get a shot of you with your, with your accolades in the background there. All right, folks. Here he is. It's Fro. Jared Poland, thank you so much. I hope my ass looks good. Are we on? Hi. Hi, everybody. I'll do my intro, because that's how I usually like to start. Jared Poland, Frono's Photo. <laughs> Dot com. I mean, <laughs> some, some people absolutely hate it because I've been saying it all the time, but the thing is you remember it at this point because I've said it eight billion times. It also meant that people got my name right and stopped calling me Poland and call me Poland because people got it wrong all the time. So I want to talk about photo stories and personal projects. Uh, photo stories are something that, I mean, it's self-explanatory. It's a bunch of photos that put together tell an amazing story. And anything can be a photo story. It could be a manufacturing plant. You can find images anywhere, right? You can, you, it could be going on the road with Bernie Sanders, which is one of the things that I did as a photographer. I wasn't hired by them, I was invited out. So I go and I document whoever I'm there to document. So it doesn't matter what affiliation you are, you just go and you do. And you use your, I kind of use my camera as a shield because I'm hidden behind it and my emotions are hidden behind it. So photo stories are, are important to me, and I'm gonna share a photo story with you today, and, and these guys were afraid of what Fro Uncensored meant, because the truth of the matter is they came up with some title that I didn't even like, and I said, just call it Fro Uncensored, but they didn't know I didn't know what I was gonna talk about yet. So that's why we called it Uncensored, so that I can talk about whatever I want to talk about, and in this case, it's the photo stories and the personal projects. When I'm doing photo stories, I'm going after four things, wides, mediums, tights, details. I hammer that home in my brain when I'm doing any type of photo shoot because there's those times where you take pictures and you're like, well, what am I supposed to do next? And then you realize you just shot it at one focal length and you forgot about the story. You forgot about the wider shot that establishes the scene. You forgot that you get in a little closer to fill the frame. You do the, the portrait is your tight shot and then your details, of course, are your details. And, and I think personal projects are some of the most important things to do, because people always talk about, what am I supposed to do? I don't, I don't have a job, I didn't get a gig, I'm not getting hired by anybody. But put yourself out there with an idea for a project that you want to do, and do it. Just do it. Oh God, I sound like a meme. <laughs> Just do it. But what, what I mean, I've gotten so many things out of personal projects. I've reached so many people because I've put myself out into the world, reached out to people, showed them what I could do, and just said, look, this is what I want to do. You don't have to pay me. I'm just, I want to do this. And not getting paid has led to getting paid. So I just want to get that out of the way. I'm going to leave time at the end here to do a Q&A because I know people always have questions. They don't have a microphone for you, so you're going to yell it at me and I'm going to repeat it. Um, but I want to talk about a personal photo story 
that's the direction I want to go. So this is, what's this? What month is this? Wow, that's small. I can't read. Can someone tell me what that says? Of 2007. This is my mom. Now, she wasn't doing too well, and we rushed her to the hospital. And we didn't know why. We didn't know what was up. She wasn't doing well for a couple of days. And I also so happened to get a Nikon D3 right around that time. Um, I mentioned the gear. The gear doesn't mean much, but it just puts the time into perspective. The D3 just came out, the 14 to 24, 28, the 24 to 70, 28, and that stuff revolutionized photography because the D3 is one of the greatest cameras ever made. It's still a fantastic camera. Um, but I grabbed my camera, I grabbed my camera bag, which was my mom's camera bag at the time, but I had my gear in it, and I went to go shoot. I got yelled at by the nurses at first because they said, HIPAA, HIPAA, and I'm like, I don't care. And so I, I'm like, this is my mom, I'm gonna take pictures, which is a selfish thing because I'm selfish in certain ways, and I think as photographers, we're all, we're all selfish. We, we wanna get the shot. I didn't intend to do a photo story. A photo story is just what came out of this. And so from this, this is one of those establishing type shots. I, I should also say, I haven't re-edited these since way back in the day. So I edited the way that I edited the raw files back in the day. This is how they're gonna look right here. Um, but as an establishing shot, it's pretty good from a storytelling standpoint in my mind. It's wide enough, we can see my mom in the bed, we can see the, the notes, the barcodes, the things on the walls, the things that you don't want to forget about in a story. And so you can see my dad's foot. Now, it's not something you would see in the bottom left corner that you might know, but I know because I, I took it, and I know that's my dad wearing like New Balances or something back in the day. He, he now has better shoes. He likes to have his Adidas or something, or Under Armour. Um, but go forward. Thank you. I, do I just have to say go forward and press at the same time? No, just kidding. Um, so with a story, I'm always working different angles. I'm always moving around. I'm not afraid to be seen, right? Do you know how many people sneak out of the rows here and they're all like, <laughs> they, they can see you, right? Don't worry about it. Just own it. Own the space, right? Own your photography. If you're going through the aisle, walk with purpose, get to your spot, sit down, get your shots. Um, so just moving around, getting something that's establishing even from a different angle, a little wider. We see my dad's wearing an Eagles shirt, right? This is, we're all waiting to see what's going on. And they're running a bunch of tests, and I gotta read my notes to make sure I'm on point here. Huh, yeah. You're capturing all of the things on the walls. We're telling those stories. Coming in a little closer, I love using out of focus things that draw you into the scene. I just, I just, it just adds dimension where dimension doesn't exist. Photography is a 2D, 2D medium, and in this case, we're able to give it some dimension. Also, black and white, I, I've always been a proponent. I love black and white. I shot a lot of black and white film back in the day. I loved processing in the dark room. Um, but this just brings you in even closer. So I would consider this to be one of those medium type shots that helps tell the story as you're moving forward. And then just something a little wider, taking a step back. And there's only so much you can do in a room like this, but I think it all builds. And I didn't know where I was going with this at, at the beginning when I was taking these photos, but we were waiting. It was like nine, 10 o'clock at night. We were waiting for one of the doctors to show up to try and give us a better understanding of what was wrong. And one of the doctors came by and he's like, I'm pretty sure it's cancer. He, like, I don't know what type it is, but with his expertise, he's like, I think this is what we're gonna find out. And that's what I think we're working with. We're gonna keep her in for observation and we're gonna start to run some tests and figure it out. So this is the next day. What's the date say again? 22nd. As a, as a photographer, it's not good to be blind and I so happen to not see very well, so. Um, this I don't consider to be one of those images that would stand on its own. Photo stories, they don't all, all the images in them don't have to stand out on their own, right? It's not just one image that pops. Now, you can have images that stand out, but I think in the story it's okay to have ones that aren't the best of the best, but they still convey a message. This is the next day. We're waiting. You've got the crappy food on the, on the table. 
You've got, the, I guess, the frosted flakes, which is probably the worst thing you could ever eat with the sugar. Not very good. But the flowers in the background, right? Those are from the garden. My dad grew those. He plucked them. He put them there. So I, I just love backgrounds of images. You know, her friends came, so sharing laughs. It's, it's not like, I'm, it, it's almost like I'm not there, right? They're, they're ignoring me, which is normal. You know, leave me alone and just let me do what I do. And sharing a laugh, excuse me, sharing a laugh with friends here. And then a tighter one. Like I said, this isn't something that, that I think stands out, but the reason I like it is we have my grandmother in the background, Lil. How many people watch my old, 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 old videos with Lil in it? Anybody? We've got some here. I have about 100 videos with, with Lil and I where I would ask her questions on YouTube for five, six, seven minutes, and she would sit there and say, come see, come saw, and the same things over and over, but it was funny. So we've got Lil here, we've got my mom in the background, and we jump to December 23rd, which so happens to be my mom's birthday. Uh, unfortunately, she and my dad were supposed to go to Las Vegas, and that ended up not happening because she was diagnosed with cancer at this time. Um, and so we had to celebrate her birthday here. Now, if anybody's wondering if you should light candles in a, in a room, the answer is only if you ask them and they check that the oxygen is off because they made sure that the oxygen, oxygen is off. But I love wide establishing shots. That, that's one thing that I got wrong. Uh, actually, I want to go back to, that, to this because I always want to, I always tell people that what's the point of taking a super tight headshot if you can't tell where the environment is. So if you're in Paris at the Eiffel Tower, and you can't tell you're in Paris at the Eiffel Tower because you can't tell that you're there, then what was the point of even doing it? So try to convey the scene as best as possible while working in the environment that you're in. Look at the, look at the door. There's a photo of me wearing a wanker shirt. That's me, right? I'm wearing a shirt. Then there's my dad and my brother officiating. So, there's pictures inside of pictures. I see so many people take tight images, say it's a baby and, and the mother, the father are sitting there and it's just a tight shot. But what they're forgetting is on the walls, you have family members' pictures, you have stuffed animals around, you have memories from their childhoods that if you capture that, that's something that lives on for the history of those people and the history of the image. So we've got my brother, we have my sister-in-law, we've got the candles being blown out, and I just think it's a, a very good storytelling image. We got Lil here, bottom corner, smiling with her fake pearls. They're not real. Um, it, it's important to move around. Just don't stop. Once you get a shot, just keep moving, find the different angles, but don't keep redoing the same thing over and over. And that's the reason you'd switch different lenses or you switch focal lengths. And I don't care so much about the gear. And I know people don't really believe that because all the videos that I make are, a lot of videos are about gear, but part of the reason we make videos about gear is those are the videos that people wanna watch. And that gives me a, a, an outlet to talk about other personal projects and photo stories and that ho hopefully people do transition and watch as well. Um, but again, the flowers, you've got the flowers up in the back that my dad picked. So that's why they're there again. And I just think it's important to get Lil in here. And you got mom and Lil. These aren't the, you know, standalone shots, but as a family and as part of a, a storytelling series, it works. My brother, his sister, sorry, his sister. My sister-in-law, I don't have a sister. Um, the, the interesting thing here was, from a personal standpoint, I definitely hid my emotions away. I used the camera as a block for my emotions. It's just what I did, and I'm, I, I hide them pretty well. And I felt at this time that my brother had someone to fall back on. Um, I felt like I didn't really have anybody there for me. You know, I had to be strong for my dad, and that's why I felt like I had to put on a, a strong front to be there for him. My brother had his wife, my dad had me, I didn't really have many people to support me in that moment, but you know, we still didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what she was being diagnosed with. Then we've got Lil, 
I kind of like this. The, um, the composition isn't a normal composition that I would go for, but again, the flowers played a part in it. So vertical, usually I would want to keep the eyes in the, in the top third, that's where I like to do it. Um, but the red flowers, I just really like the feel of the, the stoic look that Lil put on here. Lil was a tough woman. She was, she was a tough woman. She had to deal with, uh, she was born in 1910. And she lived to uh, seven days shy of 104. So she, uh, she saw quite a lot, if you think from 1910 on till, uh, you know, whatever that number adds up to. Math wasn't my strong point, that's why I'm a photographer. <laughs> French wasn't my strong point. I got a D minus in that, by the way, in ninth grade, which then sent me into photography. So thank you, French, for failing, or almost failing. Um, just a picture, mom, dad, just, just to have it. Not, not one of the best of the best of the best with honor, sir, but something that we could work with. Um, so they did a lot of prodding and probing. They were taking like liver biopsies, which is, sounds terrible when they do it because you're awake and they're putting like a corkscrew through your back trying to get to the liver to figure out what you have and to type it. Um, she ended up with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and it wasn't the, the, the quote unquote good kind, the one that you live with and you die with. Uh, it, it's one that was a little more aggressive and more difficult. So one of the courses of action is chemotherapy. And this is where you get into more of the detailed shot. I drove her to the first session uh, for the chemotherapy. And I always found it interesting that, you know, they're putting this ba these bags of poison in you and they're handling it with uh, gloves and masks and they're literally putting this into you. They can't touch it, but they're putting it into your body, which is, which is extremely difficult, I, I think, with, uh, think. Um, and so people always ask, where, where did the hair come from? Now, I started growing a fro before Frono's photo launched, which was in 2010. And at this time, we said that if, if my mom ended up losing her hair, that I would give her mine. And thankfully, she didn't end up losing her hair. I got to keep mine and launch a website, which, which I guess is, is important because it kind of played a role in that. Um, but from the storytelling standpoint, we move into the tighter shot. This tells the story of what's going on. We've gone from, look, I didn't know where the story was gonna go. It was just me documenting along the way. When I do photo stories now, it's usually I spend a day, I spend two days with someone, I capture every moment of what's going on to tell the best story possible in the images, but this was just an ongoing project. Um, the day after chemo, they're getting ready to go to a, a family member's bat mitzvah, and my dad's waiting patiently, or impatiently, probably, for, for them to get ready to go, but my mom is totally amped up for whatever reason. I guess she was running on adrenaline at the time. Um, and this is our house, kitchen, all the memories, all the things that are there. Look at the refrigerator. You may not be able to see the images right now, but in other images, you, you will. Uh, those are the type of things I still like to capture in the story. Um, I'm not afraid to go with some slower shutter speeds in certain situations. I know a lot of people talk about just freezing the action, freezing the moment, and that is important, but sometimes you wanna go with a slower shutter speed to convey the movement. Um, and there's a difference between something that's motion blur because you just use the wrong shutter speed or something that just works because there is some movement but it helps tell the story, right? I just, I love this angle. I love using the natural light coming in from wherever it was coming in, just playing around, just composing, just exposing and then just capturing. And you can see the room's purple. I wear purple. I don't think it was my choice to make that room purple, but I, I, I do like the purple. It's not that color anymore. Um, this is where you can see the slower shutter speed. My mom's moving, Lil's moving, my dad's still waiting here, just playing around with different angles, just they're getting ready to go. Classic shot, let's show the outfits. They were TikTokers before their time. You know, they're just, just getting ready to go. getting ready, door. I probably would edit this in black and white these days if I had to do it again. Um, but I just like the look. I like my dad going around the back of the car after opening the door. 
I, I like my mom making eye contact with me. You know, it's an interesting thing. Like, was she okay with me taking pictures? Right? Is that something people are thinking? Was she okay with it? Um, she was okay with me capturing the moment. She was okay with me telling the story. And then, well, what, what date was this last one? What's that say? January 12th? And there's a reason I jump all the way to October. Because from January to October, all the treatments were working. Everything was going well. And so that didn't seem like a reason to just take random photos. She was doing the everyday things. She was in uh, the choir at synagogue and driving herself and, and just going about her life until it morphed. The cancer morphed, and she wasn't doing well. And so she would sleep in my brother's bedroom. My brother's no longer there. He's out of the house. Um, my room was on the other side of the wall, because I still lived at home then. And she would cough, like, all night. The cancer was pressing on the lungs, which was causing her to cough. And, you know, my dad's sitting here. He's watching TV. My mom's laying there. And I, I'm pretty sure I recall them talking about if she was to die, that he should continue on. He should find someone, he should go live, right? So it's not the easiest thing to capture, but again, I'm still hiding my emotions behind the camera at the time. And for anybody who remembers my earliest videos, the, this is where I made them. I made them in this room uh, when I first started. That's where I put the iMac, that's where I made those early photos. So I, I like this because I believe my mom is looking at my dad here. She's looking at him, she's making the eye contact. And now they're both watching the TV. I work my way around the room, right? Something a little more behind the scenes. It's kind of like they don't even know I'm there. I mean, you get that feeling a little bit? They're just letting me be. They're letting me do my thing. Again, I still don't know why I'm doing it. I'm just doing it because that's all I knew. That's all I knew was to tell the story. I think they're watching the Rat Pack or something. And you see there's a lot of wides. Now we jump, what, two days forward? She's freezing. She went through the, the, she would sweat. She would then be freezing. And in this case, she's obviously wrapped in multiple blankets. I, I see with the clock, you can see the time. I always think it's important if there, there is a clock there, you capture the time. I probably wasn't thinking about that when shooting. It's one of those things you just compose and it just so happens to be there. So that's, that's something that I'm always looking for. What are the things in the background that might help tell the story when they're in the images? You've got the crackers by the bed in case she gets hungry. You've got the medication, the slippers on the floor, the window is slightly open, all the different colors that are in it. We're just, we're just capturing, right? I'm in there. Two days later again. Now it's a little later in the day. Again, just not feeling well. Super tired, coughing all the time. Oh, you see the grain? Does anybody care? I mean, I, so many people care about noise and grain. I know not to take it totally out of the story, but uh, I'm not a fan of noise reduction softwares. I, I find that no one cares about the noise and grain in your images. You've been trained by people to tell you that noise and grain is bad. But when we developed stuff back in the day in the dark room, when we had 3,200 delta or whatever the Ilford stuff was, you had noise, you had grain. It was what it was. It, it wasn't meant to be perfectly smooth. And, and, and a lot of the, the grain that you see that's removed today, it just smooths out your image and makes it look like a watercolor painting, which just isn't a good look in my opinion. I think just embrace the grain. And with today's technology, you have the ability to shoot at such high ISOs with much cleaner images that it's perfectly fine. So now we jump to October 22nd, not much later there, and she is really not feeling well at this point. She can't get warm. She's wrapped in the blanket. She's holding her tea. You can see the, the orange bottle is the medication. That's some medication that's supposed to... Uh, alleviate the, the, the coughing, but it obviously doesn't work very well. Um, you have the refrigerator. On the refrigerator, we've got my grandfather, and we've got photos of me, and we've got photos of cats, and all the family memories. These are things that you don't want to forget to capture in whatever story, whether it's happy, whether it's sad. 
Um, in this case, my mom sent me out of the room. She asked me to stop taking photos. She was not, not feeling it. And I, and I left the room, and then I, and then I came back, and I, and I said to her, I said, sometimes you have to capture the bad with the good. Not everything is going to be good. And as photographers, we have to document what we see. And so in this case, it, it, it just, it wasn't good, but she, she relented. It didn't take, she just said, sure. You know, I understand that. Go ahead and, and, and take it. Very selfish thing, by the way, I, as, as I think back on it. It, it is selfish, because I'm literally, literally trying to tell a photo story while she's sitting here dying. So that, that's, that's one of the tough things. But you, you make those choices. And I think, I think a lot of us are selfish when it comes to it, because you want get, to get the picture. Um, but again, you, you've noticed a lot of wide shots because they, they show the environment. You've got the counter. You've got the potato chips on the counter. It's not the cleanest thing going on right there, but it's telling the story of the time that she was going through. I felt like I wanted to come in closer, cut out the other junk in the side of the images. Um, her friend made this blanket, sent it to her. But she was pale, she was cold, she couldn't get warm. It, it, just, it, it, wasn't, it just wasn't good. Now, moving around the back. To me, this is one of the more powerful images. Not just from a photographic standpoint that I got my lines pretty straight with a 14 millimeter, but I, I looked at this yesterday when I was going through these images. I don't go through them very often because it's one of the only things that, that makes me emotional is, is this. But this feels like one of those closing type of shots. It feels like a last ending type of shot. You've got the bright lights from outside. I mean, you want to think, I'm not thinking that when I'm shooting it, but I mean, you can think about it as, as it's, as it's like, okay, this is the light, going into the light. This, if this was the last shot, from a storytelling perspective, this would be a closer. This would be an ending type thing. So, right around this time, she ended up falling, trying to go to the bathroom, you know, to make it to the bathroom, and she was hallucinating, and it went on for a couple of days. It just wasn't good. Um, my dad's like, we're gonna, we're gonna rush you to the hospital. We rush her down to Penn, one of the best hospitals there. She gets uh, into the ER, we roll her in, sorry, yeah, the emergency room, and we roll her in there. They take her back to be evaluated, and it's, um, you know, this is around this time, so it's right before the 2008 election. And I say something like, oh, you, you might, not get a, might not be able to vote for Obama or whoever she was gonna vote for, which was Obama. And then, and then she basically flatlined. I was like, oops, was that my fault? I, I, I really think that that might have been my fault because I said something that wasn't positive and it, and it might have triggered something. Um, they bring in the paddles, they bring in the crash cart, they bring in a, an emergency team. They don't end up paddling her and they ended up stabilizing her. Her heart rate plummeted. She, she was not, not doing well at all. Um, they get her into the ICU, uh, and I recall putting on, I brought a, the, the, remember the clip-on iPods, the small one, the iPod, I don't know, whatever they called that, and I put a song on, I, I, I hit, you couldn't tell what song was coming on, but the first one in the playlist was um, Frank Sinatra, uh, My Way, which was her favorite song. She also said, I want it played at my funeral. So I quickly changed that song because that probably wasn't a good song to have on, but I heard, I heard that come on. Um, so her doctor was on vacation. They did get a hold of him, and they talked about that they could probably get her a month or two if they push the cancer out of the liver. They could do something. So the problem was she, she, she had a magic bullet pill they talked about, and that was some something that they were trying at the time, and, it, and everything worked. I think we did one or two or three different things that all worked, and then it didn't. And then they say when it morphs, you're fucked. That if your cancer keeps morphing, you're not, 
you're not gonna, you're not gonna kick it. They talked about giving her a month or two if we did this procedure or whatever they wanted to do, and we made the decision as a family that, you know, the, the, the best course of action was not to do it. Because if we did it, what's the point? You're gonna be back in a month. And it's not like she had quality of life at that point. And so we made, we made that decision to, uh, to basically get her into hospice. But bef before we got her out of that hospital where they transported her to, to hospice, she became coherent. And she started recounting her entire life to everybody in the room. From childhood to teenage years to the, my, my brother and I. And it was, it was just weird. Because she went from being basically comatose to waking up and telling this story and, then, and then, then going out again. And so they, they get her into hospice. And there, you know, if anybody's ever dealt with hospice, there's, there's no wires, there's no beeping, there's no sounds. It's just make you comfortable until it's time to go. Um, yeah, and, and she did. And so this ended up being the ending photo. This is a year after she died. She died two days into hospice. And you know, this is for the unveiling of the, uh, the tombstone. And if anybody doesn't know, we don't really bring flowers in Jewish cemeteries as much. You, you bring stones because they last longer and they stay there. And so these are all different stones. I brought a bunch back from Israel when I went. Um, but there was, there was an image I didn't take. Uh, we got the call that she, she passed away, and we were only five minutes from, from the hospice place. And we went, and we went into the room, and they have her laying there in the bed, hands crossed. And I, and I wanted to take a picture. I wanted to take that picture. And then I, I talked myself out of it, and I said, I don't think people will understand, which I think I was wrong about. I, I should have taken it. I think that would have been you know, in a photo story standpoint, a good storytelling image. But I also think it would be something that, it's been done before, people have done it, and I think it's very powerful. Unfortunately, it's, it's emblazoned in my brain, but I remember us going in and, you know, like I, I kissed her on the forehead and she was already getting cold. And, and that was at the point I realized that, you know, that's not my mom anymore, that's just a, a, the vessel that she was in. So that's, that's why I think that picture would have been pretty damn powerful. Um, but I, I think it's important to tell these stories, regardless of how emotional it is or painful it is to tell. This is one of the things that gets me emotional. It, it's just, it hits me. I don't look at these images very often. And I thought it, it was just what I wanted to share with you guys, storytelling. You know, it's not about the gear here. No one cares what it was shot with. I mentioned it because I wanted to put the time stamp on it. But it, it doesn't matter what you shoot with. You can tell a photo story with your cell phone. You can tell a photo story with any camera. It doesn't matter. And at the end of the day, no one is looking at your images going, oh man, I wonder if you shot that with the latest camera or, or if you used IAF or you used anything. Because it's just, it, it doesn't matter as long as you capture the moment and you tell that story. And so when you're telling the stories, don't be afraid to tell the things that have emotion. Don't be afraid to share it. Take the pictures you want to take. You know, I, I, I still wish I took that shot, but it, it's okay. I, I've forgiven myself for not taking the picture. It's not a, it's not a big deal. Um, it's emblazoned in my brain forever. So... Really, the, the moral of the story here is you know, go out into the world and share your stories, whatever they are. You can turn anything into a photo story. Give it emotion. Capture the moments, the wides, the mediums, the tights, the details, and tell the stories that are there. And, and, and for personal projects, just do it. Just, just, just go out and do it. If you have an idea for something, figure out a way to do it. Get someone to say yes. All you need to do is you need to keep asking people. You're gonna get a bunch of no's, but all it takes is one yes, and that's it. 
So I think that's where I'm gonna end up leaving that one. Um, I know this was different than what most people would expect from me, because people don't personally know me, they know the guy I play on the internet, which is <laughs> technically me, mostly, just elevated to a different level sometimes. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a story I wanted to tell, and I hope you uh, got something from it. All right. So we have, we have time for Q and A. People probably have questions. Do we have questions? Just someone start yelling a question at me because I can't really see that far. How's my day going? It's okay. <laughs> I uh, got on a train this morning and got to New York. What was that? How's Steven? Steven's at home. He uh, just had a baby on Tuesday. Yeah. So he's, um, he's, he's taking whatever time he needs. We don't, we don't put a, a, a time stamp on whatever he needs with us. Like we, I, I want him back, but I got to give him whatever time he wants he can have. I hope he's not watching to hear that. <laughs> but I've, to, I've told him that a million times. The new studio is coming along, moved in. I'm not allowed to put things away because Steven is the OCD one. So there's a lot of stuff just waiting for Steven to come back to organize because that's, uh, that's his job. He likes to know where things are. I more put piles together in certain areas that I know where my stuff is. So I have my area, but the, the new studio is gonna be great. Uh, it's a great, great place to, to create and it's just a, another stepping stone for you know, what we do. What was my favorite part of the trip to France, the most recent one? Um, I think it was, I mean, one, I love Paris, I love baguettes. I like the French butter. That stuff is really, I, really, I like the food, the food's great. Um, I don't know, I, I liked, I, I took one camera, right? I, I didn't take the best of the best with honor, sir. I took a, a, a Canon R8 and a 28 to 70, so I took not the greatest camera, but I took one of the greatest lenses ever, and that's what I shot with. Uh, and I felt that that was a, um, it was, it was, I like challenges, right? Like I just, B&H actually sent me a Fuji GFX 100S because I've never shot, Fuji doesn't send me stuff. Um, but I love the challenge of trying something different in a situation where people don't usually use those systems. I took it to the Phillies. Uh, you can go on my Instagram, Jared Poland. I, I don't have them here to pop up, but it's just a fun challenge to use something different. And the question is, do I normally mix my black and white with the color? So for me, selecting which way it goes is really just a, a feeling in the moment. Some images just call out to you to be black and white. They just feel better, at least to me. And so I like to go contrasty. I like to boomify them. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I mix them up. Um, I think that that helps get the point across. And I, and I also do think that sometimes certain images that do not work in color can be saved by going to black and white. I just feel it's something, you know, it's just something classic about black and white. Um, can you turn your lens hood around though? If you're gonna... <laughs> Thank you. I have a thing with lens hoods. I just have a thing with lens hoods. They, they, they're there to be, yeah, that, that guy's got his lens hood properly done. Thank you. So yeah, a mix of black and white and colors for, for me is totally fine. Today? Oh, I didn't tell them. <laughs> um, I never asked, actually. I, I think they're fine. They, they understand me, that I'm gonna do it anyway, basically, but uh, they're, they're good images to have, no matter how painful they are. Um, I, I just think it's really important to share your emotion. There's nothing wrong with showing emotion, and, and you know, for the past, a lot of people were told to hide the emotion away. I find it hard to cry. This stuff makes me cry. And then I somehow just stop and I really want to let it go, but I can't. I don't know why, it's just always, it just, for some reason I stop. Do you still hide your emotions like you did back in 2008 behind the camera? The question is, do I still hide my emotions like I did in 2008 behind the camera? I think as photographers, we're, 
meant to hide your emotions when you're shooting, right? I think that you need to be calm and in the moment. I have trouble with patience and waiting for things in everyday life, but when it comes to photography, I can stand somewhere for four hours waiting for that moment to happen, and I'm in it, and I'm cool with standing there waiting. Um, but I think it's important that you cut emotion out of what you do, because in certain situations, you just need to react. You need to be in the moment, and I like to say that I feel like I'm in moments where I see it happen before it actually happens, so that I'm ready to capture it when it does happen. I feel like the world is moving in slow motion, and I'm moving at regular speed around to get the image. I don't know why that is, but that's how I feel like I shoot. Um, but I think it's important when you're documenting to not show a lot of emotion. Because I, I just think you need to be in tune with what's happening so that you can capture it and not, be not let the emotion blind you to getting the moment. My thoughts on AI in terms of photography and editing? Um, so my thoughts on AI are, I mean, it's technology that we need to learn. It's technology we need to figure out how to embrace and, and each person is gonna choose how much they wanna use it. So in photo, photojournalism, like my uh, Lionel Messi photos where I cut his toe off at the very bottom or cut half of his body off, people are like, well, why don't you use AI to grow the toe? I'm like, I could. I'm a guy who doesn't even crop my images, so I'm not gonna turn to, to going to that to, to grow it. But there's benefits to it, right? AI has, I mean, there's so many things that it can do as a tool to help us be a better creative. So I wouldn't poo-poo it and just get, get rid of it. And there's AI softwares for editing your images. I'm trying to test some out. Some of them were too much of a pain in the butt to use, so I didn't end up using them yet. Um, but I'd like to see what they can do. But I still think I'm the best at culling down the images to the best of the best of the best with honor, sir, so that I can pick them. I mean, I show that in my, my latest, uh, it was the vlog with the Lionel Messi stuff. I took 600 and some photos and I ended up selecting 44 to edit, and of the 44, I edited it down to eight. Eight were the best of the best. They were the keepers. And I always tell people that you're the last line of defense between putting out quality and crap, and if you allow a crappy photo to go out that people don't like or that just doesn't represent what you do, that's your fault. So I don't, I'm not a fan of people taking 5,000 images or 8,000 images at a wedding and then delivering, de deli blah, delivering them. But if you take 8,000 images and that's what you did and then you edit it down to the best of the best, that's fine. Always show your best work. I I'm a little different with, with what I do on YouTube because I'm gonna show you the not best stuff too. Because I want you to see that it's not all, those are the eight keepers, that's what I got and there aren't bad shots. There's always gonna be bad shots, and I think it's important to share that with everybody so that they see and they know that me, even as like a professional, doesn't get keepers every time. So, AI, I, I'm, for, I'm for it. It's like going from, from film to digital back in the day. The film photographers who said, digital isn't there, it's terrible, are the ones that got left behind. Because you have to learn the new technologies or you're gonna be left behind. So just embrace it. You're not gonna win, you're not gonna get it put back in the box where they're gonna be like, you know, the, the photographers and, and artists complaining that they trained AI with their images. I don't care. Train your image, train your AI with me, it's gonna benefit me. It's like we've read books in the library, we've learned from different things. It's the same thing they're doing, they're filling that in and it's just moving quicker. At least that's my opinion. Where do you see yourself in like 10 years? Uh, 52. <laughs> So it's where, where do I, eight Lambos, where do I see myself in 10 years? I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I try not to, uh, I mean I have ideas, I wanna have a, a property that has a bowling alley. You gotta have aspirations for something, like when I bought my first property, it was basically the one from Big. I always wanted the one, you know, the, the, the property from Big. I didn't put the trampoline in, my dad said if you, if you paralyze yourself, I'm not gonna take care of you, and that resonated, that made sense as an adult, don't get a trampoline in your apartment. So I, so I didn't. Um, 10 years, I, I just, I don't know, I don't ever see a time where I'm not creating, whether it's YouTube, whether it's something bigger that, I, that I'm trying to work on now that I wanna branch into different directions, but I still love creating. I still love giving the gift of photography. I'm in a position where I don't have to make money from what I do in the photo world because I generate revenue from the YouTube. 
I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm happy to say that because I think it's every photographer's goal to get to a place where you can shoot what you want when you want to and not have to worry about getting paid. So I just still want to continue to give the gift to people that may never have had the chance to get a great photo of themselves. I just love giving photo books. I love giving prints. I love giving images to people. Like I gave away the Lionel Messi photos. I put them up at 40 inches on the long side. They're up on, on Flickr. You can download them, use them for personal use. Because I just like, someone else is going to enjoy it. And not everything has to be for the money. Like when I do my six degrees projects where I spend the day in the life of somebody um, capturing their story and I pay for it. I pay for my travel, I pay for everything, my, my lodging. And the, the goal there is that they will connect me to the next person in the line. And then they connect me to the next and the next and the next. And the funny thing is, I've ended up getting paid for book covers from the photos that I've done there. Because you never know where it's going to lead you. And, you know, meeting more people and having those connections is super important. Because I like to be a super connector. I like to be able to connect someone that I know who needs help with something with somebody else that I know who could help them with that. So that's the stuff that makes me the happiest. The thing that makes me the least happiest is downtime where I'm doing nothing and loneliness. I don't like that. We see you at uh, a zoo or a Phillies game. If yeah. you were to go out and just shoot, not put it out on the internet, what do you shoot for yourself that we probably don't know about, like so just for fun? The question is, you, you see me shooting all over the place for, for content. What do I do shooting-wise for fun? Uh, <laughs> That is a good question because it's in the back of my mind that everything ends up being content. So photo stories are what I find to be fun um, and challenging. So there really isn't anything that I just go and shoot because I just shoot. It's always in the back of my mind, like oh, I should show, I should put a um, a camera on top of this. I should put a camera on my head. I should document everything that I'm doing. So it's like it's a double-edged sword because I do these shoots for fun where it's capturing people or the photo stories, but then I end up wanting to turn it into content. So I have to find the, the happy medium where it's a little bit of both. Well, hold on, we got two people coming here. What one can, say that from, from, hist from history? <laughs> what camera, what lens, I mean, I've said that the D3 was a great camera. The D3S was the camera that launched my website because it gave me five minutes of video. I think that was one of the most perfect, greatest cameras ever made. Are things better now? Of course. Um, I would take that camera, that thing is fantastic, but I mean, shit, you got D3S, or sorry, you've got um, R3s, you've got A1s today, you've got Z9s, they're all fully capable. Uh, in terms of lenses, I mean, that 28 to 70 f2 is pretty damaging. You can do quite a lot of damage with one lens like that. So I think right now, that lens is, is pretty much a lens that I would have as a go-to. Nice. Right. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. Um, he was saying that I was invisible. What's my advice for that? I mean, that was the same thing I said about sneaking around the aisles when you're leaving and to be a fly on the wall. I mean, you're, you're going to be seen. People always say when they see me on stage at a concert, why didn't you wear black? Everybody knows you wear stage black. I'm like, fuck you, I wear purple. <laughs> you know, I want to be seen. I want to be seen on the back of the stage with my hair popping up from behind the drummer because I find it funny. People take pictures of that and they send it to me and I think it's cool. I, I don't think I need to blend in. I, I think that you know, if you respect the people you're shooting, they respect you, they respect the work that you do, they allow you to be there and just do what you need to do and not get in the way. Just stay out of the way. And it's okay every once in a while to say, hold that. Right, hold that to get that shot that you want because it's sometimes you miss certain things. But you just, I don't worry about it. I just, I'm in the area, I, I, I am a fly on the wall, you are gonna know that I'm there, but after a while they just understand based off of the work that you've done in the past that you're okay to be there. You're not trying to make them look bad. 
Um, and that, that's another thing is don't let out work that would make someone look bad that you don't, you shouldn't be putting out there. Um, you just don't want to, you don't want to do that. You, you, you don't get a lot of opportunities to mess up. And if you, you know, like paparazzis, I'm not a paparazzi fan. I just think it's terrible. I'd rather have you walk up to someone and ask to take the photo and see what they say. And then if they tell you no 73 times, maybe the 74th time, they're like, you know what, maybe I'll give this person a chance because they're not just trying to steal my picture to make money on the internet. Yeah, a couple more. I know I'm over time, but what time do we go until? Three more. Yeah. So this is a classic street photography question. Um, what if you're on the street and you capture someone's image? Do you uh, do you ask them first, or do you take the picture? Well, it's public. You're in a public place, so this, this is a this is a this is a very gray area. I'm not a fan of the taking pictures of people that are down and out, right? Homeless people and then trying to exploit that and be like, oh, isn't this something? I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of some of the street photographers who will run around the street holding a flash and pop it in someone's face. I think that's disrespectful. They should be punched in the face. And I don't care <laughs> if, if you're in public. Like, there is no expectation of privacy in public, at least in this country as of right now. You can get away with, with doing that. Um, but you still need to be respectful. Uh, I've taken plenty of street style photos and some people are happy and some people are not. Misdirection is the key to taking pictures on the street. Like, I think Zach Arias talked about this back in the day. He was demonstrating. But I do it all the time where I'm looking through and shit, they see me. And then I look at the back of the camera. I, look, I point at something over there. I, point, I don't look at eye contact. I don't make eye contact and I just go about my business. Misdirection. Make it like you don't see them looking at you because you already got their picture. But that's the best way to get rid of that confrontation is like don't make eye contact. Just start looking at the... You know, that, that's important. What's my opinion on, this, this guy's an asshole. <laughs> no, my online personality is very, this is, this is me. This is like anybody that hangs out with me knows, you know, there's different moods. Sometimes I'm super quiet and then other times I'm just super amped. Um, but this is, this is me. Like, I'm not playing a character on the internet. I may raise the level a little bit, but this, this, is, this is who I am. And I, I'm going to tell you the truth. Well, I'm going to tell you my truth, whether it's, you know, right? You have to step back. Not everything I say is, is fact. But I try to base everything that I do say based off of my experience, like using cameras. Why do I say certain things about certain brands? Because it, it, it ends up being true because I've, used the cameras for so long, and I've used every system at this point. And so being able to use every system and understanding the ins and outs and the quirks, you have a better idea that when you, when you see something wrong, you kind of know that it's right, and then you can support it. Make sure you always support it with sound facts. Any more? What, what advice would I give to up and coming photographers? Yeah. In what sense? What are you trying to do? In the YouTube. I mean, photo the photo YouTube is an interesting animal. I'm not going to tell anybody not to do it. I think it's important to find your way. I think the key to starting a, a YouTube is make sure you can ride whatever trend is starting because no one cares about my journey, right? No one's going to find my journey if you start. But if you decide that you have a piece of gear or something, gear is what's going to draw people. But try to be unique and original to you and not just copy what other people are doing. Um, and it's not easy. And just know that it's not going to happen overnight. Not everybody can be Peter McKinnon. <laughs> That's it? I, I'm done? I'm seven minutes and ten Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. You killed it. Thank you. Oh. All right. One more time. Let's hear it for Jared. Right on. Wow. Amazing work. OK. So we're going to take a, a quick three-minute break, four-minute break. And then you want to stick around and come back, because we're going to round this out with an amazing photojournalist who's been doing time shooting in Ukraine. He's going to share his stories. 
and uh, we're very enthusiastic to have Mr. Pete Keyhart come on the stage in a couple of minutes. So let's roll some commercials. Introducing the new Paybu credit card. You can save the tax or choose special financing for your purchases made on your Paybu credit card. So you want to save the tax on a camera, laptop, and drone? No problem. No need to wait for credits or cash back like other credit cards. The B&H Paybu card pays you back instantly. Or save over time and choose special financing and pay it off over six or 12 months. It's easy. Use your new Paybu card as payment at checkout. Then choose your available options, either Paybu Savings or Special Financing. See your savings or promotional plan right on your receipt, in-store or online. Applying is easy. Your approved Paybu card will be instantly available for a first purchase at checkout. The new Paybu card, same funny name, your choice of exclusive benefits. Apply today. Alpha.
Wow, that was an amazing presentation from Jared. That was something quite different than kind of what I expected. Uh, but speaking of different things than you've expected, we're gonna just wrap this up and, and end the day on an amazing photographer and story. And I think that you know, we all thought good photography has stories, right? So journalism, photojournalism lends itself to that absolutely perfectly. And there's just so much in-depthness when it comes to photojournalism, objectivity, how you tell the story, uh, keeping yourself from getting shot or blown up, or how you get in there and earn the trust of the people you're with. Uh, there's so many intricacies to it. And I think where fashion photography is amazing and it would be lovely to hang out with models all day long in a beautiful studio, right? Sounds pretty good. But how about telling important stories that need to be told so that change can happen? And before we go any further, I just want to we did some work with the Eddie Adams workshop and over in the depth of field stage, they had a few Eddie Adams speakers uh, coming in and talking about journalism and uh, New York Times people and, and whatnot. The Eddie Adams workshop takes place up in, uh, up in upstate New York and it's, a, it's an invite uh, with a, a portfolio review to get into it and they take 100 students and they train them in the amazing art of photojournalism. Uh, Eddie Adams, of course, uh, him and a photographer named Nick Oot were practically responsible for really causing the public to turn their backs on the Vietnam War, getting uh, America to leave out. And it starts off with the Eddie Adams photograph of executing the, uh, the general shop, executing the, uh, the sniper, or alleged sniper, and also with Nick Oot with the flaming girl running out of the village. It's within that vein, it's, it's things like that that change. It's photography for peace, it's photography for change. Photojournalism may be the most noble out of all of the careers that you could have in photography. So with that, I have a very special speaker to bring up. Our fates have been intertwined. We have Pete Keyhart, direct in from Kiev, actually Washington. Pete, right on, come on up. Let's hear it for Pete. Thank you, sir. Thanks, David, uh, for that introduction. Um, I've been a photojournalist for over 20 years. In that time, I've covered sports, uh, like youth soccer in impoverished Parisian suburbs. Uh, Stefano Tsitsipas making it to his first Grand Slam final. And I've even covered some borderline sports, like the cigar smoking world championships. <laughs> I covered Hurricane Katrina, and protests from Romania to Paris to the steps of the US Capitol. I covered the pandemic. And with the so support of the National Geographic Foundation, I found out that COVID can affect even our furriest friends. And last year, I spent five months covering Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What I've rarely done, though, as maybe you can tell, is stand on a stage in front of a crowd like this to talk about my work. It's a privilege to be with you today and to share the moments behind the moments, but it's also a challenge. When David invited me to speak, he told me to just talk about my career. But all things being equal, I'd much rather be taking pictures than tracing my career from its beginning and thinking about my work and what it means and why I do it. To understand what brought me to this stage, though, we need to go all the way back to when I was in high school, making black and white photos like these. And the day that I entered a National High School Photographer of the Year contest. I submitted nine prints to this contest from what I think of as my Cartier-Bresson impression phase. And to my shock, I won the contest. The prize was a coveted spot uh, at the 16th annual Eddie Adams Workshop, which uh, David mentioned, and uh, they had a, a talk earlier today. You can visit them at the Partner Pavilion. 
Um, and as David mentioned, if you look up Eddie Adams, he's most famous for his photo of the uh, general executing a Viet Cong on the streets of Saigon. But to young photographers, his name more immediately evokes the workshop that he founded, an opportunity for early career photojournalists to meet editors and rub soldier, <laughs> shoulders with legends of the field. I got to meet some of my photographic heroes there, including, including Eddie himself, who when I was introduced sort of gruffly grunted hello and then suggested we take a photo with all the Pulitzer Prize winners who were there. So as you can see, just eight clearly equally experienced photographers. <laughs> Whether he intended it or not, uh, David gave me a rather daunting project today. I tend to just go from assignment to assignment project to project and tear sheet to tear sheet. But I realized in putting together this series of photos that there are a few constants to how I work. You could call them contradictions or dichotomies or just tensions. Maybe they're just weird voices in my head. And some of them I'm always aware of and some of them I've only noticed looking back now. But for better or for worse, they define my approach to photography and to journalism. When I first started working at newspapers, I was the lowest person on the totem pole, and I often got the assignments that no one wanted to do. I took this photo, please hold your applause, <laughs> for the Durham Herald Sun's What's Broken column. This feature highlighted things like potholes and derelict buildings. Try not to fall asleep while I read the thrilling caption I wrote for this photo. The house at 2114 Ash Street in Durham has been classified as a priority which indicates it is a hazard to the community. I know. But I searched for ways to make assignments like these more interesting. As I was making this photograph, I was accosted by a neighbor who was clearly disgruntled. He wanted to know exactly what I was doing, so I defensively explained the important assignment I was on. And then his face lit up, and he said, oh, you should see the inside. When I filed this photo, my editor said, Pete, this is amazing. This is the best photo anybody's ever taken for a what's broken assignment. And then he said, but we can never publish it because you were trespassing. <laughs> Go figure. Since that first newspaper internship, I've looked for moments. A marine widow grieving her fallen husband. Or a non-denominational church service. This was taken for a college class where we had to find and photograph a story every week. And by that point, I'd run out of good ideas. A classmate of mine, taking pity on me, threw me a bone. He was like, okay, look, man, my barber is also a pastor. What he didn't tell me was that this particular pastor barber oversaw a congregation of believers who spoke in tongues and frequently fainted to the ground. Sometimes in the course of the most mundane, boring-sounding stories, you meet the most extraordinary people. I found moments at Little League games. And after moving to San Francisco in 2011 at Major League games. Hopefully there's no Cardinal fans here. Uh, this is the Giants tying the 2020, 2012 in LCS. I found a job at a newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, as a photo editor, producer, and occasional photographer. I was able to shoot small assignments on the side here and there, like a fluffy weekly column about the hills of San Francisco. It featured valets outside a mansion in Pacific Heights, and a group of friends making breakfast out of their VW bus atop Twin Peaks. I did travel assignments, like whale watching from a kayak in Half Moon Bay. In many ways, my setup at the Chronicle was ideal. It was a dream job. I got to live in San Francisco, which is still one of my favorite cities in the world. And I had the st stability of a weekly paycheck. But throughout my time in San Francisco, I was also photo editing The Wires and the biggest international stories of that time, like the Arab Spring, the war in Afghanistan, and the revolution in Ukraine. 
I started to spend a lot of time wondering what it was like to report on conflict and to photograph people in crisis. So I left the Chronicle and moved overseas. I photographed the 2015 refugee crisis as over a million displaced people and asylum seekers flooded into Europe, fleeing wars in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Men, women, and children brought only what they could carry, and I documented these possessions with a series of portraits made in Greece. Phones and jewelry were, of course, common, as were thumb drives containing cherished photos and wrapped in a balloon to stay dry. Ibrahim Koja from Aleppo carried a copy of the Quran, while 13-year-old Jean Ali brought an umbrella and her hair straightener. <laughs> the route was perilous. Jafar Suleiman from Raqqa lost his belongings in the sea crossing from Turkey. I followed the story across the continent from Hungary to Serbia to Croatia to Slovenia to Austria benefiting from the generosity of colleagues on staff at various publications by riding in their cars and sleeping on their hotel room floors. Initially, I thought, as maybe every young photographer does, that in the midst of a refugee crisis or conflict, I wouldn't be struggling to make compelling images, that it would be easy to make images that would inform and inspire empathy in people halfway around the world. But I quickly learned I was wrong about that equation. Everything that was happening around me was urgent and emotional. Sometimes it was violent and frighteningly chaotic. The process of how to make those photos was entirely new, and I wasn't prepared for the challenges of how to do my work and to do it well. The challenge wasn't about making the mundane interesting, as it had been in San Francisco. The challenge was how to stay warm in a muddy field and how to avoid getting arrested by the Hungarian border police. As a photographer, the challenge is to deal with a myriad of language barriers, cars breaking down, and the jerks from the TV crews who've booked all the hotel rooms. So I mentioned earlier that there are these tensions or dichotomies that I come across. Communication barriers often lead to absurd moments. When I first arrived on this story, I'd previously been whining about not knowing how to get there, whether I would find work uh, or people to travel with. So a colleague of mine, just sort of out of exasperation, bought me a bus ticket to Budapest, kind of called my bluff. From there, I took a train to the Serbian border. And as I arrived, a friend from the Irish Times called, Irish Times called me. And he said, Pete, you have to get down here. There's tear gas everywhere. So I told the hotel receptionist, uh, I need a car. Can you call me a car? Um, because I need to get to the border ASAP. And I tried to sound really important as I said this um, to impress upon her how urgent it was. It must have worked because a few minutes later, a gold limousine pulled up to drive me to this riot. <laughs> Most juxtapositions aren't that stark. But there's something profound in sharing moments of joy amidst the desperate and unimaginably difficult struggle that these people endured in search of a better life. I always try to make at least one image that communicates that. This is Walter on the right, an Austrian artist who brought a drum to the Vienna train station. And for an afternoon, everyone danced and sang and forgot for a moment the odyssey that they were on. A year later, in October of 2016, many of these refugees ended up in the jungle, a sprawling shanty town near Calais. The population had swelled into the thousands. I spent a week documenting the chaos as French authorities began to evict and demolish the camp. Fires started breaking out. As soon as firefighters extinguished one blaze, another would pop up. 
In tense situations like this one, my colleagues and I typically work in groups for safety. But in trying to get to this fire quickly, we got separated. All alone, I took this photo. Whenever I can, I get permission to photograph people, not because I have to, but because my images are better when the people I'm photographing understand what it is I'm doing. I think of my subjects almost as collaborators. But in breaking news and dynamic moments like this one, that sort of dialogue just isn't possible. So a split second after I made this photo, this guy locked eyes with me, grabbed me, and threw me into the wall of the shack behind me. Given that reaction, I suspect that he might have had something to do with the fire exploding behind him, but I'm not sure about that. My first rule in confrontations like this is not to let the other person dictate the tenor of the conversation. Just because you're being yelled at doesn't mean you have to yell back. After a few seconds of calmly speaking to him, he let me go. This type of work takes a toll. I found I couldn't spend all my time putting myself in physical danger and absorbing the emotions of traumatized people. That's why I do these kinds of stories in rotation. We all need to decompress. So I started working, somewhat by accident, for the sports desk at the New York Times, and I photographed long reported features. I wasn't photographing the Super Bowl or the World Series. Rather, I photographed the world's oldest basketball court, which happens to be in a Paris basement. I looked at the effects of climate change on an annual ice skating race that had to be relocated from the Netherlands to Austria because of the warming climate. This man fell flat on his face in front of me. He'd been skating for hundreds of kilometers at that point. He touched his mouth, glanced down at the ice, and then looked up to me. Is one out, he asked in broken English. I wasn't sure what to tell him. I documented a Georgian village's annual all-town, no-rules rugby match. Now, some of these stories are the result of hours of meticulous research. Sometimes you start with a sport or event that seems interesting, like San Fermin, but it takes time to tease an interesting angle out of it. In this case, though, I saw a Facebook post from an acquaintance. It read, a man came into my hospital room to see if I wanted to get the bull that gored me taxidermied. I could have its head mounted on my wall for a cool 1,200 euros. I mean, that's basically the whole pitch right there. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. It's perfect. So yeah, it turns out there's a guy who taxidermies all the bulls after the running and the bullfights in Pamplona. So just a little warning, if anyone's squeamish, the next photo you might want to look away for. I shared this on my Instagram, and a colleague commented that it was beautiful. In response, another commenter told her she was sick to think that. And this is actually gratifying to elicit such opposing but equally potent reactions, for some people to see beauty and others to feel disgust. In aiming to objectively portray a range of subjects and viewpoints, provoking opposing reactions is the highest compliment. But of all the moments I've photographed and places I've seen, Ukraine is the one that keeps pulling me back. If you look at my Instagram, you'll see my last non-Ukraine post. It's from January 8th, 2022. The last 50 images are from Ukraine. You might conclude from that number that clients are always clamoring to send me to Ukraine. In fact, the countless trips I've made, including when I moved to Kyiv, I've paid my own way almost every time. The longer I go in my career, the more I find that the images I want to make aren't always the images that people want to hire me for. 
I first went to Ukraine from San Francisco at the beginning of 2015. I ended up moving there for two years. Ironically, a century earlier, it's where my ancestors had immigrated from. The Maidan revolution was two years over at that point. But there was still fierce fighting in the East. Nevertheless, I found tender moments at the front. This is Volodya, a volunteer soldier who had escorted me to the contact line, where I could see the so-called separatist positions less than 300 meters away. When we pulled up, a shot whistled over our heads, and I hit the deck. Volodya, still standing, looked at me bemusedly. They're just saying hello. He shrugged. As you can see, while I was being worried about being shot at, Volodya found time to pick flowers for his wife, who was visiting his base for the weekend. I went to the first of what would be many soldiers' funerals. And I got so wrapped up in photographing this moment that I didn't notice Mikhail Saakashvili, the former president of Georgia, standing at the center of the frame. I tried to make photos that spoke not only to soldiers' physical, but also their psychological trauma as they practiced yoga in a peaceful countryside. When the front lines and the conflict froze a few months later, I looked for cultural stories throughout the country, like a singing group in western Ukraine, or a man celebrating epiphany in the frozen Dnieper River. I traveled to the shores of Mariupol, where I photographed children enjoying idyllic summers, with no inkling that the city would be largely destroyed eight years later. And I tried to capture the natural beauty of this country that's so little known to Americans and so little known to the West. And I documented the ascendance of a young television star to the presidency. In stories as big as this one, it's impossible to cover everything, least of all in one photo. As photojournalists, we're often just looking for a sliver of access an unexpected moment or a cracked door that we can creep through to find a visual metaphor that takes a micro moment and speaks to the macro situation. Eventually, news interest in Ukraine waned and commissions for cultural stories were few and far between. I moved to Paris and then, during the pandemic, back to the US. But at the end of 2021, when the rumblings that Putin was going to invade again grew loud, I made the decision to return. No one knew what would happen, of course, but I felt a profound calling to go, one that was hard to explain to my friends and family. I got to Kyiv in January. And if I'm being honest, I spent a lot of time second-guessing myself and wondering if I'd miscalculated the timing and the urgency of that feeling. I watched the country ready itself all the same. Volunteer soldiers trained with mock rifles. And weapons arrived from the West. And 21-year-old soldier Andre worked to deep in a trench where weeks earlier his comrade had been killed by a sniper. And then everything changed. At dawn on February 24th of last year, I was in my hotel room at the Hotel Kramatorsk in eastern Ukraine, about 60 miles from Russian-held Donetsk. Ukraine had just closed its airspace to civilian flights, and any plane already en route was turning around. The security team at BuzzFeed News, the outlet I was working for at the time, told us to get some sleep because the invasion was probably imminent. I like to think I'm somewhat seasoned at this point, but those directives were sort of incompatible. 
So I was awake and lying on my bed when my room was illuminated by a bright flash of light. It felt like it lasted forever, but just a few seconds later, the sound and the shockwave of the cruise missiles rocked the building. The invasion had started. I had been sleeping for the previous few nights with all my bags packed, so I grabbed them and ran down to the makeshift bomb shelter, which was the basement of our hotel. I was surprised, given that the hotel was full of journalists, to be the first one down there. But I remember thinking, well, mom will be happy about this. So what do you photograph when the largest country on Earth suddenly invades the country you're in? I started with what was in front of me. This is my hotel basement, and those are my colleagues. My team and I thought that we were well prepared for what was going to happen. We had equipment, some gas, a bit of food, but a four-pronged full-scale invasion was more than we had anticipated. We had thought the East would be a good place to report on the war, but now it seemed like a terrible mistake. Eventually, we ventured outside, and I found a lone pedestrian crossing the street in front of an armored vehicle. With Russian forces sprinting towards the capital, it seemed like they might beat us to Kyiv, or worse, that we might get encircled by Russia's military, and therefore cut off from the rest of the country, and we might end up somehow as impromptu residents of Russia. We decided to drive the 450 miles back to Kyiv. We saw smoke in the sky and guessed at whether it was from bombardments, or from factories. We saw long lines of cars waiting for gas. We stopped for food and watched the news with the sole other patron of the restaurant. And we arrived in Kiev in nightfall, moments before the curfew. On darkened highways, digital billboards that normally show garish advertisements instead quietly display the animated U Ukrainian flags. I wondered if this would be one of the last times that I saw Kyiv, and it was haunting. We spent another sleepless night in another hotel basement, this time in the parking garage of the Radisson. Kyiv was deserted. With reports of fighting on the streets of the northern neighborhoods, we decided to leave the city for the safety of the outskirts. Moments after I took this photo, we passed a little grocery store. My God, it's open, I remarked to one of my colleagues. I ducked in and asked for non-perishable food like granola bars or dried fruit. And the clerk gave me a concerned look and asked me if I was gluten-free. <laughs> On the streets, plainclothes young men formed militias as combat air patrols screamed overhead. We joined the thousands fleeing the city to retreat to a house south of town. People fled by any means necessary. They fled by train. They fled over destroyed bridges. And they fled in the arms of their compatriots. I documented soldiers fighting for their country, training in the snow outside of Kyiv, or on patrol near Kharkiv. I attended meals with them And I saw anti-tank missiles secreted in a Kiev pizzeria. In the fear and confusion of the early days, suspected collaborators were detained at checkpoints with packing tape. I found cities devastated by fighting, and villages bidding a final goodbye to their young men.
Civilians were laid to rest during occupation with makeshift markers in the forest outside recently liberated Izum. They had to be painstakingly exhumed by Ukrainian investigators. And other civilians, like Valery Kut, weren't even afforded the dignity of a wooden cross in a desolate forest. He was buried in his yard by his neighbors during the occupation. Olga Kochenko had to bury her son in a similar fashion. She waited at the morgue for his remains while investigators finished their work. This was the country home of the Grisenko family. 11-year-old Anastasia was killed on September 17, 2022, when a missile obliterated the house outside of Kharkiv. Her parents were out volunteering to deliver food to the elderly. They'd taken her to the countryside because they hoped it would be safer than the city. A few days later, her neighbors gathered to pay their respects. I want to remember her as she was, smiling and laughing, not how I saw her yesterday, after she had been thrown through two walls of a building, said Anastasia's father, Andrei. I want people to know that this baby was supposed to live. She did no evil to anyone. She was so young. I've just showed you a lot of awful moments, the stuff of nightmares, and I want you to look at them. But just like on the refugee trail, it's important to remember that even in war, there are moments of hope and levity, and that conflicts are not binary states. Kiev repelled the Russian blitzkrieg and continues to be free and beautiful. Young Ukrainians, ever resilient, organized dance parties to clean up shelled homes. While others disassemble discarded ease cigarettes and wire them into DIY power banks to donate to the military. The Kiev Ballet has reopened. And high school students, amidst Russian attacks on Ukrainian electrical infrastructure, use cell phone flashlights to complete their homework. Friends embrace on the disused train platform in Mykolaiv as the first train passes through on the way to liberated Kherson. And in the ruins of Erpin, which was the site of some of the worst atrocities of Russian occupation, seedlings grow in a melted planter. and Hasidim make their annual pilgrimage, a tradition that dates to the 1800s to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. I'd wanted to go to Uman since I first lived in Ukraine, and I wanted to do this story since almost as soon as the invasion started. Putin's stated reason for the invasion is the, quote, denazification of Ukraine. If Ukraine was suddenly so full of Nazis, I wondered, how is this tradition continuing? Many of the people I spoke to were equally perplexed. Not only did they not know about any Nazis, but they were undaunted. One of them told me, we know what war is. In Israel, we have wars on and off all the time. So this is a photography conference, um, expo, trade show, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I framed my talk through my experience as a photographer. But if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this, it's to empathize with the plight, the grief, and the struggle of those that I've documented. I owe my subjects a tremendous debt for their trust in me. And my other debt is to this community. I don't know what my career would look like, or where I would be, or if I'd even be a photographer if I hadn't gone to the Eddie Adams workshop two decades ago. 
What I do know is that I found a special bond in this community. Eddie invited me to be a part of this photo that I'll treasure forever. Chris Hondros got me the meeting that led to my job at the San Francisco Chronicle. When he was killed a few months later in Libya, a fellow freelancer insisted on picking me up at the airport in New York so that I wouldn't have to arrive to his memorial alone. When I first moved to Ukraine, colleagues helped me buy train tickets and showed me how to get the accreditations I needed. I've slept on colleagues' couches from DC to Maine, in Paris, and in Berlin, not to mention in Kiev and in Donetsk. I'm constantly trying to repay their kindness. Even as I was preparing this talk, I realized how uncomfortable it feels to use the first person to say I. My first instinct is to say we. Journalism is always a collaborative endeavor. Colleagues in the field, fixers and drivers, and not to mention our editors back in the office. I can't speak to whether or not other professions come with this kind of community and support. I've only ever been a photographer. I'm grateful for it. I feel that community now in this room with all of you. That contest that I won in high school, where I took this photo, that led to this moment here on this stage, B&H sponsored and organized it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, up there. First of all, you did great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, will you go back to Ukraine? Yeah, I, um, so I'll attend Eddie Adams' workshop next month. Uh, that's something I do every year and volunteer my time there. And then I'll go after that. It, it takes quite a while to get there these days because you have to fly to Poland and then take a train. And I think my record is like 35 hours flat of travel to get there. Um, so you kind of, it, it doesn't make sense to go for less than two weeks, and I wanted to be here tonight to talk to you all and then volunteer my time at Eddie Adams. So the next slot that I can go is in uh, mid-October. Yeah. Uh, how, did, uh, how, did you, how did you uh, protect yourself? How did you feel about your safety? Have you had any uh, struggles with that? Um, so the question was, how do I protect myself and how do I feel about my safety? So actually, um, some of the clients I work for, like uh, I mentioned BuzzFeed News. I've worked for NBC News, uh, the LA Times. It's a long list. Some of them actually provide us with something called a security officer, which is usually a person with military experience and can kind of knows more about these things than I do and can kind of... Uh, I don't know. They say no a lot, which is frustrating. Um, but then again, you know, I'm not dead, so uh, they must be doing something right. Um, I've been fortunate not to have that many close calls, uh, and you know, knock on wood. Um, I'm. It, it, it's funny uh, when you speak to people, uh, like many of you, I assume, who, who don't do this sort of work. Um, there's like you think like, oh, he goes to Ukraine, like how crazy. But then actually. As you start to do that work, you realize, like, even within Ukraine, there's, like, there's people who are incredibly brave. I, I, some are even a little reckless, maybe, who spend more time at the front. Um, I, I tend to hang back just a little bit and uh, focus on more daily life than, like, what people sometimes refer to as the bang-bang. Um, but maybe that answers your question. Anybody else? Oh, back there. Yeah, so the question was, as somebody on the ground, um, how do I feel about the, the morale and optimism of the Ukrainian people? Um, I'm always blown away. Uh, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a horrible situation they're in. Um, I don't know if everybody knows this, but the men uh, can't leave. Um, they, there's a general mobilization, so they're stuck there, whether they're in the army or not. Um, and... Nevertheless, I don't know, my, my friends and the people I keep in touch with every day there are, are very upbeat. Um, but we'll see what happens. Um, please, nobody ask me who's going to win. I don't know. I, I certainly, 
hope the Ukrainians are allowed to continue to dictate their sovereignty, but uh, we'll see. Anybody else? Yeah. Your work can influence people's opinion about what's happening and can help to bring the peace So that's interesting. So the question was, um, do I think my work can influence people's opinion? Um, sorry? On a global scale. Um, and, in, and what was the second part of your question? If it can help to like, spread the word. And people yeah. I certainly hope so. I mean, I think, you know, if, I think if you didn't, I, I'm not sure why I would do it if I didn't believe that it could. Um, and I, it, it was interesting, actually, the first time you, you phrased it as, like, can help Ukraine win. And actually, like, as a journalist, I wouldn't, I'd be, I'd be nervous to use that kind of language, even though, look, I live there, I, my sympathies for the country are very deep, um, but, my job as a journalist is to inform and to tell people what's happening, and I think there's an obvious conclusion to draw from sort of the facts uh, that, that I'm helping to communicate, but I, wouldn't, I would never characterize it as like, my job is to help Ukraine win. That's, you know, the very brave men and women in the Ukrainian armed forces do that. Thanks. Yeah. In Odessa? Yeah, yeah, yeah many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there in, um, sorry, they're running together. I was there in February. February. Yeah. Oh, are you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's talk after the, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, over there. Sure, the question was about my um, camera settings. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually kind of the same as, you know, if it's, if it's bright, I use a faster shutter speed. If it's dark, I use a slower one. You know, I, it's, I wouldn't say there's like, um, there's not like special settings. That the situations run all gamuts of, of light. I will say I recently bought a mirrorless camera. Um, so, you know, welcome to 2018 or whatever, Pete. Uh, but it's, there was a photo in there, um, it, it, you might not have, it was pretty quick, but um, of the howitzer that was shooting um, with the, the soldier in the foreground. And actually, you can see the shell flying away, which is like something that sort of mirrorless, it certainly makes easier, um, if, if not. I don't think it's impossible with a, an SLR, but um, that, that's the one thing I would say technically, that the mirrorless technology is, is quite uh, remarkable in that regard. Yes. I, when I, the question was about a communication. When I lived there, I, I took uh, lessons, um, and I'm trying to start that again. Uh, I took Russian at the time. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's really interesting, actually, um, and, and maybe you, you know this, but uh, in like, when I lived there in 2015, like it was, it was almost. People would give me a hard time. They would say, like, instead of saying spasiba, say diakwu. And, like, it, but it was almost a joke. And now it's less of a joke. It's, it's pretty, like, political now. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but the, 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 actually, the real answer is that I often work with a fixer um, or translator uh, who, who helps facilitate these things. And did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, the question was, how do I keep myself professional in such emotional situations? Um, there's been a lot of times where I've been um, very relieved to have the camera in front of my face. Uh, it, it's, like, it's like a physical barrier that like, I'm almost hiding behind it, like, literally. Um, and I think it's gotten a little easier with time. Uh, the photo. There was a photo of um, refugees getting off a boat, and I was working on that story with a dear friend of mine uh, named Harriet, uh, who has also seen, she, she worked in Ukraine for a long time. We both saw some terrible things in Ukraine. And that boat, like, was actually pretty fine. Like, the, uh, later we saw a boat where people uh, had, had been crushed to death on it. But in that boat, like, 
every, you know, everybody, the, the boat came up, they hopped off, it was pretty calm. But their um, relief, I guess, was so palpable that we both broke into tears afterwards, like, like we were just sobbing, and it, it was very strange. And so I guess like, as much as I can say, well, I, I hide behind my camera, or I, I use, you know, I just try and remain professional, the, the emotions come at unexpected moments, and so I, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't ever tell you that like, I never cry or I never am upset in these moments. Um, so I also mentioned that like, I rotate through, I, d I don't go for months and months on end. Um, the first, I, I, I didn't know the invasion was gonna happen, so I got there in, in January. If, you know, if Putin had told me, uh, I would have maybe come a little later, because I was kind of burnt out by the time the invasion started. So that was like a 10 week, assignment, and that was, that was a bit too long. Um, so rotating through helps, and you know, spending time with family and friends in less stressful situations. Yeah. By the way, I made your presentation. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Uh, what advice do you have for someone who would want to pursue a young photographer to get into photojournalism? What's the, what are we doing today? Yeah, I mean, well, that's a good question. So like, the, uh, sorry, the question was, uh, for a young photographer who wants to get into photojournalism, or even, I guess, an old photographer who wants to get into photojournalism, um, how to pursue that. Um, the nice thing about photojournalism is you don't, you don't need much to do it. Uh, you, you basically need a camera, uh, almost any camera. Um, you don't need a studio, you don't need lights. So I, I think the first place to start is just telling stories. Um, that's certainly how I started. You saw my black and white photos. like. That was uh, street photography and like my girlfriend and uh, a guy in high school who uh, was hurt on a trampoline was the um, photo of the hands. That was his physical therapy. Um, so you can start kind of anywhere. The uh, overseas stuff, conflict stuff is a little bit more tricky. Um, but I guess if somebody's really interested in that, they can send me an email, <laughs> um, I suppose. Was there another question over here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, so I have colleagues who like adamantly believe that like it's their right, especially in, in public situations, to, to photograph anyone and anything. And like, they're not wrong, like legally. And, and um, Jared touched on this a little bit, that it's like a gray area. I think everybody has to sort of set their own line. I've certainly, there's been moments I haven't taken the photo, sometimes because I thought it wasn't appropriate. Uh, appropriate. Sometimes I thought it was, um, I was just like scared or nervous or didn't want to like, you know, the worst thing would be uh, you're, you're going into these situations where people are traumatized by, by war, by um, riots, wh whatever it is. And then like my, the last thing I want to do is add to their trauma. I found that most, um, most times like my internal sort of dialogue is like, oh my God, you're here, you're a vulture, you're taking photos of these people. But then like, if you're worried about your life, like you don't care about like Pete standing over here holding a camera, like you have bigger problems. You, like half the time people don't even notice me. Whoa, sorry. Um, so like, I don't know, I, I yeah, the, the short answer is yes and I have like, all sorts of photos that are only in my head because I didn't take them, and that kind of bugs me, so I try to take them in the future. But there are moments to put down the camera. Um, there's a great Wall Street Journal piece from the end of last year, a photographer called Emmanuel Satoli, uh, and I'm ca I can't remember the writer's name, James Marsden, I think, did a piece where they were following um, a unit, and one of the guys stepped on a mine, this is in Ukraine, and the they started to like leave because because the security officer told them to, and uh, the Ukrainians were like, "Yo, guys, like we need help to carry the, you know." And so they helped out, and I, I think that's the right choice. And that that was a time where, you know, 
you had to stop doing journalism for a minute and sort of be a human. Right? Yeah, in the green, I think. Um, so the question was what type of lens I use. Uh, lenses. Um, is it, I recently switched. I, I used to use mostly prime lenses, um, mostly a 35 millimeter lens. Um, and recently, just because I'm sick of carrying like a lot of lenses, I've sort of simplified to just, I basically shoot with a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200, um, just for simplicity's sake. But I miss, I don't know, in some ways it's, it's more complicated, it seems. Yeah, on the. How do you stay focused on your own perspective? Can you, sorry, can you? So, uh huh. Sorry, we. Yeah. Um, so the question was, how do I navigate when images that I feel strongly about are passed over um, for other images? I guess, like, look, we work in a subjective industry, and like. You're never going to agree 100% of the time with editors or with your colleagues about what the best photo is. Um, I try not to take it personally. I certainly advocate for the images I feel are important. But like, I actually, I mean, this is, I was, I don't know how, how to say this. I, the, the image of the um, guy who'd been exhumed, I was very like pleased with how that composition came together. Um, I, I thought it was a powerful image. It didn't run, um, in part because it, it was too graphic. Uh, so that's also something that we have to um, navigate. Uh, my colleague, Zhenya Malaletka, uh, won the Pulitzer last year. He works for the AP. And he, he posted a photo on his Instagram today that is one of the most awful things I've ever seen. Um, I, I encourage everybody to look it up because it's an important photo to see. Um, but that's also something we have to navigate. Like, it'll be interesting to see it's interesting to me that I'm seeing that photo on his Instagram, and I haven't seen it yet in, in a publication. It's, uh, I'll be curious to see what, who runs it tomorrow. Um, but, you know, I try not to take it personally. Like, I try to work with editors who uh, we sort of see similarly, and, and the best editors, I, I've turned in photos before um, and thought, like, okay, these are my five best. I bet if they run these five, it tells the story beautifully, and then, then an editor has pulled out different ones, and, and it's better. Like, and it, you know, it, it's something I didn't see, and that's the best editor to work with, who, who makes your work something more than you realize. Um, yeah. Sorry? Uh, his name is uh, Yevgeny Maloletka. I think if you search his last name, M-A-L-O-L-E-T-K-A. Yeah, so the, the question was about how, basically, how do I find these locations or, or how do we move around? Um, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of luck involved. Um, sometimes you're someplace where news happens. Um, we also have uh, what we call fixers, um, who are usually local journalists. We couldn't work without them. They're, the work they do is, is incredibly important and often sort of undersung. Um, and they help us. Uh, We'll also, I also usually start less with a location and more with the, like a theme. I want to cover X. I've seen this phenomenon happen. I want to find more. And, um, and our, our local co collaborators are great at uh, helping arrange that. Um, yeah, I guess that's that. Uh, mm -hmm. Very quiet uh, life insurance. Can you get to the front line? <laughs> yeah, actually. There's a. Uh, How do you get paid? Um, so there's basically like three ways it works, I guess. Uh, I um, keep in contact with a lot of editors and tell them where I am, basically like annoyingly, 
so. I, I'm always telling them where I am. So like I, I shot an assignment yesterday because I was here uh, to do this, and I'm shooting one on Friday. Um, so that is to say that like I, I let people know who I am, where I am, here's my portfolio, I send out updates, and then sometimes the phone rings and they say, hey, can you do X? And then I also pitch quite aggressively, um, talking to these editors and saying, hey, I think we should do a story about this. Would that be interesting for you? Um, and then I also, like especially in the case of Ukraine, I'll just go to a new place rather than just saying, hey, I'm in New York because I'm at a conference or I'm, at D you know, I'm in DC where I live. Um, and so those are kind of like the three ways. And the fourth way is that I, I have a photo agency where I send old work. And it, it's amazing the stuff they sell to random European publications that like I would never have thought are a good photo. But I just sort of put it up. And photo editors can come to that agency and search for work and license it through that. Sorry? Yes, I'm a freelancer. I meant to say that at the starting. Um, no, 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 I said I meant to. I, I didn't. Uh, so. <laughs> Maybe a couple more? What about a safety legend being used on your birds or you answer shots? Do you have any, any experience personally with that? That's a great question. So he was asking about, again, another safety question um, and, and about, like, you know, what happens if you get shot or whatever. We all uh, undergo something called HEFAT training, or everybody should, um, which stands for Hostile Environment First Aid Training. Um, so we're basically trained in ways to stop massive bleeds, um, like the use of a tourniquet uh, and other like large like sucking chest wounds is another one I know how to do. And it's 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 really important that like you sort of make sure that the people you're traveling with. We often, especially as freelancers, travel with um, other freelancers, and it's like really important to make sure they know that they've undergone this training too, because if you're the one that's hurt, you, you don't want to be, I mean, that's frankly like one of the reasons Chris Andros died, um, my friend. Uh, I, I mean, who knows if he could have been saved, but that, that inspired a lot of uh, photographers and journalists to undergo this training, which I think is super important. Uh, I work with Redux. Um, there's a guy I've known a long time. He's based here in New York, uh, and they—I I think they're like a good company. They—they they just seem like they know what they're doing. So, I like that. Yeah, so, so I run. I, I do ride with volunteers in Ukraine sometimes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. That was amazing. So it was uh, a long time ago. I was with that guy that I introduced this morning, Steve Schwartz, and we looked at these portfolios from the students and how to pick one journalist to go to Eddie Adams. And uh, I don't think we could have picked a, a better young, eager buck of a photographer than Pete Keithart to send to, to Eddie Adams. So congratulations, welcome. Thank you so much for that great career and thank you for everything. Okay, everyone, tomorrow, it's happening again. We're gonna have a message from our CEO at 9.30 tomorrow and then Casey Neistat will be giving his, his the Casey Neistat show tomorrow at 10 o'clock and then we just have a slew of photographers all day long. So thank you so much for coming. We had a blast. Remember, tomorrow, spend 50 bucks and get a ticket to the party that's happening tomorrow night from 6 to 8. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be the place to be. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.